members, the president. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society. Bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia. Let all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This house acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people and pays its respects to their elders both past and present. Members, on Thursday the 12th of November 2020, during questions without notice, Dr Steve Thomas asked a question of the Minister for the Environment in a representative capacity on behalf of the Minister for Emergency Services. The question asked why two previously provided answers regarding the reason for an estimated $30 million reduction in the revenue raised by the emergency services levy in 2020 to 2021 appeared on their face to contradict one another. The Minister identified one of the previous answers as correct, being a government decision to freeze the levy rates and provided further information regarding that answer. The Honourable Steve Thomas has now raised the previous answers and the Minister's clarification of them as a matter of privilege understanding Order 93. Specifically, the Honourable Steve Thomas submits that the House has been misled by the three answers from the Minister, which are apparently not supported by either the Minister's uh, which apparently are not supported by either the members' own calculations or evidence given by the Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner during this year's annual estimates hearings in the other place. A number of important issues of procedure and long-standing convention are raised by this matter. Firstly, the Minister for, for, for the Environment is acting here in a representative capacity. I note a ruling of President House from the 22nd of March 2016 that states, Ministers and parliamentary secretaries answering questions on behalf of the minister they represent are responsible to this House, I repeat to this House, for the answers that they give. When given in this place, it is their answer and they are responsible for its accuracy. However, the representative minister or parliamentary secretary is not individually responsible in any legal or parliamentary sense for the Department of State of the minister they are representing. This is made clear by the practice of oral questions when questions are answered in a representative capacity. In these cases, the member asking the question is required to give some notice. This is to enable the responsible minister in the other place to approve any answer to be given by his or her representative in this House. This approval is provided by the responsible minister signing the answer. When it is discovered that an answer given in any capacity is inaccurate, the minister or parliamentary secretary has an obligation to correct the record at the earliest opportunity, and the usual practice is to also apologise to the House for the error. Notwithstanding the responsibility of the Minister for the Environment to this, to this House for any answer given, for all practical and evidential purposes, it would be extremely difficult to establish that the representative Minister had an intention to mislead the House. The Honourable Dr Steve Thomas himself acknowledges that the Minister is likely to have inadvertently misled the House. It is often stated in this House by presiding officers that the answer given by government is the answer that you as a member will receive, and that as the receiver you must accept it unless there is a prima facie evidence of any intention to mislead the House. In determining whether there is substance to a matter of privilege on the Standing Order 93, Schedule 4 of the Standing Orders, Schedule 4 of the Standing Orders establishes a threshold test for possible contempts. Relevant to the present matter are the considerations as to whether a person knowingly committed an act amounting to contempt and the existence of any other remedy. The various answers given by the Minister, although apparently contradictory, appear to be matters that could be easily be clarified by some further investigation. The Council has a number of mechanisms, in addition to questions without notice by which members can question the government and gain further clarification of any answers given. This can be done via questions on notice, motions on notice, non-government business, 
standing or select committee inquiries, or the annual estimates hearings. Any of these mechanisms would be preferable to a privileges inquiry, the focus of which would be to determine whether in answering a question in a representative capacity, a minister knowingly gave a false answer. Accordingly, I rule that there is no substantive matter of privilege to be investigated. I also repeat that when it is discovered that an answer given in this House is inaccurate, the Minister or Parliamentary Secretary has an obligation to correct the record at the earliest opportunity and by tradition apologise to the House for the error. Members, I have a message, message number 41. The Governor has the honour to inform the Legislative Council of Western Australia that he has this day assented in the name and on behalf of the Queen to bills for the undermentioned Act, COVID-19 Response Legislation Amendment Extension of Expiring Provisions Act 2020, number 39 of 2020, Environmental Protection Amendment Act 2020, number 40 of 2020, Environmental Protection Amendment Act number 2, 2020, number 41 of 2020, signed Kim Beasley, Governor. Members, are there any petitions? The Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have two petitions. I'll start with the first one. Uh, I present a petition containing 2,000 signatures couched in the following terms to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament Assemble. We, the undersigned, support construction of a bunker at Albany Health Campus to house the linear accelerator machine grounded to the Great Southern Region in 2017. Completion of this project will mean cancer patients can receive treatment closer to home and to their families. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to fast-track construction of this project as an infrastructure priority for the Great Southern Region, as and your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Uh, Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, I present a petition containing 18 signatures couched in the following terms to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament Assembly. With the undersigned support the Eaton Family Centre and their request for an extension to their funding from the Department of Communities, which is due to expire in June 2021. The cessation of funding will mean the centre will be unable to remain financially viable and the service will close. Eaton Family Centre has been an important part of the community for nearly 32 years and an integral community service in the development of early childhood learning, community connections, positive relationships, support for young families, seniors and other socially isolated members of the community. We therefore ask that the Legislative, Legislative Council request the government to reinstate the current funding arrangements and your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Are there any further petitions? The Honourable Diane Evers. Madam President, I present a petition containing 992 signatures couched in the following terms to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled. We, the undersigned, oppose the development of Lot 783 Mitchell Drive, Narrabup, the Westin Margaret River Resort and Spa, Lots 501, 502 and 504 Reef Drive, Narrabup, and Lot 503 Seagrass Place, Narrabup, earmarked for development of short-stay villas, apartments and permanent residential dwellings along the fragile Narrabup coastline. We urge that the Shire of Augusta, Margaret River and the State Government of Western Australia support the reservation of the aforementioned lots and use their planning powers to rezone Lot 783 and Lots 501 to 504 from tourism to parks and recreation and reserve for a public purpose consistent with adjacent reserved Crown land. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to support the rezoning of Lot 783, Mitchell Drive, Narrabup, Lots 501, 502 and 504, Reef Drive, Narrabup and Lot 503, Seagrass Place, Narrabup, from tourism to parks and recreation, reserved for a public purpose consistent with adjacent reserved Crown land. And I also like to mention that more than 20,000 signatures have been received on an online petition to support the same cause. Are there any further petitions? The Honourable Yorn Sigma. Thank you, Madam President. I present a petition containing 638 signatures couched in the following terms to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in the Parliament assembled. We, the undersigned, say that the Dog Act 1976 requires amendments to ensure tougher penalties are placed on dogs that seriously injure or kill other animals or people and their owners. We now ask the Legislative Council to investigate the introduction of stronger penalties to deter owners from disobeying regulations including increased financial penalties and criminal liability for serious attacks, the removal and destruction of a dog where it has caused serious physical injury and or death, and a compulsory education program for dog owners where an animal in their control has caused nuisance and fear to the general public. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will never pray. 
Are there any further petitions? The Honourable Mick Graham. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I present a petition containing four signatures couched in the following terms. To the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia and Parliament Assemble, we, the undersigned, support this petition in the public interest requesting an inquiry into the governance of DMERS and residential commercial building practices relating to compliance required under the relevant acts, regulations, codes, policies and public accountability as listed. Building Act 2011, when introduced, removed the authority for LGAs to inspect the construction of homes. This has placed all regional areas of WA at a severe disadvantage as the services of building inspectors, structural engineers and private building surveyors are not readily available. There is very little information available to WA homeowners about their responsibility to ensure that they employ a private building inspector since this is no longer the authority of LGAs. Performance solutions can be provided when deviations from standards are engineered into a house plan and are required to be attached to the application of the LGA, but it appears this is not the case. They are not a remedy for defective non-compliant work. Building Services Registration Act 2011 section 29 requires all SAT orders to be registered, but BEI have had a database restriction preventing the uploading of information onto the register for the last nine years. This has only recently been remedied. Building inspectors who are undertaking work to identify such things as structural defects are not registered, nor do they need any industry experience. Homeowner public access to the Australian standards was revoked from all national libraries approximately two years ago due to a breach and has not been restored. Access to Australian standards details for the public is required. There is a lack of referrals to LGAs for non-compliant work when detected in site audit inspections by BEI inspectors. BEI inspectors do not have the power authority to accept effective work performance solutions and variations to a building contract without the homeowner's knowledge. Builders can choose to have their cases for serious offences dealt with by the BSB rather than SAT as the penalties are less than those at SAT. Since engineers and architects are exempt from Australian consumer law guarantees to provide a service fit for purpose, it is imperative that engineers and architects be registered in Western Australia. Home Building Contracts Act 1991 section 28 prevents builders from contracting out of their liability warranty as advised by WA Consumer Protection. However, these waivers are being included in private contract agreements. The WA Government has been slow to implement the recommendations of the Shergold Weir Report 2018, WA Auditor General Reports and reports recommending the registration of engineers. Defective non-compliant works detected or reported and which breach Building Act 2011 section 27 and section 37 requirements are not being referred to LGAs or addressed adequately to protect homeowners. BEI and SAP processes and decisions are biased towards builders and routinely adversely affect homeowners. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to support a committee inquiry addressing the matters raised and, dependent on the findings, refer this petition's concerns to an appropriate authority for further investigation in the public interest and your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Are there any further petitions? Are there any statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. Madam President, today I rise on behalf of the Minister for Women's Interests to inform the House about 16 days in WA to stop violence against women for 2020. Uh, today, uh, November, no, tomorrow, November the 25th, is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. It also marks the beginning of the McGowan Government's annual 16 days in WA campaign, which draws attention to the many impacts of violence and abuse on women. 16 Days is important because it's about encouraging leaders to be part of the conversation about what we can do individually and collectively to end violence against women. It is about encouraging community awareness and understanding to change views that allow victim blaming to occur and can stop survivors seeking help and support. 
Community views have changed over the last few decades in relation to domestic violence, but there is more to do and 16 days is the time to show support. There are many ways to be involved. There is the Landmarks All Light, a light program with buildings and structures around Perth and regional WA being lit up in the campaign colour of orange. There is information that can be shared on social media about the impacts of violence on women and their children to educate, inform and importantly sh show your support for the campaign. There are agents of change who will be sending their message uh, for why they think it's important to end violence against women. This year's theme is Respect Starts With You. Madam President, I encourage all in this place and across WA, across the WA community to show their support for 16 days this year. Are there any further minister statements? The Minister for Regional Development. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Last month, our government introduced new regulations to bring into effect modern and nationally agreed animal welfare rules for transporting livestock in Western Australia. The regulations implemented the standards set out in the two Australian Animal Welfare Standards and Guidelines to ensure the welfare of sheep and cattle during land transport and at sale yards and depots. The Honourable Dr Steve Thomas raised concerns with me uh, on the Animal Welfare Transport Sale Yards and Depots Cattle and Sheep Amendment Regulations 2020, which prompted his motion for disallowance. Following discussions with the member, I instructed the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development to prepare an amendment to the regulations. Under Regulations 33.2 of the Transport Regulations, it is an offence for a person to load or cause a livestock animal to be loaded if the animal is unfit to undertake the journey. The amendment introduces a new defence for livestock transporters under Regulation 33.2 of the Transport Regulations. A livestock transporter will now have the defence to the charge above if they prove that they took all reasonable steps to ensure that the livestock animal was assessed immediately before it was loaded to determine whether or not it was fit to uh, undertake the journey. This amendment gives livestock transporters comfort that if they take all reasonable steps to ensure that animals they transport are fit before they are loaded, then they will have an event, uh, a defence in event uh, that it is later discovered that the animal uh, they transported is or was unfit for, Frank, for the journey. Uh, this amendment also maintains the integrity of the transport regulations by ensuring the correct persons in the transport process are held responsible for their actions in respect to individual livestock animals. The amendment has been drafted and pending Executive Council approval on 1 December. Uh, the amendment will be gazetted on Friday 4 December uh, 2020 and I now table the draft regulation. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further statements by any Minister or Parliamentary Secretary? Members, I have the following papers for tabling. I table the 60, uh, Report 60 of the Standing Committee on Procedure and Privileges. Do we need to think again the Foreign Allegiance provision in Section 38F of the Constitution Acts Amendment Act, 19, uh, Act 1899? Members, the report I've just tabled deals with the committee's inquiry into the foreign allegiance provisions contained in section 38F of the Constitution's Act, Amendment Act 1899. Members will recall the difficulties encountered in our federal parliament arising from dual citizenship and the application of section 44 of the Australian Constitution. This resulted in 15 members of the Parliament of Australia being ruled ineligible to be a, to be a member or resigning preemptively due to dual citizenship. Unlike the Australian Constitution, being a dual citizen does not disqualify a person to be a member of either House of the Parliament of Western Australia. However, Section 38F of the Constitution Acts Amendment Act 1899 provides that particular conduct by a member who may or may not be a dual citizen will cause that member's seat to become vacant. Such conduct includes a member making any acknowledgement of allegiance to a foreign power or where a member does, concurs in or adopts any act in which they become entitled to be a sub subject or citizen of a foreign power. The committee's report provides information to members on the operation of section 38F, compares it with the constitutional arrangements in other Australian states and considers the possible scope of the section and the particular acts that may result in its application. The committee concludes that section 38F is imprecise and that legislative action is required to clarify the law. 
The committee recommends that the government introduce a bill in the 41st Parliament to provide for one, express exceptions relating to acquiring or using a foreign passport or travel document, such as those that apply in South Australia and Queensland, and two, a provision for relief empowering the Houses of Parliament of Western Australia to resolve to disregard a disqualifying ground in certain circumstances, such as those that apply in Queensland. I commend the report to the House. And members, I also have a paper to table the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia, uh, final report November 2020, deemed tabled 19th of November 2020. Are there any further papers for tabling? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I have the following papers to be laid on the table. Local Laws, Local Government Act 1995, Shire of Coolgardie Meeting Procedures, uh, Shire of Coolgardie Parking Amendment, Shire of Coolgardie Public Places and Local Government Property Amendment Local Law and Great, City of Greater Geraldton Waste Local Law. Uh, response to report, Select Committee into Local Government, Final Report, Reports, Gold Corporation, Statement of Corporate Intent, Report of Overseas Travel undertaken by Ministers, Parliamentary Secretaries and Government Officers on official business for the three months ended 30th of June 2020. Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Mr President. I have the following papers for tabling. Uh, addendums Aboriginal Affairs Planning Authority Reserve 15530 and 23, uh, 23079 Land Proclamation 2020 Annual Reports Conservation Parks Commission 2019-20 Police Force Western Australia Criminal Investigation Covert Powers Act 2012 Assumed Identities 2019-20 Determinations Planning and Development Act 2005 Section 2462A Determination by the Minister for Planning on Applications DR 362, oblique 2013, and DR 444, oblique 2013. Leases, Cam Lease number 2988, oblique 100, between the Conservation and Land Management Executive Body and Little Gumnuts Property Limited for educational purposes in Yanchep National Park. Reports, Horizon Power, Statement of Corporate Intent, uh, Insurance Commission, Statement of Corporate Intent, Landgate, Statement of Corporate Intent. Racing and, Racing and Wagering Western Australia Statement of Corporate Intent, Synergy state, Statement of Corporate Intent, Treasury Corporation Quarterly Report for the quarter end of 30 June, sorry, 30 September 2020, uh, Treasury Corporation Statement of Corporate Intent, Western Power Statement of Corporate Intent, Reviews, Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, Parks and Wildlife Service, a review of the Conservation Legislation Amendment Act 2011, how are Western Australia's joint management arrangements working? Are there any further papers for tabling? The Minister for Regional Development. Thank you, Madam President. I have the following uh, uh, papers for tabling. Reports, Development WA, Statement of Corporate Intent 2020-21, Fremantle Port, Statement of Corporate Intent 2021, Kimberley Ports Authority Statement of Corporate Intent 2021, Midwest Ports Statement of Corporate Intent 2021, Pilbara Ports Authority Statement of Corporate Intent 2021, Southern Ports Authority Statement of Corporate Intent 2021, uh, Rural Settlement Agents Act 1981, Settlement Agents Code of Conduct Amendment Rules 2020. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable Robin Chappell. Um, Madam President, I am directed to present report number 18 of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Curtin University Statute No. 5, Election of Council Members, and Curtin University Statute No. 12, Admission and Enrolment. That report is tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, the report I have just tabled serves two purposes. Firstly, it is the committee's disallowance report in support of the order of day number two, Curtin University Statute No. 5, Election of Council Members Disallowance, currently scheduled for debate on the 26th of November 2020. Secondly, it is information about the, uh, uh, is, sorry, secondly, it is an information report for the House using order of the day number one, Curtin Statute No. 12, Admission and Enrolment, as the case study to outline issues in the Curtin University Act 1966, which the committee considers require attention of Parliament. In relation to the disallowance, the Curtin Act creates a hierarchy of regulation. Firstly, the University Council may make statutes about certain matters set out in the Act. Statutes must be approved by the Governor, uh, published in the Gazette, and laid before the Parliament. Statutes are subject to disallowance. Secondly, the University Council may make rules under the statutes. 
Rules do not require the approval of the Governor and are not subject to disallowance. In the Committee's view, rules are subsidiary to the statutes and are intended to contain administrative or auxiliary matters to the statutes. The Act requires the manner of election of Council members to be prescribed uh, by statute. Statute No. 5 fails to prescribe the manner of electing members of Council and instead provides that the manner of election will be set out in the rules. In the Committee's view, by electing uh, to prescribe such matter in rules rather than statute, Curtin is in effect avoiding the scrutiny of Parliament. The Committee re recommends that Statute No. 5 be disallowed. Uh, turning to the Curtin Act in general, the information report sets out uh, the Committee's and Curtin's competing interpretations of the Curtin Act. The Committee is very concerned about Curtin's interpretation of the Curtin Act, which results in Curtin, rather than Parliament, deciding which material will be subject, uh, uh, which will be scrutinised by Parliament. The issue for further consideration is whether the Act intends to provide Curtin with a discretion to determine whether uh, subject matters set out in Section 34 of the Act should be subject to disallowance or not. I commend the report to the House. The Honourable Robin Chappell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I'm directed uh, to present report number 19 of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation Annual Report 2020. That report's table. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, yes, Madam President. Uh, the report that I have just tabled advises the House of the key activities of the Joint uh, Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation in 2020 calendar year. The committee scrutinises instruments made under statutory delegation and determines whether the instruments are beyond the scope of the delegation power or otherwise in breach of the committee's terms of reference. The committee continues to scrutinise large volumes of delegated legislation. This year, the committee scrutinised 330 instruments, including 181 regulations and 80 local laws. Motions for the disallowance of delegated leg legislation usually do not proceed if satisfactory undertakings are given to the committee. The committee only recommends disallowance as a last resort. During 2020, the committee received two ministerial and 17 local government undertakings. The committee requested undertakings from two local governments to repeal their local laws in entirety. Due to the large volume of issues contained within them, these undertakings were provided to the committee. The committee tabled three reports this year. In one of those reports, the committee recommend, recommended that an instrument be disallowed, the instrument being the Curtin University Statute No. 5 election of council members and is set to be debated in this House uh, on its last sitting day. The committee also drew Parliament's attention to its concerns surrounding Curtin University's interpretation of the Curtin Universities Act 1966, which results in Curtin University rather than Parliament deciding on which of its regulatory material will be scrutinised by Parliament. The committee trusts that these matters noted in this report will assist persons and bodies making delegated legislation to understand the committee's process. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable Adele Farina. I'm directed to present report number 34 of the Standing Committee on Public Administration, consultation with statutory office holders. That report's tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, the report that I've just tabled advises the House of the Standing Committee on Public Administration's consultation with statutory office holders under its term, term of reference 5.3b. In October 2020, the committee held public hearings with the Information Commissioner, the Inspector of Custodial Services, the Ombudsman and the Public Sector Commissioner. This report briefly outlines a consultation that occurred with each statutory office holder. 
The committee extends its appreciation to the four statutory office holders for their assistance and cooperation through this year's consultation. These hearings provide the committee with a valuable opportunity to gain a comprehensive understanding of the current work of statutory office holders and any issues they may be encountering. During times of crisis, strong mechanisms for oversighting government actions and decisions are more important than ever. Statutory office holders and their independence from the WA government are an important source of such oversight. With COVID-19 representing presenting unprecedented challenges for our state, the committee sought to ensure that accountability measures have remained visible and effective. The committee makes two findings and nine recommendations. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling the Honourable Michael Mission? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. I am directed to present report number 131 of the Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review Committee, Statutes, Repeals and Minor Amendments Bill 2020. That report is tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, thank you, I would, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, the report that I've just tabled advises the House of the Committee's consideration of the Statutes, Repeals and Minor Amendments Bill 2020. On 9 September 2020, the bill was introduced into the Legislative Council and referred to the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review for consideration and report. The bill proposes the repeal of seven Western Australian Acts, the repeal of six Imperial Acts, the repeal of one provision in each of two Imperial Acts and the amendment of numerous Western Australian Acts. In doing so, the bill makes significant progress with respect to updating the form and content of the statute book. At the same time, as discussed in the report, a number of statutes and provisions which have previously been identified by the government as obsolete, requiring further investigation or unproclaimed, have not been included in the bill. The committee has also noted that further work needs to be undertaken, particularly in relation to obsolete subsidiary legislation and statutes and provisions that have received the royal assent but have not been proclaimed. The committee takes no issue with the amendments affected by the bill. The committee makes some observations regarding what has and has not been included in the bill in the light of government advice in, pre in respect of provisions previously considered by the committee in, uh, in regard to the form and content of the statute book. And I commend the report to the House. Uh, Madam President, as this will be the last report of the Standing Committee in this session, I take the opportunity to say a few words about its work. As I've been honoured, I've been honoured and delighted to have served as chair of the committee in the 40th Parliament, and to serve with my fellow committee members, uh, my deputy, the Honourable Pierre Yang, uh, the Honourable Robin Scott, and the Honourable Laurie Graham. Uh, in our time, we've delivered 18 substantive reports, including four on uniform legislation bills, two on omnibus bills, and two on self-referred inquiries, and dealt with uh, several significant issues. Uh, for the assistance of the House, one being the treaties function that had previously uh, been assigned to the committee. We've crafted, based on government proposals, a model for efficient and timely incorporation of national scheme legislation as part of the law of Western Australia while preserving parliamentary sovereignty. And we've suggested strategies for the cleansing of the statute book and keeping it clean of unproclaimed statutes and unproclaimed provisions. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my fellow committee members for their de dedication and diligence and their contribution, and to the committee's legal advisers, the most long-standing of which uh, was Ms Fel Felicity Mackey and its uh, long-serving committee clerk, Mr Mark Warner, and in respect to this last report, Mr David Carroll's uh, contribution. Are there any further papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Agriculture and Food. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Minister, uh, on behalf of the Minister for Agriculture and Food, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I will move uh, the Veterinary Practice Bill 2020, that a bill for an Act to provide for the regulation of the practice of veterinary medicine in Western Australia and to facilitate the regulation of the practice of veter veterinary medicine on a national basis. To, and to repeal the Veterinary Surgeons Act 1960 and the Veterinary Surgeons Regulations 1979 and to make consequential amendments to various acts and for related purposes to be introduced and read the first time. Are there any further notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? Are there any motions without notice? 
Members will move to orders of the day. Leader of the House. The orders of the day numbers 1 to 3 be taken after order of the day number 43. Members, the Leader of the House has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we now move to order of the day number 44. The Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. I seek leave for orders of the day number 44, appropriation recurrent 2020-21, uh, Bill 2020, and number 45, appropriation capital 2020-21, Bill 2020, to be dealt with cognately. Mm. Members, the Minister seeks leave for, uh, for orders of the day number 44, appropriation recurrent 2020-21, Bill 2020, and number 45, order of the day number 45, appropriation capital 2020-21. 21, Bill 2020 to be dealt with cognately. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. So, members, we now move to orders of the day 44, appropriation recurrent 2020 21, Bill 2020, and order of the day 45, appropriation capital 2020 21, Bill 2020. And the question is that bills be read a second time. Madam Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I don't intend to take a lot of the House's time, I just want to make a few points in relation to the appropriations process. Because obviously members will be aware that uh, any attempt to expend money on the government's behalf requires an appropriation bill uh, approved by the parliament. Uh, it is interesting to note that there's a fair few appropriation bills on the notice paper. Uh, there is, uh, in fact, if we look through uh, the notice paper uh, and with the bills that uh, have been introduced uh, and not debated uh, in terms of appropriation bills or not debated to a point of actually assent. Uh, I think, by my calculation, there's eight of them. So we, we have the appropriations uh, capital 2010-11 to 2015-16 supplementary uh, bill, as well as the equivalent bill in, in recurrent. Uh, there's the appropriation capital 2016-17 supplementary bill, uh, as, as there is also the recurrent. Now, they were introduced on the 13th of September 2017 and the 29th of September 2017, so they've been sitting there for quite a long time uh, look, looking for an opportunity to be approved. Uh, if we go on from those, those two, there's the Appropriation Capital 2017-18 Supplementary Bill, um, which was third read at least, but uh, doesn't appear to have been as assented to, uh, and the equivalent uh, recurrent bill. Uh, and, the, uh, and the Appropriation Capital 2018-19 Supplementary Bill 2020, which was actually introduced into the Parliament on the 11th of March, and this, this part of the Parliament, the 11th of March this year. So there are eight, there are, there are eight appropriations bills uh, sitting, on the, sitting on the notice paper, as well as the two that we are here to debate briefly today, uh, the, the capital and recurrent appropriation bills for 2020-21. So it would be useful to get some of those out of the way, I suggest, and I suspect, Madam President, that we've run out of time again over a four-year period. Uh, maybe it's a system that we need to get in place where if they haven't been dealt with in a certain period of time, uh, a, bit, a bit like a disallowance motion, you, you have to somehow get to appropriations. Because there are, you know, we're going back in some of these bills to 2010-11 expenditure, uh, which is now 10 years out of date, effectively. And members will be aware that sometimes governments are required to spend money that weren't in a budget bill, weren't in an initial appropriation. Something comes along, we all get that. COVID comes along, something comes along, uh, you know, an election comes along, and you need to spend a bit more money. Absolutely fine with that. But these bills then need to be debated and approved at some point. And waiting 10 years, uh, I, I would have thought was was a little a little slack, to be honest. I would have thought that you might have made a bit bigger, uh, a bit bigger effort in terms of getting some of these ones uh, off the notice paper. So uh, I just make that point that it would be, uh, and maybe maybe you can deal with a number of them concurrently, because I suspect I suspect uh, that if you put rolled all of those uh, eight bills into into concurrent bills, both uh, uh, capital and recurrent, and dealt with them concurrently, we could all do we could all do one good budget speech uh, for all of those eight eight bills. And get the thing out of the way. That, that might be a use. There's a helpful hint as we come to the end of the, uh, uh, this particular parliament that uh, running those all together and giving us all one opportunity to say a few things about uh, appropriations would be a useful tool. So th there's, there's, there's a helpful tip because we're, we're here to help uh, as a part of the opposition. I, I think that would be a great, a great thing to do just to get these things out of the way. 
Uh, Madam President, I just want to take, make a, a couple of other statements just in relation to uh, the existing bills uh, and the process that, we've, process that we've gone through to, to get here. Uh, and I will just reinforce uh, one particular point, which uh, I guess you might call my, my PFAS of 2020, Madam President. Uh, and that is, that is a demonstration of the iron ore price in Western Australia and how that has impacted on the state budget. And I was very pleased to get uh, an answer uh, on the 3rd of November, not that long ago, Madam President, where I thought, you know, I've, asked, I've asked for 18 months uh, initially for the government's projections of iron ore price and that was going to do for the budget. And then for the last 12 months, uh, effectively what was historically the impact. And every time I get, I get, um, every time I get asked to wait for the next tabling of a document, be it a budget paper or a mid-year review, and it doesn't actually come out with the answer. They don't, very rarely do you get the answer that says, this was the budget, this was what we were budgeted for, and this was what we actually got. So I was very pleased, Madam President, um, to get this answer from the Minister for the Environment as he represented the Treasurer. Pa perhaps the Treasurer finally gave in as he, as he re-announced his retirement uh, and, and decided to give us a bit of information. But we do have, finally have this, Madam President, uh, from the 3rd of November, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that in 2018-19, iron ore royalties were $1.722 billion higher than the budget expectation, and in 1920, it was $2.199 billion higher than budget expectations. So uh, that's just about $4 billion higher than budget expectations, Madam President. And I do note um, that last year in the February 2019, I did ask the question about what would happen to the state budget if the iron ore price remained above US $90 a tonne, uh, to which it has done not quite universally ever since. And I did note today, and it should be probably noted for the record, that I see the current price today is a bit over 123 US dollars a tonne, uh, well ahead of the 96 dollars a tonne that's in the current budget. Uh, 96 plus, what, 27, uh, 27 at eight, 83 to 85 million dollars a tonne additional. 80, 80, 80, 80, let's, let's say 83, but we can round that down to 80 because we're with it. So, you know, there's another couple of billion dollars over this financial year. So the government's already a billion dollars up pretty much in the, in the time we've had since the end of the beginning of the new financial year, 2020-21. So we're at $5 billion above budget over the last three years. And guess what? The government's COVID response package is $5.5 billion. And the price today is $123 US dollars a tonne, and that is unlikely to go down to the estimate of 96 US dollars a tonne anytime soon. Two major forecasting houses have put the price at 110 and 105 US dollars a tonne. So it will be the case, Madam President, that this government's entire COVID response will be paid for in higher iron ore royalties. Now, you know, good luck to the government, good luck to the, the departing Treasurer. Uh, sometimes you get to take advantage of these windfalls when they come, but a little bit of uh, honesty in the process would have been very, very good. That is, it would have been nice to be able for the government to say, well, guess what? We did well because you know, a dam burst in Brazil and that pushed up the iron ore price some, and then China, as re in a response to its uh, COVID crisis, <coughs> Uh, spent more money stimulating its economy and producing more steels, and that pushed up the iron ore price. And the alternative markets, which will eventually come in and drive the iron ore price back down to where it's traditionally sat, which is probably in the 60 US dollar a tonne region, uh, that will come in, in my view, probably in about 12 months' time as these other sources come on. And at that time, it would be reasonable, then it'll all go back to normal. And the government is right, it should, it should budget low and reap the rewards if they're high, but it should be honest and say, this is not budget management that has given us a surplus these financial years. It is not because we are good financial managers. It is because we have been lucky. We, have, we, received, we received a, uh, a floor price in the GST, which gave us a billion and a half dollars a year for a couple of years. And we received iron ore royalties at over $2 billion in excess of what we budgeted for. And guess what? That has given this government uh, budget surpluses to play with, and they should be thankful, rather than suggesting that this is some plan. Because I don't imagine this government planned, or I hope this government planned for a dam, but didn't plan for a dam burst in Brazil. 
So I don't think they can claim credit for that, and I don't think they can claim credit for China's economic response. So I just make that point, Madam President. It's nice to have the numbers out there. I appreciate the honesty of the Treasurer in providing those numbers. It took me almost 18 months to get uh, that level of commitment out of him, um, but I'm very pleased to see that we can now acknowledge uh, the, true, the true reason that uh, economic management uh, has looked good for the McGowan government. Uh, Madam President, there's one other point before I sit down I'd just like to make in relation to this, and it is a, in my view, very, very careful uh, budget manipulation. Uh, Madam President, on page 238 and 239 of budget paper number three uh, of the uh, Western Australian State Budget 2020-21, uh, it is obvious to all that read that that the government has shifted a significant amount of revenue from 2019-20 to 2020-21. And we've found out through budget estimates, Madam President, that this government gave an edict to all government trading enterprises that they would hold the vast majority of their dividends that they generally pay to government from 2019-20 and hold it over 2020-21. So what, what, what difference did that make, uh, Madam President? Let's just run through it. Uh, in 2018-19, uh, the, the total dividends from GTEs was $1.95 billion. Uh, in 19-20, it was uh, dropped significantly because of that edict to $1.1 billion. In 2020-21, the bud current budget year, it is $3.677 billion before it drops to $2.1 billion, $2.2 billion, $2.2 billion. It is roughly $2 billion that the government receives in dividends. They've taken effectively a, a billion dollars out of 1920 and shoveled that into 2021. And with a bit of uh, manipulation added, added a billion dollars uh, into that. In fact, 2021 does very well at 3.677 billion. Uh, it's 1.68 billion dollars above the average of GTE revenue. And that's very interesting when you consider um, the, total, the total budget. So 2018-19, um, according to the budget papers, the actual budget surplus was you know, 1.6 odd billion dollars in terms of its operating statement, that is, its uh, accrual accounting system, and the estimated budget for 2020-21 is $1.2 billion. But it's received at least $1.1 billion and uh, potentially up to $1.6 billion in a handover from 2019-20 to 2020-21. So if things had have gone as they normally do, you would have had a significant budget surplus of um, nearly $3 billion in 2019-20 and a budget deficit in 2020-21, which I would imagine, Madam President, was not the position that this, the McGowan government wanted to take into the election. I don't imagine they wanted to suggest that there was a budget deficit in this year. So they very cautiously transferred it over. Now, I asked in budget estimates, Madam President, uh, whether the money would be sitting in a GTE bank account versus the consolidated fund and whether there was a reason that it might be better off there because the GTEs, GTEs all receive their revenue through the financial year and then they, pay, they make two payments generally. They make a sort of preliminary payment, if you will, and then, then they, they finish up at the, the, over the next financial year, they make a final payment. But the money is generally sitting in their account. This has happened for many years. So is there a differential between the, the interest they might earn in the GTE versus in the consolidated fund? And the answer is no. So there's no advantage in sitting that money in the GTE fund. Now, the answer when I raised this in estimates with Treasury was that they were concerned about well, the impact it might have on loans. The impact, now, and I'll go through it. Now, unfortunately, Madam President, the, uh, uh, the estimates uh, Hansard uh, transcripts aren't up yet, so I can't give you exact quotes from that. But I will be going through that in some detail to work out whether that's, a real, whether that's a real concern. Because it's hard to see when you've got extra money in the bank and you're simply transferring it from the GTE's savings account to the consolidated fund, it is hard to see why that impacts on the loan capacity of the state. It is really hard to see that. And I suspect it might be one of those very good answers that the Treasury are required to make because it was, as, as acknowledged by Treasury, government policy to, to hold this money over from one 
financial year to the next and hold it in the GTE account until it goes into the consolidated fund. Because it is absolutely the case that you would have gone into, without that, you would have gone into, in my view, a deficit in 2020-21. Now, it's also been interesting to look at it when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the budget papers in relation to the cash budget as much as it is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, accrual budget. Um, so, pardon me. So, Madam President, as we said, the accrual budget suggested a $1.67 billion uh, surplus in 2019-20, billion in 2021, which would have disappeared without, and then down to $363 million the year after before some degree of recovery. But the cash flow statement is a little bit different. Um, it goes down to, Madam President, a cash flow statement of $402 million surplus in 2020-21 before going into deficit of $429 million in 2021-22. So that is even tighter. And I think it would have demonstrated uh, that you were dealing with a genuine budget deficit in 2020-21, uh, the, the, the election year. And I don't think that that was convenient for the government to have those positions in place. And that's why I think there's been a, a fairly careful manipulation to make sure that those numbers uh, come in at the right time uh, for the convenience of the government. And I don't, I don't think it's anything apart from political expediency, but I will look carefully at the uh, Treasury answers and work out whether there is a genuine problem with the loans that might be taken in or out and whether that, a simple transfer of cash from one government account well, a GTE account under the auspices of government to the Consolidated Fund, a government account would have had any significant impact. I think that's very interesting. Uh, as, uh, Mr Deputy President, um, uh, the last thing I just want to say is in relation to the, uh, uh, the estimates process itself. Um, and I, I make the suggestion that I have made, I think, a number of times in this chamber that, in my view, the estimates committee should be calling in government departments as, as frequently as possible to the sitting, the sitting week meetings of estimates uh, and allowing, allowing other, other members of the House to have greater access during the, the week-long estimates committee hearings. Uh, this is, in my view, what happens uh, much more obviously in the Senate, where Senate hearings and departments and departmental heads and ministers are called in regularly. Uh, and some of, those, uh, some of those senators on both sides of politics do a, a, an absolutely forensic job. Uh, and it is absolutely the place where oppositions cut their teeth uh, on good estimate process in those committees. And I think it would be worth a future parliament looking at a different process where these government departments were dragged in far more regularly uh, and subjected to the scrutiny of the committee and that would leave the, the, the actual estimates process available to all the other members. Because it is, it is a, and I understand the difficulty of the estimates process where you might have eight members in the room for a department that's in there for one hour. And, and the chair, I have to say, the chair of the estimates committee is generally extremely generous in terms of my time. And so I'm certainly not going to cast any aspersions upon the management of the committee. I, I think. Um, I think the chair and occasionally the acting chair are immensely tolerant, uh, 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 immensely tolerant of my of my uh, uh, actions and activities in the estimates process. Um, so it's not it's not a criticism of the way it's chaired, but I get the I get I, I get the problem that is if you've got eight members each seeking to to run a line of investigation, uh, and the first four of those are the committee members themselves who I think should be given an alternate opportunity, separate to the ones where other members of the House actually get that opportunity. Now, potentially it adds more work to the, uh, the estimates committee. Uh, and if I'm lucky enough to be back at the next parliament, maybe I'll put my hand up and see if that might be uh, something of, well, I'll have to try and, I'll have to, I'll have to try and roll the, the, the Honourable Jorn Sidmer as a formidable, formidable member. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have to see how the, where that one ends up. But I think, I, think it would be, I think it would be a far better way for this parliament to operate, uh, even, even though it, it requires greater work, because it would allow more members off the floor, including, including Labor members, 
who could then be encouraged to write their own questions, and, um, uh, which I think would be an excellent, an excellent suggestion. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mr. Deputy President, I'll, I'll just avert for one minute. Um, in, when I was in the House that shall not be named, it was not, un, it was not uncommon occasionally for members of the opposition and backbenchers of the government uh, under the Gallup Carpenter government uh, to, to conspire to ask questions of ministers and parliamentary secretaries that they didn't like very much. Uh, and the, uh, I remember one with a parliamentary secretary for agriculture, uh, and I think the Honourable Kim Chance was the minister at the time. Uh, was forced to try and answer a question on brucellosis uh, in sheep, uh, something he had absolutely no idea about, um, having never palpated the appropriate part of a sheep. Um, but it, it, did, it did give us a great... Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, it did give us a great deal of humour at the time. So uh, it, would be, it would be an opportunity for even for, for backbench government members to have greater access to the estimates process. Uh, and it would give other members who aren't committee members, I think, a greater access to the committee process. I know I've made that suggestion before. Uh, it will, probably won't be taken up, but I take the opportunity to make it one more time, Mr Deputy President, because um, just occasionally you can nag people into things. Um, uh, and with, with that, um, the, the appropriations process in this particular year, uh, from my perspective, will be finalised. Members, the question is the bills be read a second time. The Honourable Colin Tinknell. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I make the, take the opportunity today to talk about um, the appropriations bill and also what's commonly known as a budget in reply, as uh, I haven't had the opportunity up to this stage. Very interesting comments from the um, uh, the Honourable Steve Thomas about uh, where the budget lies and, um, and where it ended up, uh, considering the iron ore figures and also the GST and many other items. And, um, when I look at the, the budget myself, I, um, I was a little bit disappointed. We had to wait a while for this budget to come out and I was expecting um, the battle-weary citizens of WA to be given something a little bit more uplifting something that um, they could um, really clutch their hands on and take advantage of. And, and the reason I'm saying that is that I just didn't think this budget had uh, the imagination it needed. It didn't have the vision. There was a, a lack of hope and inspiration in there for especially strugglers. And so they're the areas that uh, I think the government failed. Um, I understand the government um, you know, uh, leading up to an election, they wanted to uh, hold the fort and keep things uh, as best as possible. However, um, I, I just think they missed an opportunity. They had time to really construct this budget and make it something that um, a lot of, like, as I said before, battle-weary and uh, struggling citizens of Western Australia could really take, you know, get their teeth into. And, um, and uh, we, if you look at um, some of the announcements that have been made and some of the things that happened during the budget. A lot of these things were already announced beforehand and um, there wasn't a lot of new things in this budget. Um, and if they weren't, hadn't been announced, they were already on the books. So I suppose um, if you look at a government that's seeking re-election, um, then that's understandable. I can understand that. However, um, by doing that, they gave themselves a bit of wriggle room for a bit of pork barrelling before an election. That's the way I see it, and um, um, they, um, that's the way they've operated as far as I'm concerned. So look, you know, when I look at what's happened, um, and this is one of the reasons why a committee that I was in uh, recommended a certain um, avenue to look at um, election promises, especially after the um, local uh, jobs, local projects uh, that we went through. And um, obviously things we believe could be done a lot more professionally and, and planned better. Uh, and when you really look at it, the pub test, it, that, the way uh, that local project, local jobs was presented, just doesn't pass the pub test. It really doesn't. And there's recommendations, many recommendations, I believe 32, that uh, ask for a parliamentary budget office and I'm hoping that this government 
or the alternative government in their wisdom will look at this seriously. It also is a very uh, worthwhile um, resource to the whole House and members wanting to price and, and, uh, and cost their uh, uh, policies. And I think that would help not only the, uh, the, the government or the alternative government, but also cost benches as well. And I think there'd be a lot more honesty in um, the way we go about those things. Um, you know, I, there are a few things in there that are crippling to me. I, um, we still have a lot of unemployment in Western Australia. And, um, you know, I, I, there, was a, there was an opportunity in this budget to help make that jump and provide a lot more, um, I suppose, um, you would... Um, larger infrastructure projects that would really take it to the next stage. Um, these, these, a lot of these projects have been announced, but they haven't commenced. And this is the problem. Plenty of announcements, not as much action. I also, um, you know, I want to also mention that um, the charges that were uh, laid upon the public when this government first came into power, uh, back in 2017, 2018, were crippling. I mentioned this at the start. They were crippling towards the average Joe uh, person out there who have to pay these fees and charges. Yes, the state was already in debt. Yes, the state was struggling. But so were the people, not just the government, not just the coffers in Treasury. The people were struggling as well. And when you look at electricity prices in 2017, went up 10.9%. Uh, they went up a further 7 per cent the year after in 1819. Water went up 5.5 per cent. Gas went up 1.9. Public transport went up 2.1. Registrations went up 5 per cent. Emergency services levy went up 10 per cent. Um, no wonder um, they decided to um, not add any increases this year leading into an election. Uh, they'd already taken the money off the public. Uh, it would have been nice to see some cuts, not just hold it as it is, because that may have made a big difference to the public who are struggling out there. There are many people on um, either the dole, job seeker or job keeper, and they are nervous right now because they know that the federal government is trimming back on these things. There is no endless pot of money and it can't continue forever. But where are those jobs coming? And that's what they're thinking, people, in the next... Um, few months that are coming up. Um, I also want to mention um, the, uh, the increased uh, hardship, hugs. Now, I've brought this up for the last three and a half, four years in Parliament. Um, and I would expect the government to not make it harder for people to uh, um, get hugs, but they did. They've actually made, uh, made it harder for people, the criteria harder for people to apply and uh, you know, to qualify for that payment. I think that um, lacks compassion and uh, is very tough on the general public. Um, we also... Um, we, the residential rent uh, relief grant scheme, um, only 5.4 million was used. Uh, 30 million was allocated. So um, only around half of those that, who applied were successful. So once again, that sort of, I, it looks as like it was too hard to, uh, to qualify for that payment. When you think 30 million was allocated in a time of a pandemic, um, it may have, um, I would have expected the government to make it easier to access that, that funding. Um, West Australia should be uh, thanking the federal government in this state for keeping things afloat financially while the borders have been closed. Um, I'm not a fan of this federal government, but that's one move that they have done well. And so if that hadn't happened, I'd hate to think where we'd be now. And, uh, you know, uh, the McGowan government is riding high on their popularity. And uh, as I've mentioned before in this House, and I think most people on this side of the House have mentioned, mentioned it before, they did a good job of closing down the borders when it was needed. They did a good job to get the facilities and also all the materials required for this pandemic and to support the, the, the medical fraternity. And we, we applaud them for that. And we made sure that those uh, emergency bills went through. 
And when the people of WA look at those emergency bills that went through, they should be thanking Parliament as well as the government for making that easy and making sure that those bills went through in enough time to be successful and um, um, to work for this, uh, this government. So, look, um, Mr Deputy President, I just want to now look at um, some of the things that where the government did well and some of the things where I think the government maybe have failed. So I'll just start off with um, a look at the foreign buyers tax. They brought it in. Uh, they brought in a 7 per cent foreign, 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 foreign buyers tax. I would have liked to have seen somewhere in the region of 15 to 20 per cent, which is something we took to the election. But I do applaud them for doing that. And I'm very, very happy that um, they uh, brought that in. I know there's others in this House on uh, this side of the, the, the chamber that doesn't agree with that, but um, I think that was a good move. And uh, you know, when you look at some of the stimulation that's been going on when it comes to homes and when it comes to um, building, uh, there's been uh, things that have actually caused areas uh, uh, more difficulty. Um, government has stimulated the uh, building and construction industry in some of the wrong areas. Uh, simply stimulating development companies and new apartments in a market already flooded with apartments is not the right way to go about it. Also, apartments aren't homes. Young West Australians need homes. That's what they need, Deputy President. They need homes that they can live in, bring up their family. Yes, we are uh, a modern uh, Australia now, and um, maybe the old quarter block is not exactly the ideal Thing, but there are people that are, um, have uh, a planning of family um, from um, what I've seen is still possibly the best thing that we have going for us in Australia. When you travel the world, we are compacted and we are, the big cities are overcrowded and playing spaces and um, parks, especially you know, formal uh, sporting arenas and that, have been limited and uh, access to those have cost a lot of money. And so people that uh, have been brought up on that quarter acre block with a football ground or a um, you know, school oval down the road have been lucky over the last 30, 40, 50 years. But that's getting less and less in the, in the far northern suburbs and the far southern suburbs. So that wonderful family home is still very important to West Australians. The other thing that I want to look at is um, stamp duty for uh, retirees. Um, this government missed an opportunity here. Uh, this parliament made a, a decision, um, 17 to 10, every party but the government voted for reduced stamp duty uh, for retirees. And it would, have, it would have been a real bonus for the people of West Australia. It would have freed up a family home closer to the city, not 150 k's away or 100 k's away. Obviously, every time our suburb grows, and grows and grows, the infrastructure needed and the cost to the taxpayer grows and grows and grows. Transport, we also have um, you know, schools, hospitals that need to be built in areas where um, it can take an hour and a half to two hours to get to work. Um, people may get a job in the suburbs, but then when their job changes and they move on, and that's a common thing in today's society, they uh, probably can't get themselves to Perth because of the travelling distance. So I, I think it would have allowed seniors to centralise and uh, get closer to facilities themselves. It would have also stimulated that house sale. There would have been a house sale. So stamp duty still would have happened on the other side. And um, despite agreeing um, with the concept, the government was only part the, um, the only party that didn't support the motion, as I mentioned. All other parties. I think six parties in this House did. Um, I think um, you know, it's a great thing when um, the public, especially retirees who have been around a long time, and they may have some wealth, but by selling their, um, their uh, older home, which has become too large and too hard for them to maintain, that would have also helped them finance their own retirement. It would have been a lesser burden on the taxpayer. So I think that was a missed opportunity for this government. Um, another missed opportunity, it's not completely missed because they did lower the threshold on payroll tax. 
And um, one of the first meetings uh, One Nation members had with the, pri with the Premier about three and a half years ago was um, we talked about payroll tax. His eyes lighted up, and I, he, you could see that he would, wanted to lower payroll tax. I've also spoke to the Treasurer about this in the past, and uh, he said it was the biggest tax that they get in government, and he was looking at ways to doing that. Um, you know, payroll tax is a tax on employment. We have high unemployment, so um, it makes it exceptionally hard for small business to employ extra people. Now, right now, after this pandemic, after the time that the world and this state and this country has been through, I think more could have been done. I, it, when it's all said and done, our party policy is to demolish, get rid of payroll tax. But sometimes that may be need to be done in e incremental stages. So uh, we understand that. So um, look, that's an area that I think was a, a lost opportunity. Small business, you know, they should never be ever asked to pay payroll tax. You know, to have as a restaurant or a recruitment agency, people like that paying payroll tax, it is uh, it's very, very negative and it's going to cost people jobs. So we're going to be paying for those people on the dole or in other services anyway. Wouldn't it be better to have them working and paying income tax to the government? Now, um, I uh, want to also mention in August and September in 2018, we put a motion before this House to reduce the rate and increase the threshold. The government did that, as I mentioned before. Uh, it was a year later when they brought that in. And uh, you know we would have liked it to have been a little bit higher threshold, but they did raise the threshold, um, and I, uh, I thank them for that. Next uh, area, this is an area I think they've completely failed. It's a tough area. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't think any government in, in Australia, let alone in Western Australia, have got this covered. So I understand that. And all sides of parliament need to work together on this issue, and that's the social housing and the homelessness. I'll talk about social housing first. So, um, you know, it's been reduced. I cannot believe this is the Labor government, and they have reduced the social homes available to the public since they've been in power for the last four years. That just doesn't make sense to me. That is a core issue for them. Uh, they've made many announcements. About this time last year, a little bit later, it was December, when they made an announcement about Housing First. I'd been banging on about that for about three years before. However, they made a massive announcement. I was very pleased, but it hasn't happened. It's 12 months later. Nothing has happened. And the only excuse I've heard from the, from the Housing Minister and others is that uh, oh, we, COVID came along and I said, well, surely. In, a, in, a, in the area where we have this pandemic, that is a time when more was needed, not less. It should have been rolled out and more money should have been allocated to Housing First. It is a program that works all around the world. It's proven to have 50 per cent success rate. It's run in Newcastle, it's run in the States, it's run in Europe, and it's been announced in WA, but it's not happening. That's very disappointing. So, you know, there has been a $13.8 million um, expenditure on 32 apartments. Um, I wonder where that, how, that money is coming from. It looks like um, those apartments aren't going to be used for social housing. I hope they are, because we desperately need them. If it isn't, once again, that's pretty poor form on this government. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of people out there struggling. They were, they were struggling when this government came into power, and they're still struggling, and there should be a lot more social housing. And I, when I talk about the figures, the real numbers, there are more than 1,100 fewer dwellings in social housing stock today than when they came into office. Facts. The government made fanfare of building 250 homes and refurbishing another 1,500 dwellings. Meanwhile, they closed 1,600. You know, they are, they are um, treading on water here and, and going nowhere. So that's very disappointing. The people out there are suffering. 
Homelessness, I've talked about that a bit. It's gone from you know, eight or seven or eight thousand over the last few years, uh, up to nine and, and growing. Um, I, I look, I, I, I know it's been a thing that the, uh, you know, the Lord Mayor wants to talk about. It. This isn't about you know, getting elected. This is about great societies always look after their most vulnerable people. And we are not a great society until we can achieve that and be better at what we do. Once again, a very difficult issue. Uh, on, 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 you know, I'd say to the government, continue to work hard in this area. Get that Housing First program going. Get those, that's a, that is a, an action that does work. It's been proven to work. It's a really tough issue. They've been looking for years to find a program that works. This is one program that does work. And I, uh, you know, I've seen them demolish uh, temporary sh uh, shelters in Bunbury, and I'm thinking, that's fine because those shelters weren't great, but they had nothing ready to replace it. And uh, so, once again, more people on the street. That's the only real action I've seen over the last few months. Plenty of announcements, not enough action. Drugs and rehabilitation. I think they've done a bit recently, but I think they got off to a very, very slow start. Um, drugs in this state, that's probably one of the areas, um, Mr Deputy President, that we, we can ha all hang our heads. Uh, drugs in this state is abysmal. We are one of the worst areas in the world, especially the Western world, uh, you know, and this state leads Australia. And the area that I, I uh, am a member for, the South West, leads Western Australia. So it's an area that I've been banging on once again about for three and a half years, and I haven't seen enough action. I've seen, once again, plenty of announcements on um, uh, meth, you know, arrests and things like that, and meth's gone down a little bit, and that's great, because meth, of all the drugs, would be the worst. It is complete family destroyer. And, uh, it's one of the reasons why crime and um, violence is so prevalent in our society. It's an area that we, we must keep up the work. It doesn't matter who wins power in the election. This is an area we need to get better at. I've seen the rise of cocaine by 150 per cent. Now, I've said this before. They are the facts. Um, M MDMA, 85 per cent up. Heroin, up 75 per cent. So there's areas that are, that are good and there's areas that are very poor. And it's been very slow progress by this government. They, they got started late in this area. Um, you know, I look at uh, drug offences. Uh, police stats have drug offences down 13.8 per cent. Sounds great on paper, but consumption is up. It doesn't correlate to me. Something's going on with those figures. I don't know how figures are manipulated on this, but it just doesn't make sense to me. So, um, you know, I support our police. They've had a tough time. Uh, they've now been given, you know, about 800 coppers uh, to help the beats over the next four years. And uh, that's a good thing. But, gee, talk about getting on to that late. It's four years now they have been struggling against high drugs, high violence, homelessness, and so much going on, and yet their numbers were reduced, reduced, reduced. And then they were asked to help out with the COVID, which reduced other coppers off the beat. And those policemen have done a fantastic job in responding to the COVID. I thank them at the last estimates hearing for the job that they've done on that. So uh, I take my hat off to the policemen in, of, of WA and the leadership of the police force. And I hope um, this government follows through on those announcements that they made, because there's been a bit of follow through missing in this last four years. Um, so look, uh, Mr Deputy President, I just want to make a quote from a um, of the Pennington Institute Australia's annual overdose report 2020. It's the country's most comprehensive source of data about drug-related deaths. And it's shown that Western Australians continue to die from overdose at higher rates 
than residents of any other state or territory. This report also reveals that the, for the first time on record, West Australia has the highest rate of heroin-induced overdose per capita. It's just taken over Victoria. Um, so that's, the, that's a quote from uh, the Pennington Institute, Australia's annual overdose report 2020. That's not a great uh, first for us. Um, as I said, I know it's hard to tackle drugs. It's been a, an issue for the world for the last 40, 50 years. And, uh, but we have to keep working very hard, and a part of that would have been having more coppers on the beat earlier. Um, I mentioned the police. As I mentioned before, we went to the election asking for 1,000 police. They put on 800, and they've done a few announcements before that. So, in the end, they're going to put on that 1,000, but they're going to do it at the end of their term and over the next four years. That was uh, something they should have done at the start of their term. And, uh, like I said, the coppers have been fighting a losing battle in many areas, many areas and uh, they've done it tough. Um, I also heard an announcement just yesterday about a comp comprehensive program to look after police uh, policemen and, and officers that have um, um, you know, succumbed to injury or, or, or mental issues, and that was a good... I don't know any details about that, but I read it only yesterday, and that was good to see. That's something that's been... Oh, I think it's been wanted for about 30 years. And people have said, oh, but the coppers chose wages and whatever. Once again, they are in an exceptionally dangerous position. They do jobs that no one else wants to do, and we need to support them fully, not um, you know, play around with, with things. 24-hour police stations. Um, we called for that, and I think there needs to be more funding in that area. Um, you know, having estimates last week really highlights a, a fact to me where we don't have the changeover well. There are so many good operators in, let's say, communities where they're dealing with uh, youth at risk and, uh, and then come Friday, um, they're off having their weekend, the workers, and the youth at risk is out there and the coppers have to try and take over with very little knowledge of what's been happening in the past. And when you've got lack of numbers and the violence and the drugs involved, you know, it's very, very hard. I think the... Um, I think they do a fantastic job, but 24-hour um, police stations would handle that a lot better than what we've had recently. Um, One, Na One Nation also called for better resources and accommodation for our police in the regions. It's an area that I think is getting better, but uh, been lacking over the last four years. Health matters. Um, if we go back to the VAD, there were many members of this House on all sides of Parliament, talking about palliative care and the lack of in regional areas. I really do hope that the government honours their commitment they made during those 57 amendments we passed in this House to that bill. It made that bill safer. It could have been a lot safer if another five or six had got passed. They were defeated by one vote, and uh, it would have made that bill even better. But they didn't get through, and I'm really hoping that the government really takes up the initiative on palliative care in the regions, not just for a VAD, but for many other reasons. Um, you know, we, we've got a long way to go, and uh, we can't use this, the fact that we are a big, large state. We've been a big, large state forever, and most of the money and the resources and the funding for all of these things comes from the country. We should be returning that back to those people. They are just as important as anyone sitting around in Florida or uh, Cloverdale. Um, the Medi Hotels. I haven't seen um, too much action in that area. The construction of the first Medi Hotel in Murdoch, uh, I believe, is yet to even start. So this project is uh, uh, over a year behind now. It was a big announcement last election. Hospital ramping. Yeah, in the middle of a pandemic. It's a bit scary. I would hate to think that we could have another breakout, 
and that uh, hospitals are already under pressure under, when we've got no real numbers in the pandemic at the moment. So I'd like to see that improve. Um, in the lead-up to the 2017 election, as I said, the Labor Party published a glossy brochure touting its plan to introduce urgent care clinics to reduce pressure on our hospital emergency departments. The, the, um, these were supposed to adapt um, the St John Ambulance urgent care clinic model, yet to date, and, and, um, and all we've seen is a trial at this stage, as far as I know, and I'd like to see more on that. St John Ambulance figures uh, reveal uh, major ramping, uh, where patients are waiting up to 30 minutes before being handed over. Um, to emergency departments, increased across the metropolitan system to a record of 3,074 hours last month. I was going to do my budget reply in um, October. Well, it's now it was September. So um, those they're not good figures. That's something that the government should be putting more resources in, and they should have done that in the last budget. Infrastructure and transport. Wow. Do we have some disagreement on this? I've talked about uh, more rail in certain areas where it's needed. It would not only save lives on the road, it would also, um, um, I believe, make it so much more, uh, especially in certain areas, so much more um, uh, efficient where um, we just get some of those trucks off the road that we have at the moment. We've had an awful week. This last week, I think we've lost a couple of uh, people out to sea. We've had a shark attack and five people, generally in that southwest region, die on our roads. I'm not saying that that's the cause of it, the bad roads. Some of it could be. But I've talked about the wheat belt having the worst um, record for road deaths per head of population just about anywhere in the world. That's not something to be proud of. And um, we need to do more. I think getting those massive, giant trucks off some of the roads, there is a need for them still. Uh, and if we're going to leave them out there, we need to fix the roads up so they can handle those trucks, because many of the regional roads in the wheat belt can't. That's a fact. Um, so look, we've had a cost blowout on Metronet. Not a single sentiment of rail has been um, laid. So this is something that's... Uh, Gee, when um, I'd never even thought about uh, running for parliament, and I heard Mr Gallup and the Labor government talking about Metronet then, uh, and yet after four years of government, nothing but the costs have gone up. So, if the government's having an issue, if the government's having problems in this area, they need to be honest. They need to state the facts and then get on with the business. And if they need to spend more money on it to get the job done, I think everyone knows that this is a signature policy for them at the last election. It's been a signature policy for 12 years, maybe longer. So, uh, you know, this is not a good thing seeing the budget go up when, when we haven't even had a, um, one, a one line set down. Um, almost all Metronet projects have so far missed every major milestone. Government has abandoned row eight, but still buying property for it. Row eight. A lot of the money's been funded by the federal government. Row nine. We have, uh, I think, in the region of 10,000 jobs could be created. We're just coming out of a pandemic, or hopefully, let's hope we don't bounce back into one. Um, this is an opportunity for the government to give a lot more jobs to those people. And for a person that uses that road three, four, five, six times a week, it's a nightmare. Uh, when I say that road, I mean all the roads in that district, Leach Highway, Row Highway, uh, because of the bank up of trucks. That needs to be sorted out. It needs to be built. Most of the money is coming from the federal government. It would be a fantastic thing for the, to, to alleviate the chaos and the traffic uh, mayhem in those southern suburbs. You if want the outer harbour, fine. In 30, 40 years' time when it's needed, fine. That doesn't change anything about row eight and row nine. They're needed now, because we have chaos in the roads in the southern suburbs. Um, 
I want to uh, now just quickly look at education, just a few little things. Um, we, we, early in the piece, we saw the, the Minister for Education, I believe, get off to a bad start with some not well thought out announcements. That's now gone and that's passed. In the last um, three or four years, it's been a bit smoother sailing. But there are still schools that have done it pretty tough. Derby District High School was forgotten about for a while and uh, they have wobbling old asbestos walls. Uh, they've got scary toilets and I think there's only two for the, for the whole school. And 85% uh, of those students at that school are Indigenous, which is the highest proportion of um, Indigenous uh, population in any school in WA. That's an area where I think you know, things just have to get done. Once again, removing asbestos is difficult, but get on with the job. You are the government. You wanted to be the government. You have a responsibility to the West Australian public and especially your school, school students. Get the job done, make it safe and make sure you're looking after those schools in the regional areas. We did get off to a bad start. We know about that and we've had plenty of said, said, said about that and that's finished. Um, I just want to finish off, uh, Mr Deputy President, I want to finish off talking about some of the things that uh, I think this government and an alternative government have uh, let us down over the last 30, 40 years. Areas that are important to One Nation, areas that I'd like to see more money put aside in the coming budgets, and unfortunately not enough has been spent. Matter of fact, when I look at the Water Corp and other organisations, they've been saving money and not spending it in when they really should have been in many areas. And I'd like to highlight some of those areas. Farmers in many areas are struggling. We know that the climate's drying at the moment, and uh, I don't know how long it's going to dry for. However, we need to do more. We need to do a lot more about capturing water and helping um, farmers you know, go about their business to make that fantastic wealth that they produce for us. Even in dry years, they still are bringing out fantastic crops and are supporting the mining industry in making this state and this country the great state and country that it is. But at times, I don't think we're supporting them well enough. There, um, there are areas where dams, weirs, standpipes uh, that need to be repaired, and uh, yet certain departments are returning money to the government coffers and the job's not being done. I think that's very disappointing. Um, irrigation programs should be established in certain areas. We've heard uh, CS, uh, CSIO, I think it is, up in the, uh, Fitzroy talk about a, a, a weir system that could be put into place. Um, it would help irrigate, it would help get more um, employment for the locals in that area, especially the Indigenous people who are the, are the majority of the population up that way. We're not talking about a dam. We are talking about retaining that water, using that water for the wealth of West Australians and creating jobs for people that need jobs. Everyone knows how bad the social situation is in the, in the Kimberleys. Here's a chance to make a difference. Making government payments, giving people money, is not the answer. It never has been and it never will be. Uh, we need to uh, allow them to find that independence and choice that most of us have been afforded from our parents, from our uncles and aunties, from our contacts through school, high school, uni. So many Indigenous people in those remote areas up in the Kimberley don't get that opportunity. And the jobs are very few and far between. And not everyone wants to be a ranger or a dot painter. We need to provide those jobs. We need to look at ways that we can do that. This is one way. And that water is needed up there. Um, there is an industry up there that wants to grow, but it's, it's hamstrung by um, being held back. Um, I've talked to the, uh, the uh, Regional Development Minister many times about salinity problems in Australia and in WA. And as the South West member, which borders on that agricultural region, it's a major issue for us. And there is a lot of work that needs to be done over the next 20, 30 years. Once again, another important issue that we just, we just sort of stay away from and don't really get our teeth into because we know that we're not going to get patted on the back for it at the next election. And that's a problem. 
You know, you have to govern for all people of West Australia, not just the people that vote for you. If you want the responsibility of government, so really we need these. Whether it's a, a canaling or, or system that we do, there are many experts out there. I've brought some of those experts to this house and talked about it when I first arrived here uh, three and a half years ago. And I'd like to see uh, more respect paid to these people because they've got some great ideas. And uh, it's not just one program. It, it's probably a matter where we need to work three, four, five or six programs to solve those salinity problems that we have in, the, um, in our state. Um, there's a lost opportunity. And another lost opportunity, uh, it was one nation that brought to this house. We didn't get support from anyone other than a few crossbench members. We brought to this house, we need to cut red tape. We know that what we asked for was massive and was probably asking for too much. We decided to go ahead anyway because we tried to negotiate with parties about doing maybe one or two of those areas where you could cut red tape, green tape, blue tape, whatever it is, uh, but no one was willing to give an inch. Once again, it's one of the things that gets put in the too hard basket. And uh, we've just gone through a pandemic. That would have been the perfect time while businesses were, a lot of businesses were shut down and while a lot of areas were weren't operating, it would have been an opportunity for this government to make changes to red tape in this state. I think they've missed an opportunity. I think the federal government's missed an opportunity. They've made some cuts, and I know about Streamline, but it's not far enough. It's not far enough. I'm not saying the previous government did a good job in this area. Matter of fact, they may be one of the reasons why we have so much red tape and green tape. So. Um, the pandemic was an opportunity. Who knows, this pandemic we may be with us for many years to come. I hope not. But if it is, it's an area that it's uh, in the too hard basket and we need to put our head down and work with businesses about um, altering and changing and reducing some of that. Why? Why would you do it? Well, it's just too expensive to do business in this state. Yes, the big mining companies, they can afford it, but most small businesses can't. Farmers can't. So we need to look at that and do more. I just want to finish off, as I said, talking about the role that One Nation's played. We were in the wilderness for 16 years. I remember the three guys that were in here back in 2001, 2002, 2003. I also remember that they, uh, they voted against Clive Palmer having a state agreement with the Greens. They made some good decisions in this House and they were contributors to this House. And I know, working with my fellow colleague Robin Scott, the Honourable Robin Scott, that we've made some great decisions and we've made a really positive uh, effort to work with all sides of par um, all parties and, and, and the government in this House. You know, we, um, we have saved thousands of jobs in some of the hard decisions we've had to make. We've led the fight on certain issues where other members of the Conservative parties were a little bit unsure about which way to go. If I think about the gold tax, I know it was Robin Scott that led the fight on that. Why would he lead the fight on gold tax? Not because he's worried about the gold miners, he's worried about the employees of those gold miners. We had 19 gold miners or gold mines in WA and 11 of them were marginal. And it's somewhere in the region of three or 4,000 people would have lost their job if that gold tax had gone through. And at that stage, most of the money was going to go, be gobbled up by the Eastern States and GST anyway. It was a badly thought out bill, and we opposed it. We asked the other Conservatives to join our fight, and they did. And I thank them for that. I also want to talk about the lobster industry. You know, they're going through another tough time because uh, of what's going on with China. Now, I'll leave that up to the federal government and this Premier to continue to work together, not have snipes at each other, to work together to have a relationship with China. We want to trade with China. One Nation wants trade with China. We just want, us, want this nation and this state to have options. We need to have more options so we don't get held, you know, blackmailed by China or bullied by China like it's been going on just recently. So we need to be diligent in that way 
and we need to find alternatives. It's not just India. There is many nations that have got millions of people, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Malaya, Thailand, Indonesia. They want our produce too. It's about doing the hard work and making sure that we have other options besides working with um, China, because that's not going to work. It'll go on forever. They're not about to change their regime. Their regime's going to be there a long time. Chinese people are going, have got an awful time with their government, and that's something that hopefully they will sort out in the, in the coming years. We've seen what's happened in Hong Kong. We see the threats that uh, Taiwan are under, and now they're mucking around with the South China Sea and threatening Philippines and other countries, Vietnam even. So um, we know that's not going to go away. So that's a problem. We don't, don't need to go back to them and just cave in. We need to go back, work out how we can deal with them under our uh, values set. We should never, ever lower our value set. And then if they don't want to do business with us under those value sets, we should have already done the homework and done the hard work and found other trading partners, alternatives to the Chinese. Yes, once again, hard work. It's not just the government needs to help industry here. Industry needs to get off their backside and go and look where else those alternatives are. Um, now I mentioned uh, the lobster industry. Once again, a badly thought out bill was put to this House. And um, we, it was around about Christmas time two years ago. I remember not spending much time with my family. I spent most of the time up along the coast, the northern coast, the Brolis Islands, you name it, went everywhere, I spoke to small operators, large operators, and they said the consultation's been uh, pretty similar to the most consultation that we get from this uh, Labor Party. It is this, 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 this is what we're going to do. Um, and then they just leave it, and then they come back and announce things without secondary follow-ups. Now we spoke to people at the at the highest level in the industry, and also the mums and dads, and they said this is a bad, bad bill. We have um, been through a tough time over many years, and we've fought tooth and nail to make this one of the most successful lobster in industries in the world, probably the one these days. And now they're going through another tough stage. But I know these guys, they will get through that because they'll look at alternative markets and they'll find alternative markets. It may not be as lucrative as what they've got now, but it means that they can do business uh, because they've worked hard to find alternatives. So that's another bill that this government came up with. That luckily, the Conservatives on this side of the House got together and defeated that bill. Uh, that saved many jobs also. Um, I want to get into uh, just general areas. When we came into this House, I've heard many speeches on this side of the House and that side of the House about One Nation being racist. Uh, quite amazing, really, when you think of the members of One Nation in this parliament and the uh, contribution they've made in all areas. And so I would say to those people, you got it wrong. You were talking about a speech that was made 26 years ago. People make mistakes. My federal leader made mistakes in the way she expressed her views. These days, she has learnt a lot. It's one of the reasons why I came back into parliament, because I saw a growth in her. I saw a growth in the party, and I was proud to run as a leader and to run as a member of this party. And uh, Robin Scott and myself, we will always stand up for people less fortunate than ourselves whether they be Indigenous people, whether they be new immigrants into this country. We have, have, we have strong views about immigration and how it should be handled. We agree with immigration, but we don't agree with the amount of immigration that is coming into this country. Why? Because we put this country's citizens first. And so many of the citizens of Australia and this state are missing out when there's money being spent in other areas. Uh, and of course, there are thousands and millions of people waiting in the wings to uh, come to this country because it's one of the best, or the best, um, waiting in the wings in refugee camps, wanting an opportunity to come here. Yet boats arrive or other people try and sneak in and certain sides of politics want to support them. Why would you want to support them? 
you really want to be supporting the people that have that have done it tough and are waiting in line to get their opportunity to come to either this country, New Zealand, or other great Western countries. Uh, because, and the reason why they want to come is because of the great rules, the regulations, the governments, and the fact that they can be free in this country and, and learn their own religion or practice their own religion, and, but they still need to obey the rules and the regulations that have made this country great. That's all we stand for. How you could get called racist for that, I don't know. But um, you know, I think it's just a bit of politicking, people trying to throw stones. Uh, it didn't worry us. That's why I've left it to now. We're strong enough guys to stand up to that rubbish. And uh, we know that we've created a party that will be better prepared this election than we were last. We had very little time to get our act together, but we were still able to get three members elected. Close to a quarter of a million West Australians decided that One Nation was a good bet. And they, when they look at our performance over the last four years, they can be proud of what we've achieved in this House. We would love to have members in the lower house. And maybe one day, future One, Nem one Nation members will be in there. It may, may happen this election, but you know, everyone has wishes for high uh, ideals, and um, we're no different. So I want to mention that. Um, I'm very, very happy with what we've achieved in this House. It's been um, hard work. It's not just those big bills that we oppose. We've gone, to, we've gone and spoke to the CRCs. Remember the community resources centres that were either going to be cut or, or done away with? Well, the government re changed their decision on that. And some of that was members from One Nation going out and speaking to each one of these individual CRCs, especially I did in the South West, and they went, we can't believe it because we don't have a bank, we don't have places where people can go, libraries or whatever. The CRC is the lifeblood of this community. We need it to exist. We need it to continue. Uh, often I, uh, you know, young people get their first ever job at a CRC in a country town. Or maybe a farmer's wife. Because the farm's not going that great, she'll need two or three days' work you know, at a CRC. That's where those jobs are. So it was very important that we supported that. And it goes on. I remember the Honourable Rick Mazza bringing up a bill when I first sat down in this parliament. He had learnt from his four years previous that um, just taxing um, is, is not the way to go. That uh, even shires in country regions were going to be uh, in a negative place where if you uh, were to charge them for their, um, you know, their road maintenance vehicles and that sort of thing. We defeated that with a disallowance. So I was happy, and so were my other members, to uh, support that bill. I also want to—I know the, uh, the, the other members of the crossbench aren't here—I want to say thank you. Thank you for working together. It's not easy for three or four parties to work together. I think most of us know that. The, um, uh, the Liberal Party have uh, worked uh, for many years with the, the Nats. Um, sometimes it's been in a coalition, other times it's been just as an alignment. And of course the Greens and Labor possibly have more in common as well, so they work reasonably close. But there are differences and you need to be able to compromise and work together. We have done that. We have done that and we have worked hard to make this a better state. So I'm going to finish my comments on this uh, reply to the budget. I'm going to say to uh, all this in this House and all members of uh, parties, good luck in the election and um, we'll be ready. Uh, we weren't ready last time, we are ready this time. Thank you. The Honourable Nick Grant. <clears throat> Thank you Mr Acting President. I rise to speak on this cognate debate with respect to the appropriations recurrent 2021 Bill of 2020 and the appropriation capital 2021 Bill of 2020. Uh, now, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Acting President, it is the case that within the appropriations for this year, once again, there has been an appropriation made, quite rightly, for the work of the Chief Health Officer. And uh, for those uh, stakeholders and members of Western Australia who are unaware, it is the ordinary custom and practice of the Legislative Council for 
members to take note of the budget papers which are tabled in this place at the same time as the budget bill is read in in the other place and uh, thereafter for these appropriation bills to be considered when the bills have arrived in this place. And often it is the case, Mr Acting President, that in the interim period, the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations facilitate a process which enables members to attend hearings with certain agencies that are found within the budget papers and to ask questions. I have been on the record in previous uh, in previous years and indeed previous parliaments to say that I, I think uh, we regrettably with our process uh, miss something in this place which is available in the process that is undertaken by the other place insofar as we do not have the opportunity to ask questions of all of the agencies that appear in the budget papers but only with respect to a select group. Now that said Mr Acting President one of the groups that was brought in during the estimates process uh, last week was WA Health. And in particular, one of the witnesses was the Chief Health Officer, whose office receives a proportion of the recurrent funding uh, paid by the taxpayer of Western Australia. Now, I find, Mr Acting President, the estimates process invaluable, invaluable, and this year is no exception. <coughs> and I draw to members' attention some stunning revelations that took place last week on the 17th of November. But by way of background, Mr Acting President, I remind members that as recently as Wednesday the 4th of November this year, the Legislative Council made an order in the following terms. That the Honourable Sue Ellery, Leader of the Government and the Legislative Council, be ordered and is hereby so ordered to lay on the table of the House not later than seven days from the day on which this order is made, on behalf of the Government of Western Australia, the information and documents described below, and that such documents be tabled without excision, alteration or defacement. Copies of all, all communications between the 13th of October 2020 and the 20th of October 2020, inclusive including, but not limited to, letters, emails, telephone notes, text messages and file notes received by any of the following relating to advice or information on COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. One, the Premier, Honourable Mark McGowan, MLA, Two, any staff member of the office of the Premier, including contract, temporary or seconded staff. Three, the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, MLA. Four, any staff member of the office of the Minister for Health, or including contract, temporary or seconded staff. Five, the Chief Health Officer, Dr Andrew Robertson. And six, any staff of the office of the Chief Health Officer, including contract, temporary or seconded staff. Now, again, by way of background, Mr Acting President, it's important to note that the motion was agreed to as amended, including being narrowed in scope because of the protestations of the Leader of the House. Ironically, the Hansard record reflects the fact that the government opposed the amendment that I moved to narrow the scope, we had the unedifying spectacle of the government protesting about how wide the scope of the motion was, and when I moved to then narrow it, the government then opposed that. Quite stunning. Nevertheless, the majority, the vast majority of members of this place agreed to the motion as amended, that being 
an order by this place, a lawful order of the Legislative Council to the government's most senior member asking that certain documents be tabled within seven days. Now that's the background, Mr Acting uh, President. And seven days later, the Honourable Sue Ellery, the leader of the government in this place, made a statement and tabled some documents. And the Leader of the House's statement uh, on the 11th of November, uh, which uh, in typed form is almost two pages in length, length includes the following introductory remarks, saying, further to the motion agreed to by the House on the 4th of November, ordering me to table various documents, I now table the following documents. These documents include all the advice received by the Chief Health Officer and his staff within the dates stipulated, with the exception of Cabinet and Confidence documents, duplications and documents prepared for National Cabinet and then goes on to make various other points and uh, effectively further protestations about the scope, the scope of the motion and the order, despite the fact that the government actually opposed the narrowing of the scope. Now that said, Mr Acting President, we then move to the 17th of November. So we had an order of the Legislative Council. Now again, for the people of Western Australia and those who are not keen observers of politics and our democratic system, it is important for us to underscore the fact that an order of the Legislative Council has the same significance and gravity as an order of a court of Western Australia. And it is my contention, Mr Acting President, that if the Honourable Sue Ellery was to receive an order from the Supreme Court of Western Australia, her heart rate would increase. And quite rightly so, as it would for any other reasonable Western Australian, because receiving an order of a court is a serious matter and it needs to be treated with the correct amount of respect and it needs to be complied with. That same level of seriousness applies with respect to an order from the Legislative Council. It is fundamentally incorrect for anyone to think that an order of the Legislative Council is somehow lesser in significance than an order of the court. That is how serious an order is from this place. It's not an option to decide whether you want to comply with it or not. You're under a lawful obligation to comply with the order. That's the context. Now, as I say, Mr Acting President, the motion that was moved by my good friend, the Honourable Peter Collier, the Leader of the Opposition, as amended by the House, required, in fact, ordered the Leader of the House to provide certain documents, including all of the communications between the Chief Health Officer and the Office of the Premier and the Office of the Minister for Health, all of the communications. And it even specifies, without necessarily limiting the scope of those communications, things like telephone, telephone notes. In fact, the actual phrase is telephone notes and goes on to talk about file notes and the like. Very specific. Anyone who is able to read the order and I know that the Leader of the House has a great enthusiasm for reading and encourages all members of this place to read documents. Anyone who is capable of reading need only understand two words, telephone notes. Now, what happened on the 17th of November last week, Mr, uh, uh, Mr Acting President, in fact, today is the one-week anniversary of these stunning revelations was that in the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations, they had requested the attendance of WA Health. There were various WA Health officers, in fact, in this chamber. I was also one of the members present, and one of the members who was present as a witness was the Chief Health Officer. Ironically, Mr Acting President, he was sitting in the very chair that is ordinarily occupied by the Leader of the House. 
Now, what transpired on that day uh, can be found in the uncorrected copy, uncorrected proof uh, of that hearing, session number three on the 17th of November uh, 2020. Now, one of the various questions that I asked Mr Acting President was this. Why was no communication tabled between the Premier and the Chief Health Officer for the period 13th of October to the 20th of October? Now, there is then a interim response from the Honourable Alana Clossy, who was representing the government at that time. Uh, I will say this with respect to the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, and the record reflects this. At least the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary made some efforts during the course of the hearing to take advice and guidance from the expert witnesses that were surrounding her. And I compare and contrast that to the approach that is reflected in the record whenever the Leader of the House was in the estimate sessions last week where the Leader of the House took the complete opposite approach. Indeed, in my opinion, a very obstructive approach to the work of the committee. In contrast to the Parliamentary Secretary, who at least sought to get guidance from those members, the Leader of the House's approach is to explicitly not seek the advice and allow those other witnesses to provide evidence. That in itself is a conversation for another day, Mr Acting President, and it is a flaw in our system where a Minister of the Crown can block and obstruct the work of the Estimates Committee by simply refusing, refusing to allow another witness to provide evidence. And worse still than to, to uh, constructively refuse to answer the question themselves. Nevertheless, in, with all due respect, uh, to the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, she did make reasonable efforts to uh, invite the Chief Health, Health Officer to provide a response, and quite rightly so, and to her credit. Now, he goes on during the hearing, in response to my uh, questions, to say as follows. Through the Parliamentary Secretary, over that period, yes, there would have been a number of meetings that I attended with the Premier and provided updates at those meetings. Having seen this question being raised previously, I did not receive any correspondence from the Premier during that period, but there would have been meetings as I have outlined. So I then asked, so no correspondence between the Premier and the Chief Health Officer between the period 13th of October and the 20th of October? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary provided an interim response, and then we went to the Chief Health Officer who said, through the Parliamentary Secretary, we have looked at what emails have been received during that period. I believe they have come to the Legislative Council, but we have not been asked what correspondence I may have provided to the Premier or the Minister during that period. I then said, so you have only been asked to provide the emails that you received during that period of time, you have not been asked to provide correspondence that you have provided to the Premier during that time. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary says, I cannot actually recall the substance of the motion. I'll pause there for a moment, Mr uh, Acting President, to simply remark, I find it odd that the senior member of the, uh, the government cannot recall the substance of the motion, given how s significant it was. It is exceptionally rare for the Legislative Council to order the government to provide documents of, the, of this sort, and yet a senior member is saying they cannot actually recall the substance of the motion. Nevertheless, the Parliamentary Secretary goes on and says, and therefore the substance of what information was provided, because the information that was provided was a substantial amount. Now, I'll just pause again there, Mr Acting President, to say that uh, I have in my possession the documents that the Parliamentary Secretary refers to as a substantial amount. It's anything but a substantial amount. Uh, but nevertheless, that's a, oh, a subjective uh, opinion in contrast to her own. I go on to note that she then says, the Par Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, let me see whether we have anything about that. We do not have the information with us, so we cannot give an accurate and reliable answer. 
I said, Parliamentary Secretary, I think the Chief Health Officer knows what he has been asked and what he has not been asked. I am just clarifying the evidence that he has just provided to the committee. I understood him to indicate that he had provided documentation, being emails that had been received by his office during the period 13th of October to the 20th of October. That is not in dispute. The question I have is, has he been asked to provide communications, correspondence, emails that he provided to the Premier's office during that period of time? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary did the right thing and asked the Chief Health Officer to respond. And he said, through the Parliamentary Secretary, I am not aware of being asked for that. As far as I am aware, the request was for information that I had received from the Premier and other parties, not for information I may have provided to those parties. Now, Mr Acting President, the Leader of the House, in her protestations to the motion that was moved by the Hon. Peter Collier, consistently tried to attack the opposition by saying that we were somehow impugning the integrity of the Chief Health Officer. And as the Honourable Peter Collier said on that, uh, on that day, that was absolutely not the case. Not the case. But for the purposes of this exercise, let us join, let us all join with the Leader of the House in being absolutely clear that the integrity of the Chief Health Officer cannot be impugned. Therefore, the evidence that is provided to the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations must be correct. The Chief Health Officer has obviously not lied on the 17th of November 2020. We will simply apply the standard that the Leader of the House requires us to, to comply with. That is that the integrity of the Chief Health Officer must never be uh, brought into doubt. We agree with you, Leader of the House. Therefore, the evidence on the 17th of November 2020 stands. And that means that you, Leader of the House, despite the fact you are under a lawful order, have failed to seek the information from the Chief Health Officer despite what the Legislative Council ordered you to do. Can't be both ways, Mr Acting President. Either the Chief Health Officer is a liar, and we, the Opposition, say that that is not in doubt. We absolutely support the evidence that he has provided and have every confidence that every word that he has uttered is correct. The alternative is that the Leader of the House has fundamentally breached the order of the Legislative Council. And I'd like the Leader of the House to provide an explanation. No point of having the title of the Leader of the House when you thumb your nose at an order made by the House. Now, it gets worse, Mr Acting President, because later in the hearings I asked, can the witness indicate whether there was any verbal communications between him and the Premier in that same period of time? Again, there's this little interchange and little verbal jousting and dance that took place between myself and the uh, Parliamentary Secretary, which members can read at another time, but ultimately it led to the Chief Health Officer saying this, as highlighted with the meetings during that period, there would have been discussions at those meetings. I would have to check the exact nature, exact details of what documents or advice I provided. I asked Chief Health Officer, is it normally your ordinary custom and practice to keep notes of conversations that you have had with the Premier of Western Australia? He says, through the Parliamentary Secretary, I generally keep notes of all conversations that I have. I said, are they kept in the form of a diary or some other manifest? He said, they are generally kept in the form of a diary. I said, and you have not been asked by the government to provide copies of those diary notes? He said, no, I have not. Now, Mr Acting President, I remind members that the order of the Legislative Council to the Leader of the House included very specifically telephone notes. The Chief Health Officer says that those telephone notes are contained in his diary. He says he hasn't been asked by the government. Whose responsibility is it in the government to ask him? Who? Somebody is responsible. The name of that person is the Honourable Sue Ellery. She's the Leader of the House. She's the person under the lawful obligation to comply with the order. Now, no doubt, no doubt, a senior minister with large responsibilities 
will have other people to assist them in facilitating their lawful obligations. But ultimately, the person with the responsibility for asking for this information is the Leader of the House. And the evidence from the Chief Health Officer is that that never happened. That that never happened. So, members, I ask you for a moment to consider Schedule 4 at the back of our standing orders, which, lead, which lists the criteria to be taken into account when determining whether matters, uh, determining matters relating to contempt. And it's under the heading contempts of the council. And in particular, example nine, which is listed as disobedience of orders. It reads, a person shall not, without reasonable excuse, disobey a lawful order of the council or of a committee. What is not in doubt, Mr Acting President, is that the Leader of the House has disobeyed an order of this place. That is not in doubt. Now, what might be available, what might be available to the Leader of the House is to argue a defence of reasonable excuse. I'd like somebody to explain to me, Mr Acting President, how it can be a reasonable excuse for the Leader of the House to fail to ask the Chief Health Officer for information. Never asked him. Never asked him. Either that or he's a liar. <coughs> and we know that the Leader of the House doesn't think that he's a liar. In fact, she says that his integrity um, is beyond reproach. I'm paraphrasing her, but that's how I understand that's uh, the Leader of the House's view, which is shared by the opposition. So he says he's never been asked for this information, that being the likes of telephone notes, that being the likes of information that he provided to the Premier's office, that being the like of information that he provided to the Minister for Health, never asked by the government. Now, is that the standard that members are prepared to accept? As I said earlier, Mr Acting President, if the Leader of the House or any other Western Australian receives an order of the court, let us use the Supreme Court as an example, they would be taking it very seriously. They would not be thumbing their nose at the authority of the Supreme Court. And that same standard applies with respect to the Legislative Council. It is utterly unacceptable for the Leader of the House, the most senior member of the McGowan government in this place, to disobey the order of the Legislative Council. And worse, worse without a reasonable excuse. What could possibly be the reasonable excuse for not asking the Chief Health Officer for the information? He says he's only been asked for a certain type of information, that being the information that he received during that period of time, not the information that he sent he was also not asked to provide copies of his telephone notes, which we now know are contained in his diary. Now, Mr Acting President, there's been an opportunity by the, for the Leader of the House to correct the record. Earlier today, just after two o'clock, as is our normal custom and practice, we, we, con we commenced with our formal business and there was an opportunity at that time for the Leader of the House to rise from her chair and correct the record and say, I am aware of what took place in estimates last week. I uh, apologise to the House for not providing all of the documents and I do so now. This happened a week ago, Mr Acting President. The, the House that ordered the Leader of the House to provide information within seven days, the Leader of the House didn't do it. And now, seven days ago, there's been further information that confirms that the Leader of the House has disobeyed the order. And seven days later, no change. No change with regard to the Leader of the House's attitude to the order. Quite happy, seemingly, to go along and continue to be in breach of an order of the Legislative Council. That's the standards of the McGowan government. No regard for the rule of law. Mr Acting President, the rule of law is a crucial, crucial principle in our Western democracy. 
It means that no person in Western Australia is above the law. That includes the member for Rockingham and that includes the Leader of the House. It doesn't matter if your surname is McGowan or Ellery or any other surname in Western Australia, you must comply with the law of the land. That's what the rule of law is about, Mr Acting President. However, these particular individuals, including the Leader of the House, seem to think that they are above the law. They can simply do as they like. A lawful order is made, they'll comply to the extent that they feel that they, they want to. When it is drawn to their attention that they are fundamentally in error, no change of attitude, the continuing arrogance, continuing to operate in that mode that we've talked about before with their love affair for Henry VIII, all of these powerful individuals over time in history that have thought themselves above the law. And here we have Premier McGowan and his most senior member in this chamber acting in exactly the same fashion. As far as they're concerned, who cares what the Legislative Council thinks? Who cares if they want documents to be tabled? We're not going to do it. We're going to run off into the recess and pretend that this never happened. That's the standards of this government. Can you imagine, members, if the Leader of the House was on this side of the chamber and somebody from the Conservative Party had done the same thing. The Leader of the House would lose her mind over that and we would be dealing with all kinds, all kinds of rhetoric, all kinds of rhetoric about that. But seemingly, seemingly this is acceptable. I served on a committee in the last parliament, Mr Acting President, with the Honourable Member, with the Honourable Leader of the House, when she at the time was the Leader of the Opposition. And I served on that inquiry because the Honourable Member raised a concern about information that had been provided during question time, which it was found subsequently was incorrect. What was the approach taken by the Barnett government at that time was to correct the record. And indeed, it was my friend, the Honourable Peter Collier, who without delay corrected the record and apologised to the House. Not that it was even his fault, but he took responsibility for it because he was the Leader of the House. That was the standard that was applied then. And quite rightly at the time, the Honourable Sue Ellery, who was in opposition, <coughs> railed against that. She was outraged. And so there was an inquiry by the Procedure and Privileges Committee, quite rightly and some unanimous findings and recommendations, and members can read that report if they choose to do so. That was the standard applied in the 39th Parliament. The standard in the 40th Parliament is that the Leader of the House can just do whatever she likes, don't worry about an order by the Legislative Council, don't worry about trying to get the information from the Chief Health Officer, from the Premier, from the, health of the, the Minister for Health. The Leader of the House will just do as she pleases and act as if she herself is Henry VIII. That's what's happening in the, in the 40th Parliament. That's the standards of the McGowan government. This is an absolute disgrace. And the fact that a whole week can go by and we can have had formal business today and there can be no correction to the record only adds to the disgrace. It's an utterly contemptuous attitude to the rule of law and a contemptuous attitude to the authority of the Legislative Council. Wouldn't matter to this particular administration. They're quite happy. They are quite happy to allow this kind of systemic, contemptuous attitude to continue to seep into the last few days of the 40th Parliament. What an absolute disgrace. I can only hope, Mr Acting President, that those members in the government who have a shred of integrity and decency and respect for this institution will ensure that this matter is remedied forthwith. They should be dropping everything 
Don't worry about Facebook and Twitter and media releases. I mean, for goodness sake, Mr Acting President, earlier today... Now, remember, this whole matter is dealing with important matters of health and the Chief Health Officer. We've got the Minister for Health putting out press releases celebrating the fifth birthday of St John of God Midland Public Hospital. That's the priorities of the McGowan government. We're going to send a birthday card for the fifth birthday of St John of God Midland Public Hospital. This is a thank you card to the last government. <laughs> Announcement now, I wonder, Mr Acting President, this two-page media release that was issued today by the Minister for Health with his various comments that can be attri attributed to him, I wonder if any of his staff, instead of pushing this stuff out, could actually pick up the phone and talk to the Chief Health Officer and his staff and say, let's get this matter right. There was information that went in between our officers over that seven-day period, and our most senior member is under lawful compulsion to provide it. Let's get this moving. Now, remember, members, one of the defences that were put up by the Honourable Sue Ellery was to say that the scope was still too, too big, even after it had been limited, and it would take too long to deal with these matters. Well, obviously, you've got a lot of time on your hands, Leader of the House, you and your government, because you've got time to be putting out birthday cards to St John of God Midland Public Hospital. Now, that is not a priority. I've got no problem, I've got no problem with you recognising the achievements of St John of God Midland Public Hospital. I've got no problem with you doing that. But as a priority of your government on this day, the 24th of November, that's your priority in health, to send a birthday card. Wouldn't it be a greater priority to actually comply with a lawful order of the Legislative Council? Might that not be a, a, a matter of greater significance? Well, it would be if you're a reasonable Western Australian, not if you're an arrogant Western Australian, not if you're a person who thinks that you're above the law, who continues to hold the rule of law, the Legislative Council, in contempt. That's the record of this government. They must be so proud of the standards that they have set. This was the government that said prior to the last election, vote for us because if you vote for us, we guarantee that there's going to be a gold standard of transparency. What rubbish. We've seen the exact opposite over the last four years. The exact opposite. You call that gold standard of transparency I call that a lie to Western Australians. You obviously had no intention whatsoever over this 40th parliament to, to adhere to any reasonable standard of transparency. Please don't even try and tell us that you are trying your best to adhere to a gold standard. Now, a gold standard, Mr Acting President, is yet again a subjective standard. And reasonable people could have a difference of opinion as to what exactly is meant by gold standard. But no person, no reasonable person can seriously suggest that the Leader of the House continuing to hide documents from the Legislative Council, despite being under lawful order, is anything near a gold standard of transparency. It's the opposite of transparency. The Leader of the House hides these documents under lock and key, under, in some kind of safe somewhere, presumably, metaphorically speaking. But, Mr Acting President, instead of picking up the phone and talking to the Chief Health Officer who, who receives an ongoing appropriate appropriation from the government for his work and that of his staff, Instead of doing that, no, the government's priority is to send out birthday cards to a hospital. That's the priority of this government. Now, Mr Acting President, I, as I say, I hope that those members with a shred of decency and integrity in this government will remedy this by the end of the week. Now, I re very much regret that there is limited time in this debate because there are a number, a number of other health-related matters that I want to draw to members' attention, which frankly have far greater 
priority than birthday cards to hospitals. Now, I could talk to members about the uh, world record-breaking performance by this government in terms of ambulance ramping, but I don't have time for that. What I do want to talk about is the information that is now contained in this report entitled Palliative Care in Western Australia Progress Report, subtitled Final Report of the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia, which Madam President tabled at the start of today's proceedings. And in particular, I want to draw to members' attention finding 33. Now, this particular report, Mr Acting President, which I encourage members to read, has 56 findings and 25 recommendations, but finding 33 serves its purpose at this particular moment in time. It reads, the committee was not provided, was not provided with unredacted information to enable it to assess the progress of implementation of recommendation eight of the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices that the Minister for Health ensure that community palliative care providers such as Silver Chain are adequately funded to provide for growing demand. Now, I'd encourage members to read the background of that particular finding. Yet again, the McGowan government continue with their obsession with secrecy. A parliamentary committee asks for information and it was not provided with unredacted information. Now, some members might quite reasonably say, well, it might be appropriate for the government to redact that information. Paragraph 5.54, page 114 of this report reads as follows. The committee requested and received from the Department of Health a copy of its current contract with Silver Chain. Despite providing a copy of advice from the State Solicitor's Office that the Department was able to disclose to the committee the pricing of the palliative care service under the contract. All pricing information was redacted in the documents provided to the committee. So there you go, members. That's the standard of the McGowan government. A parliamentary committee asks for information. The government gets advice from the State Solicitor's Office. The SSO says, you can provide this information. What does the McGowan government decide to do? Hide it. Of course they did. Uh, the parliamentary committees in, in future, if you're going to ask any uh, further questions of the McGowan government in the remaining few days of the 40th parliament, just assume you're not going to get the information. There's no point of asking this government for anything. They hate transparency. When they say that they want to adhere to a gold standard of transparency, it is a lie. They have absolutely no intention of doing it. They've never demonstrated it at any point during this 40th parliament. They love to hide information. The State Solicitor's Office says, you can provide it, and they say, too bad, we're not going to. We're going to continue to hide the information as long as possible. That's the standards of the McGowan government. One example after another. A contemptuous attitude to an order of the Legislative Council, a contemptuous attitude to the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia, how many more examples could we come up with in this 40th parliament if we had more time? One thing after another. It's staggering, Madam President. Now, I also want to quickly draw to members' attention finding uh, 47. Finding 47 in this report reads, notwithstanding the government's announcement that $5 million of its five-year $41 million commitment for end-of-life choices and palliative care would be spent on the Carnarvon Aged and Palliative Care Facility, it will result in two multi-purpose rooms within the facility being flex flexibly allocated to palliative care. It is unbelievable, Madam President, that the McGowan government were previously beating their chest about a $5 million announcement for Carnarvon and palliative care only for under inquiry by the Joint Select Committee for us to find out that the $5 million means two multi-purpose rooms which can be flexibly used for palliative care. What a disgrace to mislead the people of Carnarvon, to mislead the people of Western Australia, to boast that somehow you're the heroes of palliative care, you're going to give $5 million, in my view, to buy a few votes in the VAD debate, and now to be found out that, well, actually, the $5 million doesn't mean too much. It's two multi-purpose rooms. 
That's the standards of the McGowan government. It's an absolute disgrace, Madam President. I conclude by simply saying I do hope once again that the members in the Cabinet who have a shred of decency will fix this situation. You've got a few days left to at least adhere to some kind of standard of transparency. And I just call on you to do that forthwith. Members, I'm going to interrupt the debate now for the taking of questions. Are there any questions today? Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My uh, question without notice is to the Leader of the House, and I have given the Leader of the House a copy of this question. Uh, I refer to your statement to the House on the 11th of November tabling documents in relation to the order determined by the Legislative Council. And I ask, one, are you aware that on the 17th of November 2020, the Chief Health, Chief Health Officer informed the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations that, quote, the request was uh, that, that, that the request was for information that I had received from the Premier and other parties, not for information I may have provided to those parties. Two, are you aware that the Chief Health Officer also advised that he keeps notes of all conversations that he has with the Premier, uh, quote, in the form of a diary, and yet he was not asked by the government to provide copies of those diary notes? Three, can you confirm that you did not ask for these documents prior to giving your statement on the 11th of November? And four, would you undertake to table these missing documents at the commencement of tomorrow's sitting? If not, why not? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. And I do thank the Honourable Member for just giving me a copy of uh, the question just prior to this. Um, look, parts one and two of the question um, refer to quotes. They're in quotation marks and they're in italics. I'm not sure what they're quotes from. I haven't seen. You may well be telling me that, but. Order, order. Member, the Minister is trying to provide a response. She might be guided by the person who actually asked the question, not by others, if she's seeking that. Assistance. Uh, so, if the question is, have I read those words in the Hansard uncorrected record or whatever it is of uh, the Estimates Committee last week, the answer is no, I haven't. The, um, I, I just asked the clerk to provide me with a copy of the uh, motion passed by the House, and I've got a copy of the letter sent to me by the President on the 5th of November. And if I assume that the quote in part one that says the Chief Health Officer told the committee um, the request was for information I had received, not for information I may have provided. That is what this motion says. And I'm not sure how you could draw the conclusion that the notes that the Chief Health Officer wrote in a diary of a conversation he had constitutes something that he received. I'm not sure how you draw that conclusion, but in any event, I will check if I can get access to those quotes, I'm happy to check them. Third, can you confirm that you did not ask for these documents prior to your statement? So I think people need to understand the Chief Health Officer doesn't report to me. Um, he is an independent statutory body uh, officer, but um, his dealings are with the Premier and the Minister for Health, and that's who uh, I requested uh, information for or passed on the, the order that I had been uh, uh, that was made by the House, and I can't give you an undertaking uh, to undertake um, these missing documents. I don't know that any documents are missing. I don't know the hand side that you're referring to. I'll take your question uh, and I'll give it consideration, but I'm, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to help you uh, much further than the Chief Health Officer was. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, but some notice is given, is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. Uh, oh, sorry, it's the minister. Sorry, it's not actually the leader of the house. I think this was uh, relocated to the minister for police. I, I, I've just got the title wrong. Uh, I refer to the youth, uh, cri youth crime intervention officers who are located in the southwest region, based in Bunbury, and ask for the 2019-20 year. How many of the four officers allocated to the region are actually undertaking duties specific to their roles? Two. How many jobs did the uh, YCIOs attend in uh, Busselton? Three, how many days did the YCIO spend in Busselton? Three, what are the names and durations of any programs undertaken by the YCIOs in Busselton? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australia Police Force advised that due to the coordination of the major event, Leavers WA 2020, this question cannot be responded to within the time frame. A response will be provided prior to the Parliament rising. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. 
and I refer to evidence regarding the operations of Lottery West taken in the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations on 19 November 2020 and ask one, what is the risk assessment applied to applications for grants that may otherwise have merit? Two, precisely what are the criteria against which Lottery West, West assesses risk? Three, if harm is one of those criteria, how is that harm assessed and against what objective standard? And four, is a detailed assessment of harm recorded to ensure transparency, accountability and consistency on the part of the Lottery West Board? And if so, how? And if not, why not? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I do thank the honourable member for some notice of question. I, I was advised that you were advised uh, that the Premier wasn't available to answer questions today, but um, so I don't have an answer today. However, he has given an undertaking to provide a response tomorrow. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the Instrumental Music School Services and I ask, one, what was the total amount of funding allocated to this service in the 2018, 2019 and 2020 school years? Two, how many students have participated in, in the instrumental music program in the years referred to in one? Three, will the minister list the schools currently participating in the program? And four, is there capacity within the existing funding arrangements to expand the service to include more schools? And if so, how many? Of the house. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Um, one, funding for instrumental music school services are allocated on a financial year basis, and the um, answer for each of those years is in tabular form, so I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, Madam President. Two, um, the number of students per calendar year is also provided uh, in tabular form, so I seek leave to have that. Uh, incorporate into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you. And this is a pattern. The information requested of, in three is a list of over 450 schools. That's in tabular form, so I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, Madam President. And four, the current funding allocation is fully allocated to supporting the arrangements in existing schools. The Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to my estimates question prior to hearing number five regarding caseloads that were over the allowable threshold of 18 between July 2019 and June 2020. And I ask one, how many cases did the caseworker with the highest number of cases have during that reporting period? Two, further to one, for that caseload, how many total children were included in that caseload? And three, how many cases does the caseworker with the highest highest number of cases have today. Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, between July 2019 and June 2020, the caseworker with the highest number of cases was 11 cases for a 0.5 FTE, a pro rata caseload of 22 cases. This caseworker was included in the caseloads uh, over 18 data provided due to this pro rata application. Two, workload management reporting is a point-in-time data report produced at the beginning of every month and does not contain details regarding individual case allocation. Uh, three, the most recent data caseload reporting data available is at 2nd of October 2020, and the highest caseload in that report was five cases for a 0.24 FTE, a pro rata caseload of approximately 20 cases. Honourable Jackie Bordell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I indicate I also have a question for uh, the Honourable Martin Aldridge, who is absent on urgent parliamentary business today. Um, so my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the dilapidated and extremely dangerous site of the old Wickham District High School, which is becoming a hotspot for antisocial behaviour amongst local youths. And I ask one. Is the minister aware of the current state of the buildings? Two, is the minister aware of any asbestos present in the buildings? And three, does the government plan to demolish the buildings in order to remove the danger to the local community? And if yes, could you please detail that? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Um, one to three, the Department of Education has visited the site twice this financial year, including earlier this month. Uh, the department is working with the city of Karafa to find a practical solution. As with most buildings of a certain age, asbestos will be present. The buildings are being secured and made safe. The former site is surplus to the Department of Education's requirements and it has been referred 
to the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage to determine the best use for the site. Demolition will be considered as part of this process. The Honourable Jackie Bordell. Thank you, Madam President. So, on behalf of the Honourable Martin Aldridge, who is absent on urgent parliamentary business, I ask this question to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the West Australian Police Force and I ask one, what is the current authorised strength in regional WA? Two, what is the current actual strength in regional WA? Three, how many vacancies for sworn officer positions by FTE are there in regional WA as of today? And four, is there a policy directive or similar in place preventing police officer vacancies from being backfilled to support the COVID-19 response functions of WA Police. Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. Uh, the answer is not available to be provided in the time available. A response will, will be provided prior to Parliament rising. Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. My question of which some notice is given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. Tamil Last Station, which has approximately 6,000 visitors per annum, has had their request for a new camping licence declined and it will remain closed for camping until further notice. Station managers have been advised they need another Indigenous land use agreement that specifically includes the camping area before any application will be considered. Given the Western Australian Government is promoting holidaying in our own state during the COVID-19 pandemic, I ask one, what was the catalyst for Tamalar Station's Indigenous land use agreement to be terminated? Two, what is the estimated time frame for Tamalar Station to gain a camping licence and reopen? And three, can the Indigenous land use agreement proceed, uh, process be expedited? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. One, the camping area operated under the provision of a licence issued by the state over unallocated Crown land adjoining the Tamala pasture lease. There was no Indigenous land use agreement or ELUA associated with this camping area. On the 4th of December 2018, a native title determination encompassing the area was made by the Federal Court of Australia. The licence terminated upon the determination of native title. Two, the campsite would only be able to reopen once the pastoral lessee and native title holders have reached an Indigenous land use agreement and appropriate tenure has been granted. Three, this is entirely dependent on the pastoral lessee and the native title holders. There are no statutory limits on the time necessary to conclude Illiwa negotiation. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Mental Health. I refer to the Education and Health Standing Committee report, The Impact of FIFO Work Practices on Mental Health, Recommendation 21, regarding the development of a mental health and suicide prevention training program, and I ask, one, has the program been developed? Two, if yes to one, is it being delivered? Three, if no to one or two, why not? Four, if yes to two, who is delivering the program and which FIFO mining companies have utilised the training? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. Uh, thanks, Madam President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, yes, the Mental Health Commission, MHC, contributed funding to Curtin University's Future of Work Institute uh, to develop Thrive at Work, an evidence-based strategy to support Western Australian workforce to create mentally healthy workplaces. Thrive was developed in consultation with industry and an extensive evaluation of the academic literature. The foundational funding provided by the Mental Health Commission assisted to build capacity for the Future of Work Institute to run training as part of the Thrive initiative, which included training on mental health and managing mental health problems among colleagues and workers. The training is suitable for managers and supervisors, and while not specific to the resources industry, the content is applicable across industries. Two, yes, three, not applicable. Four, A, Curtin University's Future of Work Institute, for B, Rio Tinto BHP Billiton, Barminko GBF, Roy Hill Woodside. Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to plans to upgrade the terminal of the Laverton Airport accommodating the increasing demand on the airport, which supports the community and surrounding industries. I ask, one, is the state government supportive of the proposal to upgrade the airport terminal? Two, if no to question one, why not? Three, if yes to question one, will the government set aside funding in the state budget to contribute to the upgrade of the terminal? And four, will the government commit to supporting the terminal upgrade ahead of the 2021 state election? 
Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Transport. One to four. The Department of Transport and Shire of Laverton are currently working together to develop a Laverton Airport strategic airport assets and financial management framework. The framework will allow the Department of oh, sorry, the framework will allow the Department of Transport to investigate the benefits and costs of an upgraded Laverton Airport terminal and consider the contributions the various users of the terminal, particularly the mining industry, could make towards this project. Over the past five years, more than $600,000 has been allocated towards upgrades at Laverton Airport through the Regional Airports Development Scheme. The Honourable Charles Smith. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is directed towards the uh, Minister rep representing the Treasurer. I refer to the New South Wales Treasurer signalling a stamp duty land tax switch, and I ask one. What was the total residential stamp duty receipts in 2019? Two. What was the total residential stamp duty receipts in 2018? And three, does the Treasury concede residential stamp duty is an inefficient state tax? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Finance. One, uh, existing reports that separate residential transfer duty collections from other transfer duty amounts are produced and verified for financial years only. In the time frame provided, it is not possible to reconfigure and verify Revenue WA's reporting functionality to provide calendar year figures. Two, see answer to question one. Three, stamp duty is an important source of revenue for state government, which indirectly supports a range of public services and infrastructure. The Honourable Tim Clifford. Thank you, Madam President. My question about notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister, uh, the Minister for the Environment. I refer to Chevron's Gorgon Gas ca capture, Carbon Capture and Storage System on Barrow Island and Chevron's failure to adequately begin sequestering carbon from when operations commenced in July 2016. And I ask one, since the, since the condition 26.2 of Ministerial Statement 800 was amended, how many tonnes of CO2 has been injected into Barrow Island? Two, since the amendment of condition 26.2 of Ministerial Statement 800, how many times has the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation reviewed compliance? And three, is the Minister confident Chevron will meet the reservoir carbon injection target of at least 80%? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, in Chevron's most recent five-year environmental performance report, 2015 to 2020, for the proposal dated 28, sorry, 27 October 2020, Chevron has reported 2,707,092 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent as being injected. This information is publicly available on the Chevron on Chevron's website, and I table a copy of the report. Two to three, uh, in accordance with condition 26.2 of Ministerial Statement 800, the injection of carbon dioxide is calculated on a five-year rolling average commencing on 18 July 2016. The first five-year average, averaging period will be reached on 18 July 2021, which is when compliance with the condition can be determined. If the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation finds that Condition 26.2 has not been complied with, the CEO may exercise any power in respect of the non-compliance that is exercisable under a written law and reported to me as Minister for Environment. And that document is tabled. The Honourable Colin Holt. Thank you, Madam President. My question of which some notice has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Finance. I refer to an application under the market-led proposal program from the Bustle and Jetty for the Australian Underwater Discovery Centre, and I ask one, what is the current status of the application? Two, when can the proponent expect a decision to be made on the application? And three, is the Minister aware that a federal government commitment of $13 million to this project made two, two years ago will likely be lost if the Bustle and Jetty do not receive matching funding from the State Government for before the end of the year. Does this concern the Minister? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Finance. One to three. The proposal is under evaluation within the market-led proposal, or MLC, MLP, process. As per the terms of the MLP policy, the Minister for Finance is not in a position to disclose information on that particular process. The independent chairperson of the MLP steering committee will advise the proponent when a decision on the proposal is confirmed. Honourable Simon O'Brien. Uh, Madam President, I have a question uh, without notice to the Minister for Electoral Affairs, and um, I refer to his correspondence to uh, stakeholders outlining uh, and seeking consultation about a possible uh, plastic election bunting ban uh, given in, uh, in October. And uh, I ask, uh, one, is the government aware that, with consultation only recently commenced, 
small, local small businesses have already purchased significant quantities of stock in preparation for the election and face financial loss if bans are implemented uh, for this upcoming state election. Uh, and two, when will this matter be decided and the public informed? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank Honourable Simon O'Brien for the question. Um, as he is correct, uh, I have consulted with the various political parties registered in Western Australia in relation to this issue, uh, and a number of the political parties have written back to me with their, with their views. Um, the intention uh, is to impose a ban on soft plastic bunting uh, at polling places. Uh, I'm, so I'm not aware of specific small businesses that have been affected by this. I have had a letter back from uh, Sam Calabresi, the State Director of the Liberal Party, uh, but can I say I am uh, considering this matter currently. Uh, I am mindful of the need uh, for political parties to have time uh, to, to prepare for the upcoming election, and so I intend to provide advice on this matter very soon. The Honourable Robin Chapel, you don't get a second. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given. Uh, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the other heritage site, ID 24950, the Sisters, lodged with the department by me, uh, the Kalamazoo Resources Project, uh, and to the small caps article, Kalamazoo Resources gears up to drill the Sisters near de Grey's Hemi Gold Discovery. And I ask, in the department's view, what are the heritage values of the area? Two, is the minister aware of the surface artefact scatters in the immediate vicinity of the sisters? If no to two, why not, given that I submitted that information to the department? Has a section 18 been granted to the proponents to disturb or impact cultural heritage at that site? And given the mounting public pressure, will the department take action against this destruction of First Nations heritage? Minister for the Environment. President, and I thank the honourable member for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. One, Aboriginal Heritage Place ID 24950, the sisters, is reported as having engravings, water source and a camp with a potential date of 4,000 years. Two to three, no. Uh, as the honourable member is aware, heritage information is submitted to the Registrar of Aboriginal Sites as required by the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972, or the Act. A process is then undertaken by the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage and the Aboriginal Cultural Material Committee to determine whether a place is an Aboriginal site within the meaning of the Act. Four, no. Five, under the Act, proponents are required to seek approval to use the land where Aboriginal sites may be impacted. Anyone who has concerns that there may, be, there may have been a breach of the Act is encouraged to report their concerns to the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. Thank you, Madam President. My uh, question without notice, with some notice, has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Planning. I refer to the proposed My Homes Develop in Devon Street, Woodbridge, and ask, one, has the government undertaken any special arrangements with the My Home proponents that allows a piece of land previously deemed unsuitable for development to be utilised for this project? Two, why has the piece of public open space with zone Swan River Trust and Parks and Recreation been given their planned approval and selected as the site for this proposal? And three, how many have the Western Australian Housing First Approach principle been considered and applied, and how are they, they evident in this proposal? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Planning. One, no. Two to three, the land concerned is not within the Swan River Trust Development Control Area, and a development application is still to be determined. The Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Fire and Emergency Services. I refer to the bushfire in the Stirling Ranges, which started on the 26th of December 2019, and I ask one. Will the Minister please table a, a report on the control of the fires, including any timetable of events, b, detail regarding the time of the initial report of the fire, the initial activities to control the fire, and the time at which the Department of Fire and Emergency Services became involved in the suppression of the fire, c, the cost of the response, and d, the total cost of the fire estimated, if not known. Two, if no, why not? 
Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. One uh, A, a report on the control of the fires during Western Australia's 2019-20 uh, high threat period, including a timetable of events, is currently underway as part of a comprehensive remote firefighting after-action review to examine the incidents of the season. The Stirling Ranges fire, which started on 26 December 2019, will be included in this review. The report is being compiled in partnership with the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Uh, B2C, uh, DFES does not perform activity-based costing per incident. However, additional costs incurred above DFES's base budget for major incidents are recorded by hazard types such as bushfire. Given this, readily identifiable costs to date for the Stirling Ranges over and above DFES's base budget are provided below. Madam President, uh, this information is in tabular form. It lists the account category, the amounts, the total, the total uh, DBCA cost and the total cost. I ask this be incorporated into Hansard. Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, Minister. Madam President. And the answer to two was not applicable. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Thank you, Madam President. My, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Health. Uh, one, has the contract for the Emergency Department Medical Director for the South West under the WA Country Health Service been advertised, renewed or cancelled in the last six months? Two, if no to one, when does the current contract expire and when will it be filled? Three, have any of the contracts for all the residential medical officers under the WA Country Health Service been advertised, awarded or extended in the last six months? Four, if no to three, when do the current contracts expire and when will they be filled? And five, what action has the government taken to ensure these positions are filled and maintained? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, 9th of October 2021. Three, yes, a number of residential medical officers, resident medical officers' contracts have been advertised, awarded and or extended in the last six months. Four, not applicable. Five, recruitment for resident medical officers, RMOs, within the WA Country Health Service is undertaken annually via the centralised recruitment process coordinated by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer, Department of Health. WAX liaises with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer regarding its annual requirements. WAX monitors regional vacancies that may arise outside of the annual process due to the resignations or new position creations and appoints to these positions via the centralised recruitment pool maintained by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. Honourable Yorn Sibma. Much, Madam President. Yeah. Very much indeed. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been uh, provided, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Planning, C1332. And I refer to the draft Swan Valley Plan Scheme, or the scheme that was published for public comment from 14 October until 14 November 2020. And I ask one, has the Minister approved the scheme, and if yes, on what date? Two, if no to one above, will any amendments be made to the scheme which arise from comments received during the public consultation phase? Three, if applicable, what specific amendments will be recommended for her approval? And four, if the Minister has not yet approved the scheme, when is she likely to do so? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. One, no. Two to three, the public consultation period recently closed with submissions to now be considered. Uh, four, the scheme will be considered upon successful package successful passage of the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020 through both houses. The Leader of the Opposition. Madam President, <clears throat> my question without notice, which some has given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Transport. Uh, I refer to the additional cost uh, or interest charge of quarterly payments for vehicle licensing registration in WA and ask, one, uh, what is the average uh, cost applied to vehicle registrations for motorists who choose to pay quarterly accounts rather than an upfront yearly uh, payment? Two, how is this rate calculated and uh, is it cost reflective? Three, over the past 12 months, how many motorists have paid, uh, paid vehicle registrations quarterly? And four, over the past 12 months, how many seniors cardholders or pensioners have paid their vehicle registrations quarterly? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition for some notes of the question. One, as per the Department of Transport website, the Light Vehicle Standard Administration recording fee is $10.30 per transaction. Two, the, re the rate is cost reflective and has decreased by 15 per cent since 2017 18. Three, 638,053, and four, 66,399. Honourable Alison Zamon. 
Minister, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Racing and Gaming. I refer to the WA Racehorse Welfare Plan and to the Memorandum of Understanding between Racing and Wagering Western Australia and WA Registered Abattoirs and Knackeries, and I ask one, will the Minister please table a copy of the MOU? Two, if no to one, why not? Three, does the MOU include any provisions regarding independent monitoring or inspection? And four, if no to three, why not? Minister for Regional Development. Sorry, I have seen that member. I'm just right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one, uh, yeah. Sorry, I thank the member for the question. And the following information uh, has been provided uh, largely by the Minister for Racing and Gaming, with some additions by herself in relation to the last question. One, yes, I table the attached information. Two, not applicable. Three, no. Four, WA registered knackeries and abattoirs are regulated under the Department of Primary Industry and Regional Development. There is currently no registered abattoir in WA for horses, and there is only one registered knackery uh, with the Department of Primary Industry and Regional Development. In the case of a report of cruelty at an abattoir or knackery, the department's livestock compliance unit will investigate. That document's tabled. The Honourable Robin Scott. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House as Minister for Education. I refer to the recent comments made by the Education Department Director General Lisa Rogers on the ABC Kimberley Breakfast Radio regarding the violence and intimidation at Broome Senior High School. The Director General mentioned an alternative learning setting, and I quote, where the students who were the most challenging are now in an educational program that is working intensively with them and that's doing well. I ask, one, how many students are in this alternative learning setting? Two, what is their attendance rate? And three, when the Director General identified that the violence, quote, is a community issue, how long is this arrangement intended to last? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, eight students are engaged in the alternative learning setting. Two, as at and including the 24th of November 2020, combined attendance rate for the students attending the ALS over that period it has been operating is 53 per cent. The alternative learning setting engages some of the most challenging students, some of whom may not have been engaged in school or had low attendance prior to engaging with the ALS. Uh, three, engagement in the alternative learning setting must be managed on a case-by-case -case basis and students will continue to be engaged based on their individual need. Honourable Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Forestry. I refer to the Code of Practice for Timber Harvesting in Western Australia, March 1999, and I ask, one, has this document been updated or superseded? And two, if yes, please table the relevant documents. Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question, and the following information has been provided by the Minister for forestry. One, the Code of Practice for Timber Harvesting in Western Australia, March 1999, has been superseded by a range of documents that are, that are administered by several bodies, including the Forest Products Commission, the Department of Biosecurity, Conservation and Attractions, and the Forest Industries Federation, WA. Uh, two, if the honourable member will specify the areas of interest, I will, uh, will endeavour to provide the relevant documents. The honourable Robin Chappell. Uh, which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to question on notice 2462, uh, asked on the 17th of September 2019 uh, to the Minister for Environment concerning heavy metal pollution in Wim Creek and the Balabala river systems. And I ask, has the Department of Water and Environment Regulations concluded its investigation into the heavy metal pollution at Wim Creek? If no to one, uh, given over a year has passed, can the minister suggest when the investigation is to conclude? A three, if yes to one, what was the source of the contamination? Four, if yes to one, what compensation or indemnity is the government seeking in relation to three? And five, how will the area be rehabilitated? 
Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some knowledge of the question. One, the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, or DWA, has completed its investigation into the event concerning discharges into the Wim Creek and the Balabala River system. Two, not applicable. Three, DWA identified the Wim Creek Copper Project as the source. Four to five, in addition to the investigation, the Department issued an Environmental Protection Notice, or an EPN, to Venturex Pilbara Property Limited and Black Rock Metals Property Limited. The EPN requires the owner occupier to determine the extent of contamination. Once the extent of contamination is determined, they will require appropriate remedial actions, which will be at the cost of the owner occupier. Of the House. I ask that the House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers from any minister? The Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. Madam President, I'd like to provide the Honourable Nick Goran an answer to his question without notice. One, two, four, five, asked on the 10th of November, which I seek leave to have incorporated into Hansard. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into hand, so is leave granted. Aye. Oh, sorry, was that a no? That's Thanks, a no, Madam therefore President. you might read the answer sure. in, please. The answer is one, yes, all apartments purchased by the WA Government under the $319 million Social Housing Economic Recovery Package are being built under the National Construction Code 2016, NCC 2016, in compliance with current legislation and regulations. Two to three, the Building Amendment Regulations number 3, 2020, extend the ongoing transitional provisions in the Building Regulations 2012 that allow the use of the previous edition of the Building Code for a further 12 months until 30 April 2021. The extension of the transitional provisions for the National Construction Code was implemented to assist the construction industry during the period of uncertainty associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. This decision was guided by representations from industry stakeholders, the Master Builders Association of Western Australia and the Property Council of Australia. The delivery of the $319 million social housing economic recovery package is part of a range of recovery projects as part of the WA Government's broader objective to stimulate residential construction and support jobs in the housing industry. Four all apartments purchased by the WA Government under the Social Housing Economic Recovery Package will comply with NCC 2016, consistent with current legislation and regulations. Five all three projects will be accredited under the Federal Government's Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme, NATHERS. Are there any further answers? The Minister for Regional Development. Thank you, Madam President. On the 12th of November, I provided an answer to Legislative Council question without notice uh, number 1312 from the Honourable Robin Chapel. Uh, uh, for which I was advised that controls and procedures to ensure imported fuel complies with Australian standards for imported fuels are administered by the Federal Government. While the statement is not incorrect, I am now advised that we have a uniquely stricter requirement for fuels that are subsequently imported into Western Australia. Uh, and, Madam uh, President, I have an extensive list of those um, uh, variations, and I was wondering if I, I could seek leave to table uh, the document that would then detail the departures um, of WA requirements. Hmm? You can table that document. You don't need to seek leave. No, I table that document. Are there any further answers? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. Madam President, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 3338, asked by the Honourable Alison Zamon. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers from any Minister or Parliamentary Secretary? If not, members, we return no to orders is. of the day. You know the and we're dealing with orders of the day 44 and 45 uh, in cognate debate. Appropriation Recurrent 2020-21 Bill 2020 and Appropriation Capital 2020-21 Bill 2020. And the question is the bills be read a second time. Minister in reply. Thanks very much, Madam President. And I thank uh, honourable members for their contributions to the debate uh, today, particularly the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas, the Honourable Colin Tinknell and the Honourable Nick Coran. Um, Obviously, members have had uh, access to agencies uh, over the past week in relation to the estimates hearing processes, and they've been able to gain uh, detailed in insight into the ways in which approved funding will be spent over the coming year. Um, so I have noted the comments made by the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. Uh, he obviously has a view uh, in relation to how estimates should work in the future, and obviously uh, I'm sure the committee will take that on board. Uh, the Honourable Colin Tinknell uh, did make comment of Metronet, and he actually made a few mistakes in that he, this hasn't been around for 12 years. This has been a policy of this government, and certainly a great deal of work has been undertaken uh, in relation to Metronet, including giving contracts to Aboriginal businesses on Metronet projects, fit-outs continue at train stations, Work is underway on the Tonkin Gap project, which will enable works for the Morley Ellenbrook line. Uh, a trade training centre, a Metronet trade training centre, has been established at North Metropolitan TAFE's Midland campus. 
Community reference groups have been established to help inform the designs of for level crossing removals. Uh, so a great deal of work has been undertaken. Uh, the Honourable Nick Goran, I shall certainly pass your comments on to appropriate ministers. And with that, uh, I commend the bill to the House. Bills to the House. Uh, the minister has moved has amended the uh, bill to the House. All other opinions say aye. 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 So the, is that, uh, the question is that the appropriation of the current 2020-21 uh, Bill 2020 uh, be agreed. All of that have been be now read a second time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Appropriation recurrent 2020-21 Bill 2020. Right second reading. The question is now that the appropriation capital 2020-2021, Bill 2020, uh, uh, be, now be read a second time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Appropriation capital 2020-21, Bill 2020, second reading. Minister. Minister. I seek leave of the House to dispense with the committee stage and move forthwith to the third reading of these bills. The Minister has sought uh, that we move to the third reading. Is, is leave granted? Will other aye, opinions aye. say aye? To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting President. I move that the bills be now read a third time. The Minister has moved that the bill be now read a third time. It's a cognate debate, so we do deal with them separately. So uh, the, third, the question is the third reading on the appropriate. The question is the appropriation recurrent 2020-2021, Bill 2020, uh, be read a third time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Appropriation recurrent 2020-21, Bill 2020, third reading. Uh, therefore, therefore, the question is that the appropriation capital bill, uh, capital 2020-21, Bill 2020, be read a third time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Appropriation Capital 2020-21, Bill 2020, third reading. That Minister, that then takes us to the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Uh, Minister of Environment uh, representing the Minister of Planning. And the question is that the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020 be read a second time. Uh, the Honourable Bjorn Sidman. Um, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. I am uh, the lead speaker for uh, the Liberal Party uh, in respect of this uh, legislation. And I might just um, commence my introductory remarks by reflecting on a characteristic of legislating uh, throughout this 40th Parliament and certainly throughout the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is that uh, bills can be introduced, you can be briefed on them extensively, you can uh, exercise and discharge your due diligence in terms of consultation uh, with uh, affected stakeholders and likely affected stakeholders, and it might be many months again uh, before the bill in question uh, rises to the top of the um, of the business program proposed by government. So I found myself in a position, Mr. Acting Deputy President, of of having to reappraise myself with the content of the bill and to uh, make a an effective and constructive contribution, uh, notwithstanding obviously now the constraints of time, which are obviously not imposed upon us as a um, as a consequence of the invocation of temporary standing orders uh, because of COVID-19, but simply because this is, uh, at least for the moment, the last sitting week uh, of the year and for the term of the 40th Parliament. I, I say that because bills of this nature, I think, are technically, well, the bill itself is not technically complex, but the implications it gives rise to are. 
it is effectively here to do a number of things, including uh, the legitimisation of a new planning scheme for the Swan Valley. If this debate had come upon us uh, in June or in August or even in September, I think it would have been to the credit of this chamber if we gave ourselves at least a day or two days of contemplation and of debate and reflection in a way which I think would have probably materially improved uh, the quality of the product that we are here to discuss and also to make some observations or to sound some warnings potentially about the draft scheme as it was being contemplated. I say this, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the Liberal Party has indicated that it supports the legislation. I have some issues around timing. I'll reflect on the history of de-conflicting land uses in the Swan Valley. I'll also reflect on the kinds of expectations uh, which have been uh, driven upwards, I suppose, by the way that the government has prosecuted its particular argument and undertaken its consultation for the bill. But I intend to reflect mainly on the instrument to which it attempts to give rise or to legitimise, which is the draft Swan Valley uh, planning scheme. And uh, attentive members of the chamber uh, may have noticed that I asked this afternoon quite deliberately a question about that planning scheme. Because planning schemes seem to give rise, uh, not only in this chamber but in the course of public debate, a great degree of public anxiety and worry. Because frankly, the consultation process that we have traditionally embarked upon in this jurisdiction, I think is manifestly inadequate and is not meeting public expectations around explanation and around timeliness and about a genuine sense of engaging with a community and talking honestly with them about what their community prospects actually are in social terms, in terms of the built form and in the terms of economic growth. And I will note, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that earlier this year we dealt with quite an extensive remodelling series of amendments to the Planning and Development uh, Bill Act. Sorry. Again, uh, that debate was truncated out of necessity. It was truncated because it was, given the appellation, a COVID-19 economic recovery bill. And as such, debate was time limited and it focused on a very narrow subset of uh, amendments to the legislation, particularly those concerning uh, the so-called significant, significant development approval pathway. But there were some 100 or more clauses uh, contained within that bill that I do not feel we gave uh, adequate, adequate scrutiny to, but these are the circumstances of the time. The reason I reflect on that bill and that debate was because the government was very clear that that bill was part of, or the first part of two bills, two major planning reform bills that could be expected to come to this chamber by the end of this parliamentary year. Now, obviously that is not the case because this is not the bill that was referred to. The second bill aims to vastly improve community consultation in the planning process. And I actually think it is a shameful missed opportunity that the government has not sought to prioritise that. Because I think faith in the planning system has become eroded and perhaps unnecessarily eroded by a lack of due attention on the public and community interface. I say that by way of preamble. As to the specifics of this bill. The bill is attempting to deal with, in essence, the fragmentation of land use in the Swan Valley, and particularly the creep of what is considered to be inappropriate land uses. 
There has been for some decades different approaches to grapple with the Swan Valley. How you provide certain protections and a certain emphasis on historical land uses, particularly as they pertain to agriculture and related activities, while also recognising that we are now in the 21st century and there is a need to accommodate residential populations as well as cater to a series of other and ancillary land uses. This has been the case uh, since at least 1995, uh, when the first uh, Swan Valley Planning Act uh, came into effect. Uh, that act was certainly uh, well-intentioned at the time and did operate uh, with some measure of success until time moved on. And I'll reflect on uh, an attempt to grapple with the competing land use issue uh, by the previous government, um, the Barnett government, and uh, my colleague that sits in front of me here, the Honourable Dor um, Donna Farragher, uh, in 2016, uh, introduced what was called the Swan Valley Protection Bill. Now, that Swan Valley Protection Bill, introduced in 2016, is effective, was e effectively seeking the same things, the same strategic outcome that this bill does. It proposed to do so via a different instrument and have what you could say a, a differentiated governance structure around it, but effectively its objects were the same. A reasonable person might ask, well, why has it taken four years to essentially arrive at the same place, albeit in the last three sitting days of this parliament? And I think that is a reasonable question to ask. It is there that I look to the historical record of debate, normally as they are relayed to us through media statements and the like. And I do this not necessarily to score any cheap political points, but to identify the fact that four years ago we had a solution to the issues that this bill proposes to fix. And criticisms that were made about that bill can be equally applied to this bill, and indeed equally applied to the instrument uh, that this bill seeks, seeks to uh, both legitimise and bring some certainty to. I draw upon an article from The Advocate. The title of this article is called Swan Valley Planning Change Feared. The journalist was Montana Arden and it appeared on September 5, 2016. And I will read in a number of quotes from Ms Safiotti, uh, the member for right, the electorate, West Swan. Yes, not Swan Hills, West Swan. Who said, while she welcomed, this is in, in relation to the bill that the Honourable Donna Farragher introduced, Ms Safiotti said that while she welcomed the focus on maintaining the rural, rural character of the Swan Valley, there were a number of concerns regarding the content of the bill. The member went on to say, the minister, this is a direct quote, the minister, referring to the Honourable Donna Farragher, is asking for the parliament to support legislation without the details of the development plan being finalised, she said. In a sense, she is asking parliament to sign a blank cheque, end quote. A reasonable person might be moved to make a very similar observation about the way that this particular bill was managed. Because, again, if I haven't bored you to death, I mentioned at the outset that this bill has been on the notice paper for some months. Some months. And when this bill was introduced, it did speak about the scheme to which I will return to in the latter stage of this contribution. But it was some months, at least some three months after this bill was introduced, that anybody even saw a copy of the Swan Valley planning scheme 
draft. So that is the first issue. The second issue is that, and I quote, however, Ms Safiotti said the protection bill had taken away residents' voices. Her direct quote is this, the abolition of the Swan Valley Planning Committee with no real replacement will mean that the many different voices of the valley will have no real place to be heard, end quote. She goes on to say, the valley will just be treated like any other part of the metropolitan area without its own voice. This bill proposes to disestablish that very same committee, the Swan Valley Planning Committee. But it seeks to replace it, yes, with two committees. One, a statutory planning committee, effectively a subordinate um, uh, committee of the Western Australian Planning Committee, and something the minister refers to as a Swan Valley leadership group, whose representation is largely determined by her, the minister. So one might not say that that necessarily of itself would satisfy that the very many different voices of the Swan Valley will now be represented. I don't think that is true. I might also say, and we do reflect upon it not only in the course of planning debates but other debates here, about the conduit that local government authorities play as a voice for residents, for their ratepayers. And might I say that this bill here is a form of local government reform by stealth, because effectively uh, the city of Swan now has absolutely no meaningful role when it comes to planning decisions in the Swan Valley. That is, that is true. And it has staggered me that that determination seems to have been willfully adopted by the city of Swan itself, at least at its level of the highest executive. And I'll read in an email, I think, from the now uh, ex or soon to be uh, retiring CEO of the city of Swan. But the third issue um, that the now minister identified as being deficient about the draft bill that was introduced four years ago was this, quote, Ms Safiotti was also concerned that the draft plan and legislation did not address many of the obstructions for agriculture in the valley, such as land tax, water supply and right to farm issues. Directly, she says, the bill and plan do not provide any practical support to address many of the challenges in undertaking agricultural pursuits in the valley, in particular, viticulture. She continues, there is no, quote, right to farm, end quote, element. There is nothing to address the water shortages and water allocation issues, and they have not addressed the cost challenges to leasing properties such as land tax. She continues, there is little planned investment for the area including no supporting funding to improve road and public transport to service the region." End quote. The problem with the Barnett government bill, one of its many deficiencies, according to the current Minister for Planning and a person who is very familiar with the Swan Valley, is that, I say again, did not address land tax, water supply, water allocation, infrastructure, associated tax issues and right to farm. This appears then a, an appropriate standard. Those issues seem to be the appropriate benchmarks or KPIs you would seek to apply to this bill. Because these were the issues which I think fairly, to some degree, agitated the minister. And in fact, compelled her, when she became the Minister for Planning, to not proceed, 
to not adopt effectively even the barest contours of the preceding bill that was introduced by the Hon 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 Donna Farragher in 2016. What we have seen subsequent to that uh, were some consultation, I will say, on the face of it, um, quite extensive community consultation phase around Swan Valley issues, not merely planning issues, but Swan Valley issues, uh, that was undertaken by the late uh, the Honourable um, Mr Kabelke. But many of his recommendations themselves are actually not reflected in this bill either. So effectively, we have done a full circle in policy and planning terms over the course of the last four years, of course, to end up in the same position that we're starting. But we are now encouraged with some measure of urgency to pass this bill because these issues demand some resolution. And I concur. I think the people and the businesses which operate within the Swan Valley do demand, do demand and should expect a measure of improved certainty. My first of many questions, which I won't prosecute my ordinary um, manner in Clause 1 debates and then effectively delay the passage of the legislation because I'm attempting helpfully to ask the question at the appropriate clause. I'll just ask them up front now. I think that might be a more profitable place. But the first question which springs to my mind is, well, what kinds of non-conforming or undesirable land uses or built form structures have been approved in the last four years? that would be expressly disallowed under this new planning scheme and would have even been disallowed under the previous development plan, which would have found as its founda statutory foundation the original bill that I've referred to countless times, if I haven't made that point clear by now. I think that is an important issue. I want to speak briefly to consultation because there was an extensive consultation about the Swan Valley, but there was not necessarily extensive consultation either in respect of the specifics of this legislation. And I want to seek some additional clarification about the kinds of issues that were raised as part of the four week long uh, public comments phase, which applied to the publication of the Swan Valley planning scheme. I will put it to the government, indeed I will put it to members here, that there was nothing in the way of extensive consultation concerning the structure of this bill. One of its impacts, in fact I will, I will read effectively what this bill does to contextualise this particular matter. This bill repeals the Swan Valley Planning Act of 1995. It creates a head of power essentially for the creation of the new scheme, which I've referred to repeatedly. It does so in a way to replace two instruments. The first one is the City of Swan Local Planning Scheme number 17, and that's not an insignificant thing, and the Metropolitan Region Scheme. It establishes two groups that I referred to, the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee, and the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group. And this is where I'll jump back into the process of, of the, the, I think, the deficient uh, process of consultation. What this scheme does is effectively take decision making for developments in the Swan Valley out of the City of Swan's hands, completely. At a departmental briefing, uh, the officers responsible for the construction of this bill put it to us when we thought, well, the obvious question, what does the City of Swan have to say about this? We were told that they were relieved or that they supported it. Um, in my brief time here, I've, I've never encountered a local government authority that was particularly relaxed or sanguine about uh, powers or decision-making authority being taken away from it. But nevertheless, that was the proposition put to us. So, yeah, 
out of an act of due diligence, I wrote um, to the Chief Executive Officer, Mr Michael Foley, of the City of Swan. And I asked him what his views were, because this was effectively the state government's views of, of his views, and I thought I should give him an appropriate hearing. This exchange took place um, around about the 8th of September, so again three months ago. I'm reading myself back into this bill and attempting to uh, do a decent job of it. This is just part of the problem of legislative management that we've all encountered in one way or another. But Mr Foley's response to my initial inquiry was thus. To the best of my knowledge, the city and therefore the council, this is important to listen to, to the best of my knowledge, the city and therefore the council have not been consulted on the actual Swan Valley Planning Bill. The city was, however, consulted on the Swan Valley Planning Review Report by John, John Kabelke, JP, in 2018. In this regard, the Council on 29 August 2018 resolved as follows. And it was effectively a list of 15 um, points which outlined the contours of their support. But I'll highlight a few of them uh, for the edification of the Chamber. The second point was that the Council, at its 29th August 2018 meeting, supported a new Swan Valley Planning Act only underscore where the proposed creation of a Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee as a single planning authority and a creation of a Swan Valley Leadership Group are provided by the state with their own resources, including staffing. Now, this seems to get to the, the gist of why a council might support this. It's because they don't have to pay to support it. But whether or not those two groups, or particularly the inclusion of a leadership group, are strictly necessary in terms of discharging um, what should reasonably be dispassionate um, determinations on, on planning applications is another point. But the Council was explicit at point eight that it would support the principle of a quote right to farm end quote provision being incorporated into any new Swan Valley Planning Act. But further, on the specific question of the city's visibility of slash involvement in, and this is the clincher for me, the preparation of forthcoming Swan Valley planning scheme, I confirm that we have not been consulted and have not received a copy of a draft version thereof. Remember one of the litany of issues with the 2016 Liberal Bill was that it bypassed adequate consultation. Well, here I have the proof. When the bill was introduced, the Council wasn't appropriately consulted on the legislation, nor had they seen the merest outline of the draft planning scheme that the legislation would enable. And I frankly do not consider that to be anywhere near good enough. Just not. There are many and varied avenues that I would have enjoyed to go to, but time will not permit it. So I will concentrate on two aspects. And whether you look in the bill itself, in the long title of the bill, or the stated objects of the bill, or whether you go to the explanatory memorandum, which is, for some strange reason, almost as long as the bill itself, and I think, and I've, refl I've reflected on these kinds of issues previously, I start to think that indicates some problem with legislative drafting, but that's another issue. But when you go to those two core documents, there is no right to farm enshrined in the bill. There isn't. 
there is no new statutory right created. One might talk about preferring or giving priority to certain specific land uses, which are predominantly rural or predominantly deal with uh, the perpetuation of viticulture or horticulture or even include um, various equestrian pursuits. But that is not the creation of a right to farm. That is a misleading statement. And that misleading statement appears in the second reading speech and it also appears in the media statements prepared by the Minister. So not only does this bill and the scheme it gives rise to fail the standard set by the Honourable Rita Safiotti four years ago when she was opposition and talking about the previous Liberal bill, it also, fulfill, it also fails to fulfil her own standard. There is no right to farm enshrined in this bill, and I think largely because it would be impossible to do it. But this is how this bill has been sold. A related, thank you. A related issue <laughs> is that, in its attempt, nevertheless, to give effect to that spirit, to prioritise rural land uses, to avoid the fragmentation of lots, to thwart uh, the encroachment of residential development to preserve the history and the character of the district. We have taken potentially a very blunt approach in the scheme. The scheme, Mr Acting Deputy President, is an extensive document and anybody familiar with schemes of this nature would be familiar with things such as zoning of use, uh, zone use tables, uh, plus what's called the land use permissibility table. And I might reflect, if I can, uh, Minister, on, on a couple of issues which arise from this. Now, strictly, and I'll, it'll be some time before I think you might get up and be able to respond. If, if not, we'll find the appropriate point. Because this is not embedded in the bill but it is implied by the bill, and this, do this document, not yet uh, signed off yet by the minister nor gazetted, will be enabled by this bill. But I would draw members' attention, if they have this particular document at hand, and it is Swan Valley Planning Scheme Number 1, draft for public consultation. At page 12, part 4, Zones and the use of land. You will see Table 2, Zone Objectives. The first zone's name is Priority Agriculture. The second zone is Swan Valley Rural. And there are a series of objectives that apply to those land uses. The Priority Agricultural Land Use effectively is the land either side of the river, of the Swan Valley River. The objectives there are not extensive, but probably too long to note. But I will reflect on objective two as it rela relates to priority agriculture. <coughs> and objective two is to provide for long-term agricultural production in the Swan Valley by preventing further subdivision of land and protecting good quality soils from non-agricultural use and development. And point three, which I think is particularly problematic for the economy of the Swan Valley, uh, for job creation, uh, for tourism and the like, and that is to limit hospitality and tourism development and land use to where it is incidental and complements 
agricultural production and does not detract from the rural character and amenity of the area. I would make an observation about that. I can understand why a statutory planner would write such a thing. But if we seriously consider the agricultural, the economic agricultural productive capacity of the Swan Valley, if you measure that against, say, the growing of table grapes, for example, I would suggest to you that the, econo the economics of that kind of production are in longer term decline. And I think that is probably uh, also true of wine grapes because it is a there are limited acreages uh, under harvest. It might therefore be desirable, and actually in keeping with the presentation of the Swan Valley, and actually facilitate its agricultural and rural heritage, nature and amenity, if you could be somewhat sensible about future hospitality and tourism developments within that priority agricultural zone. And I'm certainly not talking about things like caravan parks or the like. But I think we need to be reasonably sophisticated about the way that we market our geographic regions in Western Australia and look at what South Australia or Victoria are capable of. And on indulgence, I will reflect on a personal experience, which I'm normally loath to do because that is the province of the other place, not here. But two weeks before the shutters came down with COVID-19, I attended a family wedding in the Swan Valley. Uh, it was for a close relative of my wife, uh, a near and dear relative. And we actually wanted to celebrate that wedding in the appropriate fashion. We've got two kids and we thought, well, we'd like to take everybody there and stay overnight, if possible, on the site of this old winery or homestead. It's impossible really to do that in the Swan Valley. Now, you can do that in Margaret River, which is good, but you can do that in the Yarra Valley or in the Barossa Valley, but you can't really do that in the Swan Valley. So what I think we're on the cusp of actually legitimising here is a scheme which is well intentioned but is actually going to sterilise economic potential, send a chill through investment, avoid development and actually have the land not fulfil its full economic, social or, dare I say it, environmental potential because I think this is a very, very blunt instrument. In practical effect, what objective three of the priority agricultural zone, this is where the big wineries are, you could not build a 10 or 15 or 20 room bespoke accommodation complex. Potentially, that is not permitted under this scheme. Now, if it is, that would be wonderful. But I think we need to be very, very wary of blunt instruments like this, which are absolutely well-intentioned, which are going to be given some legitimisation as a consequence of the passage of this bill in a very rushed way. But I think the fundamental economics need to be well-considered. And I'm not necessarily by nature a pedantic person. I leave that to others. But I will but I but I will but I will be determined determinedly pedantic about this. The reason I went to some lengths to identify the wide-scale consultation deficiencies as they apply to the construction of the actual bill that we are here to debate and the drafting of this planning scheme is because I think they have been drafted by people 
without any skin in the game, without any risk, who've never made a significant investment in their lives, nor constructed a development of any scale. They are people doing their job and they're doing it professionally. But I, I urge this chamber, as I would urge this parliament and urge the community, to not, to not just take the planner's view of the world as the only appropriate view of the world. Uh, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, I think you might have that opportunity, Member, if you, if you want to make a contribution to the bill, and, and the gentleman representing the, the minister will no doubt uh, be very gracious in his consideration of that suggestion. The honourable gentleman. Sorry, did I call you that? No. no well, I did well. If not, I was remiss, uh, and we'll correct that uh, unreservedly and immediately. But I, I just—I want to say this. I, I asked a question quite deliberately today about whether or not this scheme was going to be amended. I strongly encourage, strongly encourage, the minister responsible and her department to actually talk seriously with businesses that operate within that priority agricultural zone and get to some understanding of their economic imperatives and their development prospects, because I think some of them are actually quite exciting and things that you would want to facilitate. When I go to the Swan Valley, I see its potential. I see that in Perth generally and Western Australia generally. I think generally we live in a time of potential unfulfilled. And I would adopt that view of the Swan Valley too. There is a lot that we can be doing. We should be in a position where we can capture a slice of the tourism market once it flourishes back to life again, which it will, both domestically and internationally. But I would like to see people stay in the Swan Valley overnight because wineries or food and beverage producers of scale can actually provide something interesting and compelling to the market. So people just don't come in, fill up their chockey bag at the Margaret River Chocolate Company, or buy a case from uh, the old Hortons, for example, and then shuffle off down south or back to the CBD. If you want to grow the Swan Valley and its economic and social potential, this is a place to start, but certainly not end. Do not end here. I think there is a great opportunity to make this planning scheme far more effective, far more friendly. At the moment, I would fear its impact. So it is with some reservation that I acknowledge the consequences of supporting the bill, but we are where we are. So I do want to end on that constructive note, that constructive note, that we have an opportunity to get this scheme right. There is nothing that should rush the minister into signing off on this draft planning scheme as it exists. Because, and without any sense of being gratuitous or facetious, she hasn't shown that level of urgency at all over the last four years. So there is absolutely no need to do it now. If I had more time available, I would look at the various governance features of this bill, particularly the interaction <laughs> between the creation of the new statutory planning um, um, committee, subcommittee, sorry, and the leadership group, because I think we have some questions uh, there. But I notice that the Honourable Tim Clifford uh, has made, uh, has put some uh, amendments on the notice paper which sort of address, I think, the, the governance concerns uh, which I am foreshadowing, albeit in an abbreviated way. Uh, with that, I will sit down. Look forward to a edifying Clause 1 debate with the view that we pass this bill as we have committed to do and have committed to do for the last three or four months. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Tim Cliff. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I rise to, tonight to speak on the Swan Valley Planning Bill, and I'd like to indicate that I am the lead speaker for the Greens. Party. Um, I'd just like to say yeah, um, we are supporting the bill, but um, much like the previous um, speaker, we do have a few concerns. 
Um, but um, acknowledging the fact that this um, bill is quite significant uh, and has, it has been highlighted in this place and other places that um, the Swan Valley is a place of significance for the state of Western Australia. Uh, it is quite a large area. Uh, the Swan Valley spans uh, from Guildford uh, to Upper Swan at the foot of the Darling Range and is home to approximately 7,000 people. It's also a place of uh, significant, um, um, of Aboriginal significance. And it has also 200 plus years of agriculture, viticulture and tourism. Uh, it also attracts, uh, I, I guess prior to COVID, uh, attract, attracted over 2 million visitors each year. So it's a significant place for uh, as a, a tourist uh, destination. And, that's, um, and that, that's only a part of the story of the Swan Valley and, and, and I, I think it goes to the heart of um, why, um, why um, I indicate that we do support it because we do need to protect this area and, um, and putting forward a bill like this, uh, as I said before, do, does, come with, um, does come with challenges. Uh, I note that the intention of this bill uh, is, to just, is to protect the uh, to protect the area. However, I have some concerns about how this bill will work in practice, given the limited transparency of key components. And I think the um, previous speaker also um, alluded to some of those um, issues. Uh, the current Swan Valley Planning Act function as an addition; it acts as an additional layer or oversight to the Swan Valley, uh, alongside the City of Swan Local Planning Scheme 17 and the Metropolitan Regional uh, Region Scheme. And um, just like the previous speaker, I do, um, I do have concerns uh, well, with the fact, that, the fact that the local government um, of the area has been taken out of that. And I do note that um, I was actually surprised that the, um, that the city of Swan was actually um, didn't, uh, didn't raise too many concerns about being left out of the overall planning scheme or the proposed planning scheme. Uh, this, the new bill, though, uh, will create a special uh, Swan Valley planning scheme uh, that will effectively replace the local planning scheme 17 and the Metropolitan Regional uh, Region Scheme. And according to the explanatory memorandum, uh, this has been done to give special protection to the Swan Valley, which um, I fully support, as a rural and tourism area. Um, so the current bill for par Parliament, um, I, I do look at um, uh, section 12, um, and unlike the current Act, this bill doesn't identify planning areas or minimum lot sizes within the Swan Valley area, which is a concern. And given the intent of the bill is to reduce subdivisions to maintain the character of the Swan Valley, perhaps the minimum lot sizes should be detailed in the bill. So. Um, I'd just like to um, seek some clarification. Uh, would the minister please explain why minimum lot sizes and the Swan Valley planning areas will be and Swan Valley planning areas will be provided via regulation rather than outlined in this bill? Uh, and uh, point three: identify setbacks or, or position of building on lots as, as possible mitigation measures. However, there is no mention of buffer zones. I note that this is not prescribed in the current Act. However, I've been advised by constituents within, East, within the East Metropolitan um, Region that a failure to establish buffer zones between residential and rural land uses uh, in areas within the Swan Valley, such as Henley Brook, has already caused detrimental impacts. So uh, another question to put forward would be, uh, I'd like to ask, would the Minister please explain why this bill does not provide for buffer zones? Uh, between rural and non-rural land use areas. And um, aside from, the, from a significant part of the bill being wholly, uh, wholly introduced via regulations, I also have concerns regarding consultation requirements for a proposed, for a proposed scheme or amendment. Before submitting a, a proposed scheme or amendment to the Minister, the Commission must a, consult the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group, B, uh, the Swan Valley Local Government, and C, make reasonable endeavours to consult uh, with any public authorities or persons that appear to the Commission to have an interest in the proposed scheme or amendment. As the bill stands, there are no explicit requirements for the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group, group to consult with the, with the community. Uh, but I'll discuss that later in my contribution. 
I also note that the bill requires the Commission to make reasonable endeavours to consult with persons that appear to have an interest in the proposed scheme or amendment. So I assume that this is to include affected landowners, and if so, could the Minister clarify why consultation with affected landowners is not explicit within the bill? And, it is, and as it is not entirely clear in the bill, could the Minister please explain what community consultation will the Commission undertake in preparing a scheme proposal or amendment? Under points four and five, if the EPA advises that the review has not been undertaken in accordance with, instru with instructions, the Commission may redo the review request of Planning Minister to meet with the Environment Minister to agree if the review has been carried out according to instructions. If the, minister, if the Ministers agree that the review has been conducted per instructions, that this decision is final and with appeal. And this differs slightly to the current framework under the Environmental Protection Act. And although the EPA is still able to express its view that the review is not as required, and it would take two ministers to overrule the EPA, there are some concerns that this section does, does provide a greater degree of political control over the assessment. So that is a concern as well. And uh, section 23. Uh, Members, added... noting the time, I will leave the chair till the ringing of the bells. Honourable Members, the Acting President. Uh, members, we are dealing with the uh, second reading on the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020 in continuation of the remarks of the Honourable Jorn Sibmer. Oh, sorry, no, I'm, I do apologise. Continuation of the remarks <laughs> on, of the Honourable Tim Clifford. I do apologise. <laughs> Thank you, Madam uh, Acting President. <laughs> Very much, I like. Um, yes, and as I was uh, saying before the, uh, d uh, before the break, uh, under section uh, 23, advertising the proposed scheme or amendment, uh, as the proposed Swan Valley planning scheme does not sit within traditional planning controls, more information is required regarding how proposed schemes or amendments will be advertised. So given that relevant local planning scheme regulations apply under this bill, can the minister please confirm that proposed schemes or amendments for the Swan Valley will be advertised as per the planning and development local planning schemes regulations 2015? And um, further on uh, from that, the advisory group, the functions of the Swan Valley Leadership Group is to essentially advise the minister and comment on the strategic direction of the Swan Valley. The leadership group is not to provide advice or comments or documents in relation to particular applications for development or sub subdivision approval in the Swan Valley. This and the fact that the new Swan Valley strategic leadership group doesn't make recommendations to the local government are the only major changes in the function of this advisory body compared to the body under the current Act. Consisting of seven members appointed by the Minister, the leadership group is essentially the voice for the Swan Valley, representing diverse interests in their unique area. Yet I'm not convinced that this is accurately represented in the prerequisites for membership. As uh, stated, um, under aid have practical, they must have practical knowledge or experience that is relevant to the functions of the group. Uh, is an appropriate person to represent the interests of the Swan Valley residents and businesses? And this is compared to the Swan Valley Planning Committee under the current Act, which must consist of a chairperson with appropriate qualifications appointed by the minister, a president or acting COC, COS. Uh, representing the Swan Valley Ward, or a councillor representing the Swan Valley Ward, or a chairperson or acting of the Commission. 
Um, also, one person um, represented from the Midland and Districts Chamber of Commerce and Industries, or the Grape uh, Growers Association WA, the Swan Valley and Regional Winemakers Association, and the Swan Valley Tourism Council. Um, four other persons appointed by the Minister, of whom one is to be the person who is a resident of the Swan Valley, and one is to be a person who is, in, a, in the opinion of the Minister, is suitable to represent Aboriginal interests in that area. One is to be a person who, who, in the opinion of the Minister, is suitable to represent equestrian interests in the area, and one is to be a person who is, in the opinion of the Minister, has expertise in the reduction of nutrient levels in the Swan River or other environmental expertise relevant to the implementation of the Act. So these requirements clearly ensure adequate local representation for future planning of the Swan Valley under the current system, as the Swan Valley, um, as we're looking at in the um, proposed bill, as the current Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group consists of less explicit local and, and interest representation. So I'm concerned that there might not be that local uh, representation that uh, was under the current regime. So could the minister please clarify, community, uh, please clarify that community consultation requirements of this leadership group um, that will buy, uh, leadership group will advise both the minister and commission. The other key point to highlight regarding this group is the, is the constitution, including terms, vacancies and procedures uh, that will be made by regulations. And this is a contrast uh, to the current act, which details clear reporting transparency and decision-making requirements for its advisory body. So, mem uh, so uh, members must currently disclose conflicts and not be present during discussions or determinations, and members must, must uh, not make use of any information acquired by virtue of the performance of his or her functions to gain directly or indirectly an improper advantage for himself or herself to cause detriment to any person. Also, a quorum for a meeting of the, of the committee is also six members, and accurate minutes are to be kept, as are records of any advice given or report made by it in performance of its functions. These are to me, and these are to me made public. Um, without legislating key components of the conduct of the Swan Valley's key advisory body, the community voice may not be clearly heard, and that's um, a concern that I've heard um, from uh, from um, not only a couple of the groups in the region, but also. Um, uh, councils that I've spoken to on the on the um, on the local council on the Swan uh, on the Swan City Council, and this is additionally concerning given um, WA still doesn't have a th does not have third party appeal rights. Uh, under Part Four of the bill, uh, the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee. Uh, this committee will be a subcommittee of the WA Planning Commission. That will be a separate body from the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group, which will be responsible for determining planning and, um, planning and development matters. And as members may be aware, there's nothing in this bill that prevents multiple people from sitting on both the leadership group and the statutory planning committee. Though I recognise this is not the minister's intent for the bill due to the membership prerequisites that state the body must consist of one, the chairman, five other, and five other persons who must be members of the statutory planning committee, one person who represents the Swan Valley local government, and two people who represent the interests of, Swan, of the Swan Valley residents and businesses. And that each person appointed by the commission and approved by the minister must have practical knowledge or experience that is relevant to horticulture, viticulture, cultural heritage, landscape protection, tourism, hospitality, hospitality, hobby farming or equestrian, activities or is otherwise an appropriate person to represent the interests of the Swan Valley residents and businesses. However, given the transparency and explicit community engagement concerns of the bill, uh, that's why I've proposed the amendments uh, in the bill, so it would be interesting to hear the response from the government. And that's why I moved the amendment. Um, and the other thing to note uh, about the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee is the committee can delegate any of the powers and duties bestowed by the commission to a member or associate a member, uh, as defined by PDA, a subcommittee, an officer of the commission, a public authority, or a member or officer of the Swan Valley Local Government, an employee of the Swan Valley Local Government, 
so through my consultation on this bill, concerns have, were raised that the Swan Valley local government will be required to conduct work that is limited involvement in or oversight on, and that the local government governments are being increasingly sidelined in local planning decisions. So I, I note that the leadership group will consult with the local government, but could the minister please outline what other consultation will be done with the local government in ongoing management of the Swan Valley? So um, before I wrap up, I just don't have much left to, to say, apart from um, I do note that uh, in the plan, in the Planning Minister's second reading speech, the Minister acknowledged the Aboriginal culture and heritage of the area. However, there was no mention um, in, this, in this bill or anything that indicates a First Nations cultural connection to the area. So I'd just like to seek a commitment that the Minister, um, uh, that there's some sort of um, ongoing form of consultation with um, elders and traditional custodians in the, in the local region, which I think is important um, for the heritage of the area. And finally, the current Act stipulates a requirement for a review of the Act five years after implementation to ensure it is, it is progressing as intended. And I note that the local planning schemes are required to review too, typically every five years. So would the Minister please provide insight as to why the five-year review is not included in the current incarnation of the bill? Um, I think it's important that, the, given the uh, scope of this bill, I think it's important that we do have a review clause, I do think that it's important that we do adopt the amendment that I've put forward in the um, notice pa paper. But going to, back to the beginning of my opening remarks, I think it's important to note that this has been through a couple of incarnations, I know from the previous government and, um, and the current government who's uh, basically rebuilt it from the ground. Um, it is important that we do protect the heritage of the, of the area and um, for the intentions of the Act to protect and preserve what is there to ensure that um, that place is, remains um, a prosperous and uh, a unique and important place in the state and, um, and to avoid encroaching subdivisions like we've seen so many places across this um, metropolitan area with um, subdivisions popping up everywhere and um, the, the concerns before or, going out there and speaking to the community as um, I was consulting on this bill, speaking to locals about the concerns that they had that the Swan Valley would um, pretty, pretty much um, in, in the coming years uh, just go into a, a place where we've got endless subdivisions and the um, scope of the national, say for example, the, um, the wine growers, um, their areas might be under threat and and that's why I mentioned such things in, within my uh, remarks around the buffer zones between rural and, and residential and, and so forth. So it'll be interesting to see um, what the government responds to my questions and how they, um, and what approach they take to the amendments. Um, but I think it's important that um, this bill is scrutinised and, and as the previous, um, um, the Honourable Jorn Sidma uh, remarked that um, normally I think if um, this bill was being put forward back uh, early in the year, I. I'd, I, I would have rather we uh, spend a bit more time on it um, because it does seem that we don't have much time and we, we do seem a bit pressed um, to get this through. So I am interested in seeing what um, happens in the committee stage and um, I look forward to that process. Members, the question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Colin Ticknell. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting President. Look, um, I'm only going to speak briefly on this bill, but I... Um, I wanted to talk about uh, many things that uh, some of the members have brought up and also areas of concern from the consultation we've done on this bill. I suppose um, I've been listening to the Honourable Jorn Sidma earlier on talking about many things, and one of those ones were uh, tourism opportunities. Um, also uh, buffer zones mentioned by the Honourable Tim Clifford. And my main, my, my main area of concern is local residents and, and lack of um, representation. So I'll just I'll get into that. If we look at uh, distilleries, breweries, cideries, uh, let's maybe say honey outlets, uh, nougat, nuts, coffee, chocolate, ice cream, those sorts of businesses may not be able to open up in the, south, in the, in the Swan Valley with the way the bill reads at the moment. It talks about 
products that aren't made in the um, in the Swan Valley won't be able to be, you know, um, promoted or sold or or a, you know a, a, an outlet um, built in that area. That's a, so that that's an issue. I think um, the Honourable Yorn Sidman mentioned that that could be a lost opportunity and it also could um, be um, something that will hinder us into the future. Everyone that's lived in Perth for a long time understands what a special area the Swan Valley is. And we want to protect that and keep as much of that as possible. And so we're not against development or great planning for that area. But there are local residents, uh, Matt Apton President, that um, have been there a long, long time. And one of the reasons they moved there is because it's one of the few areas in, the, around, in and around Perth where you can have um, that sort of environment. Semi-rural, uh, but still very, um, you know, available to the public of Perth because there's so much on offer. And we don't want unplanned, um, unplanned and, and ill-advised developments opening up either. We, we do want to protect that area and, and, and make sure that, it's, um, uh, that those developments are controlled to a degree. But not, not to a degree where, where it will really tie up our hands and, and maybe turn it into a place that people won't want to go in the future. Buffer zones are important. The, the Honourable Tim Clifford mentioned that. And, um, you know, it, only, it, it makes sense that there is that, because otherwise we will have issues ongoing for many years into the future. And when this government's gone, and even the next government's gone, that's when those problems will come up and it will be, oh, well, that's too hard because that was two governments ago. And we need to make sure that those buffer zones are planned uh, and organised for the future and so people are protected with their businesses. Um, looking at the local residents and the consultation, which is the area that I want to cover the most. Look, um, forming a strategic leadership group to advise to advise the Minister, comprising of seven members who are appointed by the Minister, with remuneration decided by the Minister, has me questioning if members of this committee would be working for local residents of Swan Valley or working for the Minister. And that's what a lot of people that live in Swan Valley are thinking and saying when you talk to them. So they don't believe that um, there is enough community or uh, resident input and that um, their concerns aren't being clearly heard. Also forming the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee, again with no input from local residents, but rather be chosen by the Commission and approved by the Minister to make decisions regarding development in Swanley, bearing in mind that the WA Planning Commission Board is nominated by the Minister. So you can see why they feel that way. Um, they feel like they're going to be left out of the conversation and not really their concerns aren't going to be heard and that, um, that uh, it says here the planning committee appears to remove the rights of local council and residents in regards to planning issues with no accountability for decisions. So when you consult to the people out in the uh, valley, these are the things they're talking about. Part two of subdivision three. Here's um, one of the concerns that was written to me. Advertising proposed schemes for or amendment is very vague about where proposals will be advertised. We have a situation in Henleybrook currently where a number of residents were not aware of a five acre properties being rezoned to urban R30, R60 and none of the adjoining neighbours were informed. So that sort of thing is already happening and so they have concerns that um, when you build something, it's not just the people um, that uh, you know visit that venue or own that venue. It's also the neighbours are affected, and and in that case, they haven't been reformed. Another part two sub, sub, uh, subdivision three advertising proposed scheme or amendment states public submissions will be considered. However, in the current Henley Brook development, public submissions have been completely dismissed. There is no measure of accountability to prove how public submissions are dealt with and if they are in fact considered. 
So these are the queries that keep popping up. So look, Minister, when you please get up and make your, uh, your, your you have your discussion and your uh, wind up of this, I'd like to hear some of the answers to that. I mentioned the buffer zone, so I won't go through that again. Um, with the Kabelki report, in 2017, Mr Kabelki reported report stated that the greatest concern of Swan Valley residents expressed regarding development causing the loss of rural character and amenity. Whilst devel developers have a free reign to develop thousands of small <coughs> 90 by 300 square blocks around the Swan Valley, abutting the Swan Valley, and the loss of character and amenity is inevitable. So he mentioned that in his report, and this is um, the major concern for those people. Are summed up in one paragraph. Ways to inform the community of impending uh, um, amendments, how to improve community consultation, which can be difficult in areas with ageing populations or residents who have a language difficulty, guidelines as to how public submissions will be dealt with, provide measures to ensure that developers adhere to the approved plans and are, are accountable if they don't adhere. So, Madam Acting President, they are the things that have been uh, mentioned to me as I've consulted. Um, I want to finish off with um, the ones that ultimately pay the price are the residents who uh, have either lived there with the effects of the bad planning or move away from the area they love and that they are connected with. So, at this stage, we don't see that the cons consultation has been right when it comes to the residents and the community itself. That um, maybe there is so much concern, or there are lots of really difficult issues to still solve and still work out, and maybe they feel like they're getting steamrolled and not being listened to. Members, the question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Charles Smith. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise this evening just to make a brief contribution to the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. In general, Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, I struggle to see how this new Swan Valley Planning Bill offers any protection to the existing landowners within the Swan Valley, nor those adjoining the Swan Valley. And in general, it is removing the people or the local governments from the decision-making process around planning and replacing them with unelected bureaucrats. And it's for that reason, Madam Acting President, that I, the West Australian Party, will not be supporting this bill. Let's have a brief examination. Firstly, the Strategic Leadership Group. I understand from the bill that this is a group of citizens with knowledge, skill and experience of the Swan Valley and matters of, and I quote, marketing of horticulture, viticulture, tourism, hospitality, hobby farming and equestrian activities in the Swan Valley and the enhancement and protection of the cultural heritage, built heritage recreation and landscape values of the Swan Valley. Now, these members are to be appointed by the Minister of the Day, which, of course, leads one to the inevitable question of who do these people actually work for? Do they work for the community or do they work for the Minister? Realistically, I expect this will result in appointed yes-men to agree with everything the Minister wishes. Yes, Minister. Yes. <laughs> Madam Deputy President, one struggles to see the purpose of this group given the very small niche space in which they would occupy and their complete lack of any real power. And all I am seeing is yet another example of an unelected, unaccountable zero transparency group making decisions on behalf of people because they know better. Sorry? Well, quite. 
Yes, Minister. Madam Deputy President, during a briefing on this bill, some time ago now, I asked what could a person, what could a resident do if they objected to a project in the area? And the best answer I got was they could let the strategic leadership group know what their concerns were. So at best, we have a situation where a person can tell a group of appointed yes-men that they don't like something. And maybe those people may pass it on to another committee or the minister to then completely ignore, much like what happens now. So, Madam Deputy President, in order to restore some democracy to this process, I will be yet again looking to propose third-party appeal right process. People have access to the SAT, access to knowing what is happening in this planning procedure. Next up is the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee. I understand this committee, again, has no input from local residents, but rather is chosen by the West Australian Planning Commission and approved, of course, by the Minister to make decisions <coughs> regarding development in the Swan Valley. Now, while I do appreciate the attempt to remove issues concerning planning and issues concerning surrounding the local council and the planning commission, this is largely removing the community again from the decision-making process. And what we have yet again with the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee is yet another unelected, unaccountable, zero transparency bureaucratic group. Moving on to Clause 18, with the consultation requirements, Mr. Acting President, it requires some consultation with the local government. But looking at the bill, I am rather curious to see what is actually meant by consult. It could be essentially to inform the local government what is going to happen, even if the local government would oppose the matter, but it's okay because consultation has in fact occurred. And does this satisfy the Act? I don't know. This is a question for the Minister to answer. Personally, I would like to see direct community consultation on this matter. As, as we all know and have recognised, the Swan Valley is indeed a gem of Western Australia. And it is also a home to many who, through this bill, are largely left out of any planning process. Mr Acting President, I mentioned the token input from local council, and that is all it is. The Swan Valley is hardly represented in the local council, but I guess I guess hardly represented is better than not represented at all. Uh, Mr Acting President, I just want to jump on to Part 2, Subdivision 3, Clause 23. This section does not state where the proposals will be advertised, which for me is a cause of some concern. And yet again, I, I am looking to rectify that situation with my amendments. For example, as we've heard from the previous speaker, the Honourable <coughs> Colin Tenko, we currently have a situation in Henley Brook where a large number of residents were not aware their properties were being rezoned. And none of the adjoining neighbours were informed either. And whilst the planning policy is so vague, there is no requirement for giving written advice to the affected adjoining or neighbouring landowners. Furthermore, it has been noticed with recent developments in Henleybrook that street signage advising of proposed schemes or amendments have been placed in areas that are not clearly visible to the passing traffic or have been placed on unused or limited traffic streets. Mr Acting President, while I, like many others in this place, want to see the protection of the Swan Hills and see it preserved in all its splendour for future generations, <coughs> I feel that this bill, while noble in effort, fails to deliver on those key aspects. And finally, 
I think the government has yet again missed a golden opportunity to sow the seeds of third party appeal rights in Western Australia, localised in this area as a test for the state. What a great opportunity. However, as we have learnt from a motion that was debated a few weeks ago, it would seem that meaningful community consultation and the rights of those affected by developments and other matters are not in the interest of this government. Mr Acting President, the Western Australian Party will not be supporting the bill and I will again try to introduce some democratic principles to the planning procedure in Western Australia. Members, the question is the bill will be read a second time. Call the Honourable Donna Farragher. <laughs> to say a few words uh, with respect to the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Now, um, like other members, I don't intend to go through the bill at length right now. Um, the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, our uh, shadow spokesperson, has outlined a number of matters, including some concerns, as well as um, other members who have also made a contribution. And Obviously, the committee stage um, does provide a further opportunity, perhaps to canvass some of these um, issues in greater detail. And I certainly will be asking um, a couple of questions, if they are not already raised um, prior by other members. Um, I do, however, perhaps like the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, want to um, record uh, my disappointment that this bill has taken so long to appear in this House, um, particularly given the carry-on um, by the Minister when she was in opposition with the regard to the progress of such uh, legislation as well as the frame framework which we, when we were in government, intended to take. Now, I know um, that the minister could not possibly bear um, to, to reintroduce the same bill. Um, that certainly would be too much to ask, but it really did not need to take four years for us to now be dealing with this bill at the very end of this parliament. Um, I also, like other members, um, do want to say at the outset that, of course, the Swan Valley, and I've said this a number of times in um, other debates in this place, is a very special part of the East Metropolitan Region. It is uh, Western Australia's oldest winemaking region. That's a fact that's not often um, reflected, but is, is a fact, with the first vines planted back in around 1829. Um, it is a draw card for local visitors, and certainly um, before COVID-19, and I, I think the Honourable Tim Clifford mentioned this as well, it is certainly a draw card for both international and interstate visitors alike. So it is a very important tourism precinct for our city um, and for our state. Um, as has been mentioned um, by others, there are many award-winning wineries um, producing high-quality premium wines. There are cafes, there are restaurants, there are galleries art and craft studios, um, art galleries and many other local um, attractions. So in recognising the importance um, of the valley, um, successive governments have sought to ensure the valley is protected. That started back in 1995 um, under the court Liberal government and since then there have been amendments um, to the legislation albeit whilst those amendments have been made, the basic tenets have remained. That is um, that the valley is to be protected from um, the encroachment of urban development and to maintain it as an area primarily uh, for the purposes of viticulture, agriculture and tourism. <coughs> Now, under um, our government, the former Barnett government, there was a lengthy process, um, including significant consultation, and that was undertaken primarily um, by the former planning minister, the Honourable John Day. And in that final year, when I uh, took on the role of planning minister, I suppose I then took it to um, the point of introducing legislation into this place. Um, but I, I think probably, as the minister has found out, um, there are often different views and perspectives um, within the Swan Valley. Um, but what I do think we can all agree on is that um, whilst the current legislative framework has assisted uh, in protecting the agricultural character of the valley, I think there have been um, some major criticisms over the years uh, of the at times apparent inconsistent interpretation of the legislation. 
particularly as it relates to planning and development proposals. And in so doing, we have seen examples um, of development and land use activities, which could be argued, um, quite rightly, um, as incompatible to the objectives of the Act. So in terms of the legislation, and I am going to raise this, in terms of the legislation prepared by our government, we intended to make the process clearer um, for landowners and potential developers, uh, developers by normalising planning and development decision making under the City of Swan's local planning scheme and the Metropolitan Region scheme. As part of this, um, our bill proposed that a Swan Valley, planning, um, Swan Valley development plan be created, which would underpin the local scheme and the MRS. This would provide the framework for the strategic planning of the valley and the settings that would sit around it. Now, the legislation that's currently before us takes a slightly different approach, and, and I would actually say it's a, it's a slightly different approach, but it's an, it's a, there are some differentiations, and there are important differentiations, and I think they are differentiations which perhaps in part have caused um, some concern, and, and the matters that the Honourable Charles Smith and the Honourable Colin Ticknell have raised with regard to consultation in the City of Swan, I think, is, is worthy of, of some further discussion. Um, but um, this legislation um, intends to replace the two separate planning schemes with the introduction of a new Swan Valley planning scheme. The Swan Valley Planning Committee will be replaced by two separate bodies, um, the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group and the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee, um, with the latter becoming um, the primary decision maker. Now, that is the particular aspect, and as I've mentioned, other members have raised this as well, that has raised some concerns uh, from local residents um, who believe um, that they may well be ignored. Um, uh, with regard to future proposals, particularly um, if it is taken away um, at the very least from a model which includes um, uh, the involvement or primary involvement of, of the City of Swan. Um, so I will certainly be interested very much with regard to the Minister's response um, concerning matters that have been raised by others. Now, importantly though, when we're talking about the, um, the scheme, which, which is, is a key part of this legislation. I do want to reflect back with regard to, again, our, leg our proposed legislation where we had the Swan Valley Development Plan. Now, <clears throat> one issue that I do want to raise is that the former government actually did release a draft Swan Valley Development Plan for public comment, <coughs> and we did so well before the introduction of the bill that I introduced into this um, place. I think it was back in 2005. Now, notwithstanding this, um, the minister, in her usual response to things when she was in opposition, um, she criticised the government. Um, and I think it was the Honourable Yorn Sidmer who um, referred to an article in The Advocate um, back in 2016 when she said, the minister, that was me at the time, the minister is asking for the parliament to support legislation without the details of the development plan being finalised, she said. In a sense, she is asking parliament to sign a blank cheque. That's, that's what the now minister said in opposition with respect to me. Now, I just simply say to the minister for planning, um, Unlike um, the previous government, who actually released a draft plan well before the introduction of a bill in this place, this government, despite the carry-on of the minister when she was in opposition, actually has done the exact opposite. So I absolutely concur with what the Honourable Yorn Sidmer has said with regard to this minister. She can go on all she likes, carry on, say that she's fantastic and wonderful and she's doing this and something else, but the fact is... The fact is, is after having a go at me, when she introduced this legislation in this other place, was that plan, was that draft scheme out for public comment? No, it was not. No, it was not. So don't come into this place and carry on and say, oh, well, we've got it all right now. You don't need to be consulted. That doesn't matter. That's the exact thing that she had a go at me about. Clearly didn't learn. But anyway, um, as I say, the bill was introduced without the draft scheme. The draft scheme 
I want to be very clear on this, was only released on the 14th of October. Now, some one month after the bill had been introduced into this House and after it had passed the lower house. So, so much for consultation. Um, I actually wonder um, if it had not been through questioning by the Honourable Jorn Sibmer and perhaps through questions um, to the minister via her office, I can't speak for that, but I can only imagine the questions were asked, whether it actually would have even been released before the passage of this bill, given um, when the minister was specifically asked by the Honourable Jorn Sibmer as to whether or not she would table the draft scheme, um, I think the question was back in September, I went back and had a look in Hansard, the minister's response was the minister will consider making later drafts of the document public. So she didn't actually give an indication even back in September that she would table um, the, uh, the document. It, she would consider it. I would suggest that was a most inadequate response back then. Um, but anyway, we will, um, we will move forward. I just want to conclude um, my comments because I think it's important that we go um, into the committee stage and ask a couple of questions with regard to the legislation. But you know, as the Honourable Yorn Sibmer has, has indicated, the Liberal Party um, is supportive of the legislation. However, there are concerns um, that have been raised, um, <coughs> particularly as they relate to the scheme, perhaps more so than the bill itself, but with regard to the, the, the draft scheme. Um, and that has been raised by, by other members. Um, as I've said, I have a couple of questions in the committee stage. Um, there are also some concerns around consultation, um, particularly with local residents and the like. Um, and um, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get into committee. But again, I will just make the point that it's taken a very long time for us to be actually now dealing with this legislation. And the minister can no longer blame the former government. No doubt she probably will try to. Um, but she cannot blame the former government because she's actually had an entire term of government to introduce this legislation. Um, despite assurances that she, in her words back in May 2017, that she would prioritise a solution. Um, and in answer to one of my questions back in April 2019, uh, that any legislative change, this is her word, that any legislative change required would be progressed as soon as practicable, this minister has dithered and delayed and continued to create unnecessary uncertainty within the valley. Members, the question is the bill be now read a second time call the Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, uh, Mr uh, Acting President. Uh, can I at the outset thank those uh, honourable members who have made a contribution to this debate this evening. Can I thank the honourable Johan Sibner on behalf of the uh, opposition uh, and for his indication of support for the bill. I thank the honourable Donna Farragher for her comments too. The honourable Tim Clifford for uh, his support of the bill too. Now, I'm not quite sure what the honourable Colin Tinkle is doing uh, after that comment. Right. Okay. So that's what we've, we're, we're on the same page, and I acknowledge the contribution by the honourable Charles Smith, who's indicated, who's indicated he's not supporting the bill, and that's fair enough. Um, I would like to try and uh, address the various issues that have been raised uh, with me during the debate, uh, noting, of course, we are going into, clause, uh, into committee, and, and so there will be an opportunity uh, for honourable members to raise uh, issues that they don't think I've, I've addressed uh, to their satisfaction. If I can start off in terms of uh, the bill uh, and, and how does it compare to the, the previous one. Uh, I mean, in short, uh, the, the Swan Valley Protection Bill 2016 was introduced into Parliament by the former government, which principally proposed a development plan for the Swan Valley region, removed the Swan Valley Planning Committee, uh, and it uh, principally proposed to introduce an improvement plan for the Swan Valley. Uh, this new bill proposes the creation of a new community-based strategic leadership group. It proposes to create a bespoke scheme that recognises that the area is regionally significant and special and therefore assists in the protection of the agriculture activities in the valley and reduce land use conflict. And I note the Honourable Tim Clifford and his contribution acknowledged the importance of the area. Um, uh, the new bill proposes to create a subcommittee of the Western Australian Planning Commission, uh, being the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee, to make planning decisions in the Swan Valley. 
A proposal to create a, a single layer planning framework for the valley, simplifying the current multi layered decision making matrix for the region. Uh, there was a question in relation to the role of the City of Swan. Um, I'm advised the City of Swan supports the outcomes recommended in the Swan Valley Planning Review. Uh, through its input, it remains supportive of deferring its usual planning responsibilities to the State. And the City of Swan and the Swan Valley Planning Committee contribute to multiple layers in Swan Valley Planning, which has led to inconsistent planning decisions and delays in the approval process. So the new planning framework will enable a consistent process that ensures a single decision maker for Swan Valley proposals and a single decision maker uh, will cut red tape. In terms of the consultation, there was questions about how, uh, when and how long was the City, city of Swan consulted. Uh, my advice is, in short, uh, continuously. Uh, so the City of Swan has consistently been informed of advancement of the bill and the planning scheme throughout the entire process uh, undertaken by the Minister and the Government. Uh, it provided written confirmation of its support for the recommendations of the Swan uh, Valley Planning Review. Um, there was a question uh, in relation to the draft planning scheme. And, um, <coughs> in September 2020, the City of Swan was provided with a copy of the draft scheme for comment and input. And the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, uh, I think, is still awaiting a formal response uh, on the draft scheme. Um, I do note, however, that on the, 9th, sorry, on the 18th of November 2020, uh, council resolved to support the draft scheme subject to four modifications. And obviously, of course, we're not here tonight to, to, um, to debate uh, the scheme, uh, but I'll make those points. There was a question about um, the right to farm. The right to farm is a statewide issue that is best addressed by the agricultural portfolio in a consistent and coordinated manner that is applied across the, the entire state. I remember you would realise and appreciate. I am indeed the minister representing the minister tonight, and I am providing the answers. And I am providing the answers uh, to the questions that have been raised with me. Uh, um, so, if I, if I do that again, so the right to farm is a statewide issue that is best addressed by order, the agricultural order, portfolio. Order members, order members. I am listening intently to the minister for the environment. The minister for the environment has the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Acting President. So the right to farm is a statewide issue that is best addressed by the agricultural portfolio in a consistent and coordinated manner that is applied across the entire state. The, the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, through the Department uh, of Agriculture and Food or the Office of Agriculture and Food, is best better placed with its core uh, purpose, legislation, and policy suite to focus on farming matters. Um, and I do note that the, the former government did repeal the Agriculture Protection Board Act 1950 uh, in 2010. Um, why are right to farm measures in the Swan Valley Planning Scheme? The Parliamentary Council's Office encouraged right to farm <coughs> measures to be included in the Swan Valley Planning Scheme rather than the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Uh, how are right to farm measures provided for in the Swan Valley Planning Scheme? Well, for the Swan Valley Planning Framework, the emphasis is placed on new development uh, to demonstrate it will not impact existing or potential agricultural use of rural land. The scheme proposes measures that place the emphasis on new non-rural uses, especially tourism and hospitality, to ensure that they will not impact rural use uh, uh, of other rural land. Um, new proposals must consider and, where necessary, include measures such as design, scale and siting for new non-rural uses to minimise impacts on other rural land. Management plans may be required for non-rural de non development of rural land, so it can demonstrate that the new use is unlikely to impact both existing and potential rural use of rural land, identify potential issues for remediation, and provide for mitigation within the, within the plan. A new non-rural use has the responsibility to fit in with principal rural zoned uses for which Swan Valley land is primarily zoned. If compatibility cannot be demonstrated, the, new, the, sorry, the non rural use may not be suited to the rural zone, thus resulting in a recommendation uh, of refusal uh, for the proposal. There was a question about water, water rights. Um, water licensing measures are not detailed in the draft Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020 to avoid interference with existing water legislation. The Department of Water and Environmental Regulation is considering new water licensing policies for the Swan Valley under the existing. Rights in Water and Irrigation Act 1914. I'm advised uh, these will be released as part of a draft Nangara groundwater allocation plan, which is currently under development. Uh, have, uh, there was a question about uh, 
non-conforming uses. Um, so it's not unusual for development applications to be inconsistent with planning scheme provisions, whether in the Swan Valley or uh, any local government area. An applicant is free to lodge an application for any proposal, whether or not it complies with a planning scheme. However, upon assessment, the proposal is likely to lead to a refusal based on current uh, planning provisions. This situation is addressed through assessment of proposals, with the outcome varying depending on the detail. A proposal may be refused uh, if, it is significant, if it significantly varies from scheme provisions, or it may be approved with conditions addressing the inconsistencies if they are reasonably minor and can be modified uh, for the design or proposal to become compliant with the relevant provisions. Uh, one thing I should emphasise is that once a proposal has an approval, the approval remains valid even if planning provisions change, provided it continues to satisfy any conditions of approval and does not cease to operate for a certain period. This type of development is most often referred to as a non-conforming use, uh, and in the Swan Valley situation, uh, it must not cease for a period of more than six months for the approval to remain valid. Once the time limit has passed, uh, the use no longer has approval and a fresh application satisfying the provisions of the new scheme must be applied for and approved for the use to recommence. The Swan Valley uh, Planning Bill 2020 provides clear guidance on the transition of existing planning provisions to the new Swan Valley Planning Scheme provisions and when the new scheme takes effect any development or subdivision application that has not been resolved under the former scheme, i.e. was lodged before the new scheme came into effect and a decision was not made before the new scheme came into effect, is to be assessed under the new provisions. And I'm told this approach is supported by the State Administrative Tribunal uh, through consultation uh, on the bill. Uh, there was a question about consultation, and I'm advised extensive consultation has occurred uh, with ministers, with state agencies, with local government and community. Public, public consultation uh, obviously occurred on the Swan Valley Planning Review, uh, the Kabelki report uh, and the recommendations and liaison with relevant ministers on cross-portfolio matters occurred. The Parliamentary Council's office recommended consultation with various agencies that has occurred. So as part of the Swan Valley planning review, key groups and individuals were identified and consulted with. They included the Minister for Agriculture and Food, the Minister for Emergency Services, the Minister for Tourism, the Minister for Water, uh, the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, the Department of Communities, Department of Primary Industries and Regional, Deve Regional Development, Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, Racing and Wagering Western Australia, Tourism WA, Perth Airport, City of Swan, community groups, businesses, landowners and residents. And I'm told this process has assisted the advancement of the bill uh, as presented and the draft scheme. Uh, if I can go to um, add the buffer. A uh, number of members um, talked about buffer. Um, uh, I might, I'm not sure I understand that. I might leave that to the uh, to, into committee. I might have to talk me through that a little bit more. Um, um, in relation to zoning, uh, if I can uh, touch on that, so all the properties that are zoned rural residential located to the west of West Swan Road uh, and within the Swan Valley Act 1995 boundary have been zoned as this rural residential since the gazettal of the City of Swan's Local Planning Scheme number 17, which came into effect in February 2008. Prior to this, rural residential was commonly called special rural, uh, which is no longer the preferred uh, nomen nomenclature. Uh, the Honourable uh, Tim Clifford, I think you were uh, after a, um, an indication of, of, of uh, what we thought of your amendments, so I'm happy to state that now. Uh, um, so there are, honourable members would see, a number of uh, amendments on the supplementary notice paper. There's one in the name of the honourable Michael Mission uh, at 10 oblique 2. Uh, I can indicate the government uh, will support that amendment. Uh, the honourable Tim Clifford wants to move an amendment at clause 3. Uh, we're supportive of that. Uh, the honourable Charles Smith wants to move an amendment at clause 10 uh, and to insert clause 13a. Uh, it's not supported. You wouldn't be surprised by that. Uh, the Honourable Tim Clifford uh, seeks to move an amendment to uh, Clause 28 and Clause 33. Uh, we oppose those. Uh, and, uh, you, but you also uh, have uh, uh, moved, um, or you've, you've uh, indicated um, uh, new Clause 41A, uh, which is in relation to that five-year uh, review process, and we're happy to support that one. 
So I think I've answered most things. If I haven't answered it to your satisfaction, honourable members, you will of course get an opportunity to uh, to quiz me again uh, in in committee. And with that, uh, I commend the bill to the house. Honourable members, we are dealing with the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020, and the question before us is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020, second reading. Members, that will take us to committee. Right, members. We are dealing with the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Um, it is uh, uh, there is a supplementary notice paper I bring to your attention. Supplementary to notice paper number 196, issue number two. And the question before the House is that clause one stand as printed. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, there's an issue number four. We've, there's more than <laughs> we have moved. Sorry, there's an issue number four. The question is still that Clause 1 stand is printed. Call Honourable Yorn Sidmer. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Mr. I, um, thank you. I appreciate the, um, the Minister again is uh, in the position of representing the Minister in the other place and um, relies obviously significantly on the advice provided um, by the Minister, her staff and officials. Um, I was paying attention to the answers that uh, the Minister provided to a range of questions and issues raised throughout the course of second reading speeches, um, particularly those concerning um, the uh, status of uh, the so-called right to farm provision. Um, which I think we have now received an answer has confirmed that no such right is enshrined in the bill, uh, despite the fact that the bill has been sold uh, to the Swan Valley uh, community and to the general public in those terms, uh, and that the appropriate um, agency and the, appro uh, the appropriate sort of vote of statutes um, dealing with matters such as that should be strictly within the preserve of the agriculture portfolio and the um, Department of Primary Industry and Regional Development. Uh, I, I think that um, underscores uh, some of the disingenuous uh, communication and uh, attention that this issue has garnered and has been promulgated by the Minister herself. I also note, uh, for the record, uh, responses concerning the broader issue of consultation and that the Minister's uh, response to issues around consultation that have been raised not only by myself but other speakers have focused predominantly on the Swan Valley review process that was undertaken by the late and respected uh, the Honourable Charles uh, Kabelke. But that, John Kabelke, uh, correction, uh, forgive me. Um, that is a completely different issue, completely different issue, from consultation on the composition of this bill and consultation on the scheme. Now, I've provided extensive notes for the benefit of Hansard after I provided my second reading speech. But the Minister's contribution, insofar as consultation, on both the bill 
and on the scheme is contradicted, absolutely definitively contradicted, by the City of Swan. So I need to understand very clearly, and I think the Chamber needs to understand very clearly, who is telling the truth here. Is it the City of Swan, who in an email to me of, of or around the 8th of September quite explicitly said that, number one, they had not been consulted on the bill and had not seen a copy of the draft? Is that correct or is that not correct? Just before your eyes, Minister, I'm just going to correct myself. Um, supplementary notice paper with this bill is number 204, issue number four. Uh, the Minister. Thank you. I'm told the City of Swan have been consulted absolutely at an officer level uh, all throughout the process on the bill as well as the scheme. The Honourable Ewan Simma. Uh, would the Minister kindly advise the dates and times upon which that consultation occurred? Minister. I don't have that information at hand. I'm aware. The Honourable Jorgen Simmer. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Well, um, Minister, are you in a position to elicit that information um, before 9.45 this evening? The Minister. I'm not. The Honourable Jorgen Simmer. Uh, Minister, um, this is not a question but a statement. That is completely unacceptable. Uh, you have been definitive in your answers, representing the Minister for Planning, relying upon the advice of her advisers and her officials. There is a serious conjecture of facts. I received an explicit email from the City of Swan, dated the 8th of September, which said that they had not been consulted on the bill and that they had not seen a copy of the draft scheme. If you are to advise me and this House that those two statements of position from the City of Swan are incorrect, then please provide this chamber with the evidence that contradicts that position, because these are easy questions of fact to answer. I would have anticipated, and indeed I would expect, that that information would be readily at hand. Uh, I think the minister has already answered Thank that you. question. Um, with the greatest respect, honourable member, with the greatest respect, honourable member, the bill we're dealing with before the house—it's it's not normal practice to ask for every single bit of correspondence or every every interaction that the state might have had with an agency. Now, obviously, I'm not sure who you're referring to uh, in terms of that correspondence that you've got from the city of Swan. The City of Swan is a big organisation, and certainly the advice from my advisers and from the Minister's office who are here with me is that consulta consultation did take place with officers at the City of Swan. Now, if, if somebody in the food chain wasn't aware, certainly other people were, and that's, that's the point I'll make. Um, consultation did occur, uh, and that's my advice. Question is clause one, stand as printed. The Honourable Yorn Sidmer. Um, Minister, I, I'm not likely to make uh, acceptable progress as far as I'm concerned with response to eliciting a satisfactory answer on that particular issue. Suffice to say that I, I, I find it enormously concerning that at this late stage of the parliamentary term and uh, taking 
a charitable view of the legislative priorities that the government intends to bring before their, this House. That appropriate preparation or anticipation of very basic questions has certainly not been undertaken, particularly on an issue uh, that the current minister, when opposition spokesman in relation to these portfolio matters, and to the degree that she has reflected upon her previous statements while in her present role, has made almost a virtue of the necessity of consultation. I, I'm asking two very basic questions. The time and the date of consultation between the department and the city of Swan on the construction of this bill and the presentation of the draft scheme. Because I have read in from the most senior administrative level of that local government authority a declarative statement that says they were not consulted. Yet in your second reading speech reply, you have said that they were consulted. I am not doubting what you have said. I'm just inviting you to provide the evidence which substantiates your claim, because the City of Swan has provided me with the evidence that substantiates their position, because I can time and date stamp that correspondence that occurred three months ago. That's all I'm asking for. Are you seriously advising me right now that you don't have it within your gift to provide me with that fundamental information? Um, now, that is the same question th that has been asked previously. The minister, if the minister chooses not to answer it, I will uh, e end, end the questions uh, of that particular nature and seek other questions on the set first of Clause 1. Uh, the Honourable Yorn Sidmer. I, I will ask a related question, which, but is a different question, and perhaps the minister is in a position to answer this. <coughs> Could the minister advise the nature of that consultation? The Minister. Thank you. Look, I'm told uh, officers from the department uh, presented the information at the Swan Valley Planning Committee, but also uh, two officers of the City of Swan uh, over the past six months. I'm further advised, particularly in relation to the draft scheme, particularly the only date I've got is that uh, 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 information was sent to an officer, uh, a director at the City of Swan, on the 7th of September, so around the same date as the information that, that you've got uh, says uh, people weren't told about this stuff. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Can I just get some clarification? Because this is the first time we've actually now heard that information was provided to the Swan Valley Planning Committee, which is not the City of Swan. Um, so I, I just want to get some clarification here. We've previously been hearing that the consultation, um, an extensive consultation, occurred with the City of Swan, and now I'm hearing that maybe it might, something might have been sent to a planning office or an officer of the city, and I'm not suggesting that that has not occurred. But I think we need some absolute clarity here, because now we've brought into the remit of consultation being the Swan Valley Planning Committee. Your Minister said two things, so obviously we weren't listening. I said officers, uh, officers at the City of Swan have been uh, briefed over the past eight months. Further, I said that uh, briefing has taken place at the Swan Valley Planning Committee, at which officers of the City of Swan attend 
And then I'd further uh, uh, spoken about um, uh, the draft scheme being emailed to appropriate directors at the City of Swan on the 7th of September. Now, I have seen evidence of that email uh, being sent to a director at the City of Swan. So while I don't have a list of every bit of consultation uh, or indeed conversation that happened between the department and the City of Swan uh, over the past few months, I can provide that information. The Honourable Yorn Sibmer. Um, so, Minister, I, I, I ask a question of fact relating to consultation, I, and I, I'll just express, uh, uh, firstly, my surprise, and secondly, my concern that lip service seems to have been paid to consultation in respect of the devising even of this bill, and I'll leave the scheme aside for the moment. And when we ask some reasonably straightforward questions around consultation um, with the greatest of respect. The issue has been given some lip service. When I think about consultation, and everybody has their own uh, construction of the term, but if I am to understand uh, your advice to this chamber minister, it's effectively this that a Administ administrative staff, unnamed, uh, quite aside from people on the, um, the, the Swan Valley Planning Committee, but we'll just deal with the administrative staff at the City of Swan, received a copy of the bill on the 7th of September. Oh, sorry, Minister, thank you. When did they receive a copy of the bill? Minister. I've said to you, so I'm actually going to finish this line of questioning now. I've told you I don't have those dates or that information before us, and I'm not likely to have it this evening, and it would take an inordinate amount of time to go through the records. So we can get into this he said, she said. I've seen evidence of the draft bill being sent to an officer, the draft scheme being sent to an officer on the 7th of September. You have a view about consultation, say it's not enough. I think you've put it on the record. That's fine. My advisor tell me consultation happened. So I think that's probably the last time I'll kind of deal with that issue. The Honourable Yorn Sibma. Um, well, potentially, but Minister, do you have or have you cited evidence of the bill being consulted with the City of Swan through whatever means of transmittal or correspondence? And could you advise when that occurred? I think the minister has already answered that question and said no. Um, I might do that, minister, so that um, you don't need to. I call the honourable Michael Mission. That uh, the minister has answered that same question now several times. I've heard the question answered, not in the way perhaps the members want, uh, but it has been answered all the same. The honourable Michael Mission. Well, I, I, I just seek to have some clarity on this because. Uh my idea of consultation is involving a, an exchange of ideas and uh, you know, saying I'd like to have your input on something and to receive that input. You said that there has been consultation at an officer level, at some undefined level of an officer at the city of Swan. Has there been formal correspondence sent to the mayor, for example, of the city saying, this is what we plan to do, can we have the city's view on this? Uh, I think we're in the realms of the same question again. And honourable members, we are going to have to get to a point where the minister has given the response that he has given. Uh, you may want to do a member statement later on and uh, rail against it, but at this point, it will need to be a new line of questioning. The honourable Donna Farragher. I'm going to just raise one matter here. If, if I could ask the minister, and this is asked in good faith, and I appreciate we want to move forward, um, will, and I appreciate that right now that the minister's advisers who are with him quite clearly will not be able to go back and check their records because they are here in the chamber and not at their offices. But is the minister willing to undertake to um, provide members certainly here, even after the bill has been debated, with regard to the, um, the dates to which the bill was provided to the City of Swan. 
that would, I think that's a simple request uh, as to whether or not he will give that undertaking and then I think we might be able to move forward. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fair question that's been asked. Um, appreciate that he would not be able to provide it right now, but at a, at a later date, when his officers have had the opportunity to review um, their emails, um, that he would provide that to the House, which I know the Minister has undertaken to on other bills. Uh, that is a different question. I'll allow that one. The Minister. It is. And as you know, I, I do aim to, to, aim to please. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to ask the Minister uh, if it's possible for that <laughs> exercise to take place and for me to be able to provide it. If not, uh, before we rise on Thursday, certainly behind the chair and out of, out of this process, but I'm happy to, to make that request. The Honourable Colin Tentnell. Um, just wanted to ask you, do, can you understand the concerns of um, residents of the Swan Valley and also um, uh, that district all about um, the way the uh, st strategic leadership group and also the Swan Valley statutory planning <coughs> committee has been formed and what input the residents had in the making of that group. Um, and what I'm trying to say here is they have some concerns because they haven't been consulted and they haven't been involved in the process. So can you understand why I keep bringing that up and what's the answer to that? The Minister. First of all, it's not appropriate to ask me my opinion or, or view or if I understand what the community is feeling. I it's not, not my issue. Uh, in, in relation to the forming uh, of those groups, they haven't been formed. What this bill does before us now is allow, it allows a head power to enable us to form, uh, to form that lead strategic leadership group uh, and also the, what's the second one called? The statutory planning committee. So that they haven't not been formed yet. Now, obviously, if this bill passes, uh, further work needs to take place before such groups are actually formed. The Honourable Colin Tignall. The, 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 the planning of those groups and the structure of those groups has been formed. And um, they... Um, so if this bill passes the place, it will allow them to be formed. But it hasn't been formed yet. It's still an idea, a concept, until it passes this place. The problem, the problem we face with that is you're asking... You're, going to, you're saying you're going to consult with people after the bill's passed. That's why I wasn't sure whether I was going to support this bill or not. The cons consultancy should be done beforehand. No. Uh, is that a question that you? Is there a question in that, honourable member? I just um, I'm asking the minister um, why wasn't that consultancy done beforehand? Why wait till the bill is passed and then go and consult? I think the minister has answered that particular question, member. Members, the question is that Clause 1 standards printed. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, my question, and I apologise if the Minister did refer to this in his summing up, so I, but I will ask it um, again. And I did uh, seek some advice from um, his advisers prior to the debate on the bill. It relates to a particular section of Henley Brook, and I know we're maybe straying a little bit, but I, I do seek some clarification. Um, with regard to whether or not there has actually been a change in zoning uh, for a particular section of, of Henley Brook, it has been put to me, and um, I'm, I, I do just want to seek some clarity here, that there has been a change from special rural to rural residential. Now, my checking um, is that perhaps that hasn't been the case, certainly since the scheme has uh, scheme number 17 has been in place. But perhaps, Minister, I think there has been some concern raised within the community in, rela in relation to this issue. So I would appreciate your clear advice in relation to it. The Minister, Mr. Deputy Chairman, uh, I, I did, Honourable Member, uh, actually refer to this in my summing up, and that's okay. I'm happy to say it again. Uh, and so your understanding is correct. Uh, all, the pro all the properties that are zoned rural residential located to the west of West Swan Road and within the Swan Valley Act 1995 boundary have been zoned as uh, rural residential since the gazettal of the City of Swan's local planning scheme number 17, which came into effect in February 2008. Um, prior to this, rural residential was commonly called special rural, uh, which is no longer the preferred nomenclature, as I'm advised. 
The Honourable Donna Farragut. Appreciate that. I will say that um, I have received, I have got a copy of a of a rates notice where special rule was mentioned, but it does precede um, 2008. So I, I do appreciate the minister's clarification on that point. The honourable Yawn Sidmer. Um, minister, thank you. I, I just seek again just understanding of the um, the genesis of the bill, and this is a, a, a kind of question where. Uh, government members sometimes um, feel charitable and tell me the dates, and sometimes they don't, but I'm going to chance my arm because that's my job. Uh, can I ask, with respect to the drafting of this particular bill, when Cabinet gave permission to print, around what date did that occur? The Minister. Uh, look, I can advise that uh, Cabinet uh, approved the printing uh, of the bill. Uh, according to my notes, it says the 10th of August 2020. The Honourable Yawn Sidma. Thank you, Minister. That, that pretty much exhausts um, my questions with respect to the timing and um, engagement with respect to the construction. Uh, of the bill uh, in front of the House. Um, Minister, my um, questions now really with respect to Clause 1, because I think that's the most appropriate uh, position for them, actually concern uh, aspects of the scheme. And while I, um, I certainly acknowledge um, the content of the scheme is obviously and cannot be included uh, within the content of the draft bill, ahead of us, that the purpose of this uh, bill is by and large to um, create and to provide the head power uh, for the creation of the scheme. Uh, I have some, um, uh, my first fundamental question, I suppose, with respect to this scheme, which I reinforce um, currently has a draft status and uh, has not been uh, either approved yet by the Minister nor gazetted. Uh, but my question is, um, was any economic analysis of the impact of this scheme uh, undertaken? And if so, uh, who undertook that assessment and when? Minister. Thank you. Not that I'm aware of, honourable member. Members, the question is that clause one stand is printed. The Honourable Yon Simba. Uh, thank you. Um, Minister, then, would the government be in any position at all to make an informed observation about whether or not this scheme, uh, particularly as it pertains to um, the implementation of specific zonings and the attendant uh, permissible land uses, whether or not that has the effect of either improving or undermining existing land values within the Swan Valley, or whether or not there is a net neutral effect because I actually think that these are material concerns as to the practical implications of the gazettal of this scheme. Is the, is the minister in any position to advise on those particular issues? And if he's not able to uh, provide a view 
across the whole scheme area, would he be able to put to this house the impacts of this scheme on the land values of those lots included in the proposed priority agriculture area? The Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, Honourable Member, if I can just reiterate that the scheme uh, is in fact a draft scheme at the moment. Uh, it's out for public consultation. It's out for consultation at the moment. So we're not in a position to say what the effects may or may not be of it. But presumably, uh, during the consultation process, if there are concerns raised uh, in relation to those issues that you have raised, uh, they would be addressed as part of the consultation process. Uh, thank you, Minister. And I, and I think, from the record. Um, that that consultation process has um, officially closed, and it closed on the 14th of November. Um, but I might get to just the implications and the likely flow-ons um, subsequent to that. Minister, though, could I could I ask a technical question as it relates to the scheme? And I acknowledge the um, the minister's generosity in asking questions about this particular instrument, which is actually not a feature of the bill itself, but is. Um, empowered and given legitimacy by the um, prospective passage of this bill. Uh, can I understand what ground assessment or economic assessment or justification um, there is to differentiate uh, priority agriculture zonings from Swan Valley rural zonings? I, I just don't understand how that particular determination has been made, and I ask because I think there is a uh, particular set of peculiar material effects uh, that are given life to as a consequence of that differentiation. The Minister. Thank you. So I'm told, Honourable Member, that the pro priority agriculture uh, areas have been identified uh, as a result of deep herd mapping that I understand took place in 2014. And it's essentially those, those areas that already have viticulture and the like happening now. The Honourable Yawn Sibley. Uh, look, uh, th th thank you, Minister. I, I actually think, with respect to the application of the scheme, um, uh, the dated nature of that might actually prove problematic, um, but that's that's an observation, certainly not a question. I, I only intend to actually ask one more question with respect to the application of the uh, permissible uh, uses uh, table attendant to the scheme, if the minister has that uh, to hand. I, I, I would just like to understand very basically um, this scenario, and it is this. If I owned a winery within the priority agriculture zone, would I be able to develop a bespoke accommodation development on my site or undertake some specialty retail of a food or beverage nature as well, or would I be prohibited from undertaking that kind of development 
under the auspices of this proposed scheme. The That's on short answer, on member. Yes, they could do those things. Oh. Members, the question is that clause one standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question now is that clause two standards printed. Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. And uh, my only contribution with respect to the debate on clause two is to move the amendment standing in my name on. Uh, supplementary notice paper number 204, issue number 4, at serial 10 oblique 2, which is to insert on page 3 of the bill, after line 7, uh, the passage that is set out in the supplementary notice paper. The purpose of it is uh, to be consistent with other amendments made by this House in respect of the licence given to the executive, uh, as it were, to, for the passage of the bill and that uh, if the bill does not come into operation within 10 years of receiving royal assent, that the, the uh, bill will stand repealed. Uh, the other provisions in clause two, in sub clause one and two, uh, all turn on different parts of the act coming into operation before or after a date fixed by proclamation. So on my understanding of it, a clause of this character, if accepted by the House, uh, would mean that if there is no date fixed for the proclamation of the bill within 10 years, the entire act will stand uh, repealed. And I note that uh, in clause two, sub clause one paragraph E, uh, apart from the, the certain uh, previous provisions, uh, it is not a question of different parts of the Act coming into operation at different dates proclaimed, but the balance of the Act coming into operation on a particular day fixed by proclamation. So I understand with discussions behind the Chair that the Minister is, uh, uh, agree, is not uh, adverse to the inclusion, and so I move the amendment standing in my name. Members, uh, the Honourable Michael Mission has moved the amendment standing in his name at 10 oblique 2, page 3, after line 7 to insert um, subparagraph 3. However, if no day is fixed under subsection 1e before the end of the period of 10 years beginning on a set day, this Act is repealed on the day after that period ends. And the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. As indicated, I will move my motion. Support Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, so those words are now inserted. And the question is that clause two as amended standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Members, the question is that clause three stand as printed. The Honourable Tim Clifford. Uh, thank you, um, Madam uh, Chair. Deputy Chair. My apologies. Um, as uh, I've indicated on notice on supplementary notice paper number two hundred four, uh, issue number four on. Uh, I'm looking at moving in an amendment on uh, serial four oblique three, and that's on page f page five. And from what I understand, the government 
um, the Minister has indicated that they will be supporting this clause. So I'd just like to move the amendment standing in my name. Uh, members, the Honourable Tim Clifford has moved the amendment standing in his name at 4 oblique 3, page 5, after line 4, to insert um, definition of Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee means that the committee established under section 33.1. And the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Minister. Thanks very much, Madam Deputy Chair. So, as indicated by the Honourable Tim Clifford, we are supportive of this amendment. Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that clause three as amended stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, could members indicate if you'd like to talk to um, a clause before clause 10? Members, the question is that clause four stand is printed. Those of that opinion say Aye. Aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that clause five stand as printed. The Honourable Yorn Sib. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, Minister, uh, I have a broad question um, concerning um, the objects of the Act as outlined at serials, uh, subsection one, serials, uh, subserials A through K, uh, and it relates to a, a question I put. Um, during my second reading speech, which I don't think the minister was in a position to reply to when he gave his reply. Um, could I understand whether or not there have been any uh, developments uh, approved to proceed within the Swan Valley, within the area um, um, of land uh, contemplated by the Swan Valley Planning Bill and the uh, subsequent draft planning scheme? that have been approved in the last four years, which would be inconsistent with any of the objects of the Act uh, outlined at um, uh, Clause 5, subsection 1, serials A through K. And if so, uh, could you please provide the details? We don't know. Um, it's, I'm told it's not possible to provide an answer to that. Uh, some of the, the approvals might have been given by the City of Swan, and so we don't, we don't frankly know. Members, the question is that clause five standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Could members please indicate if you'd like to speak before clause 10? Members, the question is that clauses seven through to nine standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that clause 10 standards printed. The Honourable Charles Smith. Madam uh, uh, Chair, this particular clause depends upon new clause, clause 13A, so if the House finds that acceptable, we'll move to that after 13A is debated. Um, can I just clarify, is the member asking to defer consideration of clause 10 to after consideration of clause 13? Correct. Okay. Members, um, the, uh, the Honourable Charles Smith has um, moved that we postpone consideration of clause 10 until after consideration of clause. Uh, make sure we have to new, new, new clause 13A. New clause 13A. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, that means we now move on to clause um, 11. Do members want to speak to any clause before clause 13? Hey. No, so I'm going to move that clauses 11 through to 13 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question now is that clause 13A stand as printed. No. So, no. So, clause 13A be inserted. Be, be inserted. The Honourable Charles Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Chair. Madam Acting Chair, members. Um, I have previously um, looked to introduce a certain level of third party rights in relation to development applications and approvals, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do here in this particular new clause, which details um, how projects are advertised to the general public and where they can be advertised. And in addition, it details how a third party right can be followed through the State Administrative Tribunal for review and so on. Madam Deputy Chair, 
members will recall we recently debated a motion regarding third party appeal rights. I won't propose to go through all those details once again. Everybody is aware of how that system operates. So really, Madam Acting Chair, I'd like to go straight to the vote and move new clause 13A. Members, the Honourable Charles Smith <coughs> has moved uh, the amendment uh, standing in his name at 9 oblique NC 13A um, at page 11 after line 28 to insert a new clause 13A titled third party rights in relation to development applications and approvals. It's a fairly long amendment. I don't <laughs> intend on reading it in. Um, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Minister. Thanks very much, Deputy Chair. So can I indicate the government is strongly uh, opposed to this amendment? Obviously, we had a similar debate uh, when we dealt with the Planning and Development Act uh, some time ago, uh, and obviously the honourable uh, member is seeking to introduce third-party appeal rights. So essentially, a third party could bring an application in the State Administrative Tribunal to challenge the decision of the Swan Valley Planning Commission uh, to approve development under the Swan Valley Planning Scheme. Um, Third-party appeal rights have never been a feature of the WA planning system, and there's been a con consistent, indeed historic and bipartisan, uh, approach to opposing third-party appeal rights uh, in relation to, uh, to the planning system. Uh, planning ministers on all sides uh, have consistently noted the concerns that third-party appeal rights would be adding unnecessary complexity and red tape to the planning framework at a time when the state government is actually seeking a better and, more, and, and a simpler system. There's also concerns about costly and vexatious proceedings, and third-party appeals can lead uh, to the very worst type of uh, not-in-my-backyard behaviour. Now, in other jurisdictions um, where third-party appeal rights exist, there are usually other checks and balances in place that provide costly and vexatious proceedings from occurring, and that's not the case uh, in the bill before us. So, um, so much as I have sympathy, uh, for ensuring that um, we do have community participation in, in the planning system. I, I don't support, and neither does the government support, the amendment. Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Honourable Jorn Sipner. Uh, yes, thank you. Very briefly, I, I acknowledge um, uh, the Honourable Charles Smith, uh, Smith's consistency uh, in respect of, uh, of this particular issue. Um, one might debate the, the merits of, of the concept. Uh, my view would be that um, this bill uh, is the wrong place for the insertion uh, of that particular right, and, and I do so for two reasons. Number one, I think it, if it was to be the will of the House to include something like that, it is best placed within the Planning and Development Act and, and apply uh, to specified um, classes of development. Uh, in a way which is understood and, and well foreshadowed. Uh, we do have an issue, and I, and I want to just re rely on that as well. As I've, I've lauded the, the members' consistency on this issue. I want to use the opportunity to, if I, if I can, laud my own, uh, and that is that uh, this, this bill, but the scheme itself, deals not with necessarily specific development proposals, but with orderly land use planning in a particularly defined area. And uh, while it has been uh, this present government's focus to concentrate on expediting uh, development applications as they pertain specifically to the built form application uh, and has indicated a willingness uh, to uh, rationalise the approvals process as it relates to those, uh, I remain a little bit aghast at the lack of um, lack of reform when it comes to uh, rationalising longer leading land use planning uh, approvals processes. There, this is a significant encumbrance on investment, uh, on development and on job creation, and it doesn't actually serve any particular community interest at all. Uh, my other point would be that, uh, as I outlined in my uh, second reading speech, I also remain aghast uh, that the government has not prioritised uh, at a legislative level uh, improvements to consultation with the community, which apply broadly across the entire planning framework. I think that if we're going to make positive changes, uh, we deal with the systemic issues. Um, 
this to me is, um, is com uh, completely understandable. I appreciate it, but it's not the particular place to do it. Uh, and as a consequence, um, uh, I cannot support. Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Does that opinion say aye? Aye. Those to the contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. Uh, members, we now move back to clause 10, uh, which was postponed. And the question is that clause 10 stand as printed. Uh, the Honourable Charles Smith, I take it you're not intending to move your amendment? So, members, the question is that clause 10 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Would members please indicate if you'd like to speak to a clause before clause 28? Um, if not, uh, members, I move that clauses 14 through to 27 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question now is that clause 28 stand as printed. The Honourable Tim Cook. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, I move, uh, move, uh, move, the, um, move the amendment standing my name, uh, serial five at oblique 28. And by way of explanation, um, the bill as it stands can allow members to sit on both the minister's advisory body, that is the strategic leadership group, and the development assessment body, which is the stat statutory planning committee which um, uh, the Greens believe that uh, poses uh, risks of undue influence and conflicts of interest. Um, um, to me, it makes sense that we uh, separate the two and to have the same people uh, and the same representatives on those two bodies um, uh, increases the risk um, for those uh, things to happen. Members, the Honourable Tim Clifford has moved the amendment standing in his name at 5 oblique 28, page 21, after line. 15 to insert a new 3A. A person who is a member of the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee cannot be appointed under subsection 2. And the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Minister. Thanks, Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, can I indicate um, the government is not supportive uh, of, uh, of your amendment? Uh, and I'm going to speak, uh, Madam Deputy Chair, to the amendment that stands at uh, 5 oblique 28 and the amendment that stands at 6 oblique 33. Uh, so I'll speak to both at the same time. We, we, we don't support either. Um, so the, the amendment to clause 28 um, proposes that a person who is a member of the Swan Valley Planning Statutory Planning Committee cannot be appointed to be a member of the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group. And then the amendment to clause 33 proposes that a person who is a member of the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group cannot be appointed to be a member of the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee. Um, these amendments are not supported because, depending on the nominations received for the Swan Valley Leadership Group and the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee, it might be uh, advantageous to have one representative on both for continuity. Uh, and it may not be expedient to curtail this by simply disallowing this. Um, it should be noted that because of the proposed composition of each of the Swan Valley Leadership Group and the Swan Valley, Valley Statutory Planning Committee, they will not uh, in practice be much duplication of persons appointed to each of the leadership group and the statutory planning committee. Uh, but should this happen, uh, it may well facilitate the smooth operation of the functions of these bodies. And so for those reasons, uh, we oppose the amendments. The Honourable Yorn Sigma. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I, I want to uh, first commend uh, the Honourable Tim Clifford uh, for identifying this issue of governance, and I also want to commend uh, the Minister for his clarity uh, of response. Um, I actually think, uh, colleagues, that the Honourable Tim Clifford has identified an important issue. Um, the creation of the uh, Swan Valley um, Leadership Group, which is dealt with uh, at the subsequent Amendment at the notice paper, uh, more explicitly at 6 oblique 33. In my reading, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Minister, effectively is an, is an advocacy group which has received government support and endorsement and whose role is essentially to speak to the strategic issues uh, facing uh, land uses currently and prospectively 
within the subject area. Uh, the role and function of the Swan Valley Statutory Planning Committee is a completely different function. Uh, what I would hope uh, that the government would be minded to avoid is the potential for the appearance or the actuality of a conflict of interest in the membership of these composite bodies, where effectively you have a member of the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group, and that is likely to be a person uh, appointed, hand-picked by the minister themselves, advocating for a particular economic or business or sectoral or political advantage within a statutory decision-making body. And I consider that to be an obvious risk and one uh, that should be avoided. And I really kick myself for not spotting it before the Honourable Tim Clifford did. Because if he didn't put it on the notice paper, I absolutely positively guarantee you that I would have. Which is the short way of saying, I'm going to support, and the Liberal Party as a consequence will support, uh, the amendment moved by the Honourable Tim Clifford at 5 oblique 28 and the subsequent one at 6 oblique 33. <coughs> Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those to the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division called, ring the bells. Story. Yeah. Okay, so don't see that. Yeah. Okay. So so yeah. um, Lock the doors. Yeah. Members, we're in division on a uh, amendment moved by the Honourable Tim Clifford at 5 of Leak 28. And the question is to e, um, that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those voting with the eyes will move to the right of the chair. Those voting with the nose will move to the left of the chair. I appoint the Hon Honourable Alison Zamon, teller for the eyes, and the Honourable Pierre Yang, teller for the nose. And before the tellers tell, I cast my vote with the nose. So, Oh, yes. Okay, there you go. Okay, so, so Robin Scott. Holt, to go to Sir Aldridge, Jim Ryan. Okay, where's Simon and Brian? No, Simon's paired. Paired. Simon's paired. And Colin Holt's paired? Yeah, don't you can see that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we're fair.
Members, the result of the division are noes 10, ayes 17, so the words will be inserted. Would members please resume your seats? Members, um, would you please indicate if you'd like to speak to any clause before clause 33? Members, uh, the question is that clauses 29 through to 32 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question now is that clause 33 stand as printed. The Honourable Tim Clifford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, I'm uh, I move the amendment at serial 6 oblique 33 uh, be moved in my way uh, in my name and by way of um, ex explanation just just it just suits the other clause as well it's continuing okay members the honorable Tim Clifford has moved the amendment standing in his name at 6 oblique 33 page 24 after line 29 to insert new subparagraph 4 a person who is a member of the Swan Valley Strategic Leadership Group cannot be appointed under subsection 2, B, C or D. And the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The Minister. The Honourable Yawn, the Sigma. Thank you very much. Um, Madam uh, Deputy Chair, um, obviously consistent with my earlier remarks and um, axiomatically consistent with the um, the will of the House as it relates to the, um, the passage of uh, Amendment uh, 5 serial, uh, sorry, oblique 28, uh, I think really for consistency's sake we have no other option. Uh, uh, and it is a good option at that too to, um, to pass uh, the amendment at uh, 6 oblique 33. So we will be supporting it. Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, members, uh, could you please indicate if you'd like? Uh, so, sorry, members, a quick. Mm, well. Okay, I'm sorry, members. Um, I now need to move that clause 33 as amended, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And members, I now need to go back to 28 because I forgot to put the clause as amended. So the question is that clause 28 as amended stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you for your forbearance. Does any member want to speak to any clause before clause 41? No, I'll put the question that clauses 34 through to clause 41. Stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And we're now dealing with a proposed new clause 41A. The Honourable Tim Clifford. Uh, Deputy Chair, uh, I move that the amendment, uh, the new amendment, clause 41A, uh, be uh, moved uh, in my name and by way of explanation. Um, as I mentioned in my second reading speech, um, the importance of um, allowing for a review of the Act, I think it's, it's important. Um, and, uh, and for what I understand, the government indicated that they support it. So, uh, Members, the Honourable Tim Clifford has moved the amendment, um, sorry, moved to insert a new clause 41, um, page 30 after line 17. Um, it's a review of the Act provision. I don't intend on reading um, the whole proposed. Is that what I? Is that a proposed new clause 41A? And the, and the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. The minister. As I've previously indicated to the honourable member behind the chair, uh, we will support this. It seems to be an eminently sensible uh, amendment. Members, the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. 
Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Would members indicate if there are any other clauses that they would like to speak to? Okay, members, I move that clauses 42 through to clause 148. Stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Should you Members, I move that Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And I now move that this shall be the title of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. Um, members, um, I've been asked to uh, report uh, progress to the House. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, if the advisers could please leave the chamber. Madam uh, President, the Committee of the Whole has considered the Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020, has made amendments and has adopted the bill as amended. Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President. I move that consideration of the report of the Committee of the Whole House be made in order of the day for the next sitting of the House. Members, the question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Sorry. Oh. My apologies. The question is that uh, the report be made in order of the day for the next day's sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we now move to order of the day 12, Birth, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Change of Name Bill 2018. And the question is the bill be read a second time. Okay, thank you. The Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. Um, so it has been a while uh, since this was last before us, but I am uh, providing uh, my second reading reply uh, for those uh, members who are interested in that. Can I thank members for their uh, support uh, of the bill? And I am going to take a few minutes to go through the issues uh, that were raised by the Honourable Michael Mission, the Honourable Nick Oran, uh, and the Honourable Alison Zamon. Um, so the first uh, issue raised was by the Honourable Michael Mission, which went to the limited provisions in the existing Act for a registrar to decline a change of name. Uh, the powers and discretion to do so were also limited. So the current Beth Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Act uh, at section 34 limits the registrar's ability to refuse a change of name application to only where the applicant is unable to prove their identity and age. Um, it's found that the change of name may be sought for fraudulent or other improper purposes, or if as a result of the change, the new name would become a prohibited name as defined at section four. These limitations do not allow the registrar to take account of matters such as possible avoidance of debts pending criminal charges or preventing the person being located by relevant agencies or bodies under any lawful requirement. Um, the Honourable Member also raised an issue around there currently being no limit uh, on the number of times a person can change 
uh, their name. And that is correct as it relates to the total number of changes of name in a lifetime. However, the registry maintains an operational policy of only allowing one change of name in a 12-month period. This is notwithstanding the registrar's existing discretion to approve a change of name for a number of reasons, including for the protection of family and domestic violence vi victims. Um, the honourable member raised the issue around the current system uh, presents risks to the identity regime um, on which we rely, including in relation uh, to terrorist activity. The Current Births, Deaths and uh, Marriages Registration Act has limitations relating to the change of name. There are also differences and gaps within the WA legislation and other states and territories legislation. So currently there are no legislated restrictions in WA on how many times a person can change their name, how often and where. And whilst the operational policy that I just referred to does provide some guidance, um, this is open to challenge. And further, the current Act limits registrar's ability to share change of name information with appropriate bodies, and this allows opportunities for um, criminals, organised crime bodies, and those who may engage in terrorist act, uh, activities greater ability to create multiple identities and move seamlessly across state and territory borders and to avoid detection uh, by law enforcement agencies. This was also highlighted as a concern in the Lind uh, siege report. This bill improves the change of name practice through national consistency to minimise exploitation of the current systems for fraudulent or other criminal activities and is critical to supporting security outcomes under the National Identity Security Strategy. Uh, the member uh, also made comment on uh, various uh, offender management and community safety uh, regimes, uh, including violent offenders, restraining and family violence orders and the need for supervisory and enforcement agencies to keep track of and maintain oversight of their activities. So this bill reflects the regime in place for offenders subject to the Community Protect Protection Offender Reporting Act and requires that a prisoner, a person subject to a continuing detention or supervision order, or otherwise under the supervision of the agency administering the prison's high-risk uh, serious offenders, sentencing, sentence administration and young offenders act, Acts must first seek approval from the relevant supervisory authority before applying for a change of name. Dependent on under uh, which order the offender is subject to, the authority may be the CEO, the Prisoner Review Board or Supervised Release Board. Um, there are a number of uh, consequential uh, amendments the honourable member raised, uh, which will be required um, given the uh, passage of uh, the High Risk Serious Offenders Act. 2020. Uh, they are on the supplementary notice paper. Um, I'll also indicate while I'm talking about the supplementary notice paper, the government will not oppose the amendments uh, that are on the supplementary notice paper uh, from the opposition. Um, in respect to the honourable member's comments about restrictions introduced by the bill, um, a person has to be born in Western Australia to apply for a change of name in, in WA. If they were born uh, interstate, they'll need to apply in their state of birth. A person, if born overseas, has to be a permanent resident or citizen and have been a resident of WA for 12 months. A maximum of three changes of name in a lifetime, not counting uh, changes following uh, marriage or divorce. A maximum of one change of name uh, within a 12-month period. Um, those points are consistent with what is applied in the majority of other Australian jurisdictions and reflect the current policies at the WA Registry. Uh, it is noted there is currently no restriction on the number of changes uh, in uh, a name, no, number of changes in a lifetime. However, the majority of other states have already implemented the three in a lifetime restriction, either by uh, re legislation or policy. The registrar's discretion across all new limits is maintained to account for extreme or extenuating circumstances. Um, the honourable member also referred to restricted persons and the controls uh, imposed upon them. So supervised offenders are subject to various requirements uh, and conditions uh, of their uh, orders which they are uh, required to comply with. 
There are consequences should offenders fail to comply with those requirements, and the bill imposes an additional restriction on them in regard to making an application uh, to change their name. The bill provides for significant penalties for offenders who apply for a change of name without approval uh, from the relevant uh, supervisory authority. If I turn to the comments made by the Hon. Uh, Alison Zamon, um, the hon. Member went through the history um, of uh, reforms. So, in 1992, the then Standing Committee of Attorneys General (SCAG) um, established a consultancy to investigate greater national uh, cooperation in births, deaths, and marriages registry services. And that consultant's final report, entitled Project Link, uh, which was delivered in October 1993, recommended a long-term strategy to progressively coordinate. Uh, registry services for births, deaths and marriages across all states and territories. A number of the initiatives in Project Link included the introduction of security, um, security paper common to all registries and common, common access policies and practices, which are still in place today. To further support the notion of nationwide consistency, Drafting instructions to provide a model bill across all jurisdictions were approved by SCAG on 18 February 1994 for referral to the Parliamentary Council's Committee. The Parliamentary Council's Committee, in turn, asked the South Australian Parliamentary Council to carry out the task. On 28 August 1995, the then WA Cabinet approved the drafting of the bill, which became the current Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Act 1998. The 2003 model that the Hon. Alison Zamon referred to is in fact this Act, noting the comment uh, relates to Queensland being the last state uh, to opt in in part. The 2007 Intergovernmental Agreement to a National Identity Security Strategy was developed after the Council of Australian Governments COAG, agreed in 2005. Uh, that the preservation and protection of a person's identity is a key concern and a right uh, of all Australians. The strategy initially took the form of an intergovernmental agreement that was signed by the heads of Australia's uh, Commonwealth, State and Territory Governments uh, in April 2007 and includes measures such as to enhance identity verification and security standards for key evidence of identity documents, integrity of data in identity records. These measures were further detailed in the 2007 report to COAG uh, on the elements of the National Identity Security Strategy. WA registry involvement in the National Identity Security Strategy is ongoing and includes the ongoing use and participation in the National Document Verification Service and the development and implementation of several uh, proof of identity security guidelines and standards which meet the national proof of identity guidelines. The honourable member also touched on the Lint siege and the subsequent response from governments, not just uh, New South Wales where that occurred, uh, but across Australia. Uh, the joint Commonwealth and New South Wales government in report into the Lint siege recommended, amongst other things, that state and territory registries implement change of name process improvements and better information sharing between government agencies. The report also recommended greater use of the national identity proofing guidelines and the national document verification service to authenticate identity and the strengthening of arrangements for sharing formal change of name information between Commonwealth uh, and state bodies. The bill addresses these recommendations by bringing WA into line with the majority of other states and territories with change of name application requirements. The bill further allows the register, registrar to continue to participate in name-based identity checks uh, using the document verification service and also in its role as an issuer of identity-based documents such as a change of name certificate, birth, death and marriage certificates. And lastly, the bill gives the registrar greater ability to share change of name information with other state and territory uh, registrars and prescribed public authorities as defined uh, within the bill. Um, the honourable member also touched on the same issue of um, restrictions imposed on restricted persons that had been uh, raised um, by the honourable Michael Mission. Um, in addition, the bill provides for protection for victims from offenders who would use a name change 
to offend a victim or significant section of the community by giving the supervising authority the power to not approve such a name change. The bill similarly prevents offenders using a name change to adversely affect security in a prison or a detention centre or to frustrate the administration of a supervision order that they are subject to. Um, the Honourable Member also referred to uh, unregistered births. So this bill does not uh, relate to birth registration. However, the registry is able to register a birth at any time and there are no restrictions on late registration. Since 2011, the registry has participated in a program coordinated by the Aboriginal Justice and Policy Directorate of the Department of Justice with the support of the Attorney-General and in association with the Department of Transport, Fines Enforcement Registry and the Department of Human Services, Centrelink, to regularly attend remote communities within the Kimberley and Pilbara regions to assist community members with accessing these essential government services. The registry's involvement uh, is to provide access to birth certificates and during the program a number of previously unregistered births have been registered and this program uh, continues to run. Um, the Honourable Member also raised the issue of the registration of a child's name and how restrictions do not necessarily apply to them um, and uh, requested some, how that would work and uh, provide some examples. So the restrictions set out in the bill apply to an application to change a name and have no relevance to the actual initial registration of a child's birth and the name given to the child at that time. Further, the current Act at section 23 allows parents uh, to apply to the register, registrar to change a child's given names only within a period of 12 months of the date um, of birth. Um, this option is not impacted by the bill and so it's still an option um, available to parents. Um, I've touched on the issue of restricted persons. Um, the Comments, if I turn to the comments by the Honourable Nick Goran, um, there was an issue about whether or not the bill creates a class structure in WA. The provisions of the bill um, will be applied equally across all change of name applicants with the exclusion of those persons. I'll just wait for the nod, I'll keep speaking to you. Have you got quite a bit to go? A little bit to go, sorry. All right, well, I'm going to interrupt the debate that, at that point, um, noting the time and will now take members' statements. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, one of the great or real tragedies of COVID-19 is that the family and friends um, have not been able to attend the funerals of their loved ones. On the 4th of April 2020, the world lost a genuinely wonderful woman. Her name is Andrea Mitchell. This is part of the eulogy that I delivered at her funeral, which was, unfortunately, attended by only 10 people. In normal circumstances, hundreds would have taken the opportunity to say to to say goodbye to this magnificent woman. Today we, say we farewell the genuinely beautiful person, Andrea. Andrea, the name is all that's required. Her name immediately elicits a feeling of warmth for everyone that knew her, regardless of the former, be it tennis, politics, telethon, meath, or the multitude of other organisations in which she was associated. Albeit with her wonderful family or her friends, the simple name Andrea is a positive affirmation that all that she represents. Warmth, sincerity, compassion, a serene and dignified woman. Tennis played a vital role in Andrea's life. Her name is synonymous with the game, not just here in Western Australia, not just nationally, but globally. For example, over the past few days, I've received messages of sympathy for Andrea's family from the senior management levels of Tennis Australia, Wimbledon, the International Tennis Federation. Add to this the literally hundreds upon hundreds of messages from a tennis family at Tennis West and throughout Western Australia. Andrea was, without a doubt, tennis royalty. Her tennis CV is unparalleled in terms of its quality. Andrew was intensely involved in club tennis for decades prior to being elected as the first woman president of Tennis West in 1996, a position she executed with distinction for 12 years. In addition, she was a long-term director of the Hopman Cup in Tennis Australia from 1997 to 2007. Her service to tennis has been justifiably acknowledged. In 2001, she was awarded the Australian Sports Medal and in 2013, she was made a life member of Tennis West. Of course, the awards and achievements are impressive and justifiably worthy of accolade. However, they hide the fundamental essence of goodwill that exists for Andrea throughout the tennis community, the human element. She was held in extraordinarily high esteem by everyone, without a doubt, 
uh, without a, a doubt for her professional qualities, her meticulous attention to detail, her decision-making capacity, which captured both pragmatism and altruism, but also because she was Andrea. As with everything in her life, her innate character was her greatest strength. While the tennis community will mourn the loss of one of their most valued family members, the unanimous consensus will undoubtedly be a deep feeling of gratitude to Andrea for all that she contributed to this sport and all that she represented. Her political career. On her own admission, Andrea would probably admit that politics wasn't overtly in her DNA. While I can probably lay, uh, claim credit for planting the original political seed with Andrea, it would never have happened without, once again, her unique character. She was ideally equipped to be an effective and polished member of parliament. Given the versatility of her life skills, she was perfectly suited to progressing to a successful career in a house on the hill. She was intelligent and articulate, while at the same time intensely driven and assertive, a magnificent combination. However, Andrea had an additional admirable trait which she brought to the table, compassion. It didn't matter who the person was or what the situation was, Andrea generally had a concern of the individual in mind when making a decision. She took the bold step of putting a hand up for the pre-selection for the Liberal seat of the seat of Kingsley in 2008 election. The self-discipline and commitment that she had previously exhibited in her professional life was exposed to all during that campaign. She won the seat from the incumbent Labor member comfortably, capturing 54 per cent of the two-party preferred vote. Of course, the Liberal brand contributed to that impressive win. However, in an increasingly volatile political environment, the voting public will not blindly follow a particular party out of loyalty. With the advent of social media and 24-hour information access, the quality of the candidate will ultimately determine the success or otherwise of the election. The constituents of Kingsley embraced Andrea as their local member with legitimate enthusiasm. They knew that their new member would perform the role with the manner in which they expected, with genuine concern for their welfare. Having presided over numerous campaigns over many years, chairing Andrea's campaign was absolutely seamless. She was an ideal candidate, once again, because she was Andrea. Andrea showed typical resolve and professionalism to her political duties over the next four years. Her work ethic was second to none. In a cherished seat of Kingsley, she literally went to the opening of an envelope. Andrea was on a mission to make Kingsley her own. She went to every school assembly, every Alliance Club meeting, Rotary Club meeting, Probus Club meeting, Mother's Club meeting, Father's Club meeting. Every retirement home, a happy hour, every tennis club, football club, cricket club opening and presentation, and so on. Whenever something was happening in Kingsley, the one certainty was that Andrea would be there. She received reward for effort after her first term as the member for Kingsley, gaining an 11 per cent swing to the Liberal Party at the 2013 election for a 65 per cent two-party preferred vote. She was delighted with that result, delighted that the constituents had provided such an overwhelming endorsement of her role, and yet sufficiently humble to appreciate that this support required further cons consolidation. Suffice to say, Andrew did not com uh, become com uh, remotely complacent in her second term in office. She maintained her commitment to her role while also developing the increasing respect from her colleagues for her performance in the parliament. She was elevated to the position of parliamentary secretary for the Minister for Mental Health and Child Protection in 2013, a role that she enthusiastically embraced. Then following a reshuffle in 2016, she was promoted to cabinet as minister for these portfolio areas. As with everything that transcended her life, Andrea had reached it to the top. What a woman. Unfortunately, her tenure in the ministerial role was cut short when the Liberal Party lost the 2017 election. This was not the most disappointing thing for Andrea. The thing that absolutely devastated her was losing the seat of Kingsley. While the margin of the loss was extremely small, it was still a loss, and Andrea felt that it represented a lack of faith in her from the voting public, the same public that had so, uh, she had devoted her life to, for, in, in, to representing for almost nine years. The reality of the situation, of course, was that Andrea was caught in an overall state-wide swing against the government. However, that was of little comfort. She did take it personally. However, in typical resilient fashion, she recovered quite rapidly from the loss. She was determined to access further challenges. Andrea had an exceptional political career. For someone with uh, a very little prior experience in politics, she left an indelible mark. She had an extraordinary work ethic, and as a local member and minister, she had the capacity to capture the fundamental human element in everything that she did. As previously mentioned, the outpouring of grief from across the political spectrum following a passing is, once again, testament to her character and the esteem with which she was held. Of course, Andrea's life was going to take another direction very shortly after the election, election loss. She had a new challenge to confront, and that was her health. I'm in awe at the manner in which Andrea dealt with this new cruel card that she was dealt. She was insistent that only her closest and dearest knew the magnitude of the situation right to the end. She was determined to fight with every breath in her body. 
with each new obstacle come a new level of resolve. Her stoic bravery is something to behold. She so desperately wanted to fully recover, to revert to her old life where she was in complete control, a fulfilling and relatively uncomplicated life, to spend time with her treasured family and friends and Gracie, to travel, to entertain, to live. She lost her final battle last Saturday morning. She fought and she fought and she fought until her big, beautiful heart could fight no more. And she is now at peace with her God. Personally, I'm lost without Andrea. She has been my soulmate for almost two decades. We shared so much in common, not only our passion for tennis and the Liberal Party, but pretty much everything. We shared magnificent political victories and devastating losses. We shared extraordinary triumphs and devastating losses with the mighty West Perth Falcons and the Eagles. We shared countless matches and endless South Yarra meals at the Australian Open. We shared endless dinners at the Subi and Squires Loft. We shared Chardonnay and Champagne and pizza and chutneys. We saw in countless New Years together. We shared the constant escapades of our respective daughters, Rosie, Beryl and Gracie. But more valuable than anything, we shared with each other. We spoke or we were, or we were with each other almost every night for years. Andrea was by my side when I faced adversity as a minister and vice versa. She was by my side when I lost my wonderful dad and vice versa. Over recent years, I was by her side each and every time she confronted a new health challenge, and I was in awe in her stoic uh, courage and determination. We knew man, no matter what we achieved as individuals, no matter what we, challenges we confronted, we had each other's back. We enthusiastically, unconditionally had each other's love and support. We were, and always will be, soulmates. We all create a tapestry in our lives. Andrea's tapestry was magnificent. A rich collection of achievements through teaching, sports administration, tennis, politics, family and friends. All interwoven through a common thread, Andrea. I genuinely feel that the world is diminished with the passing of Andrea. Her innate determination to be the best she could possibly be. Her motivation through altruism as opposed to personal gain. Her unreserved tolerance of the conventional and equally the unconventional. Her tender, compassionate and genuine re regard for everyone within her world and beyond her unconditional loyalty for family and friends. Yes, Andrea was all of these things and much, much more. As a daughter, a sister, an auntie or a friend, for all that it represents, Andrea was simply e exceptional. I know that I speak for everyone when I say that we're all a little melancholy today. So sad that our exceptional Andrea has passed on and yet so grateful that we've had the privilege of having had her in our lives. Rest pe in peace, my beautiful Andrea. And President, uh, some speeches are far more difficult to uh, deliver than others. And uh, I certainly won't be delivering this one uh, looking at my good friend, the Honourable Peter Collier, and I commend him for the uh, speech he's just delivered. Indeed, um, Madam President, I recall very vividly uh, the funeral of the Honourable Andrea Mitchell um, which I had the opportunity to view online. Uh, I've never participated in a funeral online uh, before. Uh, this was the first time, and of course this is because of the COVID-19 restrictions and the strange year that uh, all of us have had to experience uh, across the globe. Um, Madam President, I was pleased uh, to see that last week uh, the members of the other place had the opportunity to uh, deliver their condolence speeches and I had the opportunity earlier today to uh, reread uh, those remarks. I'd encourage um, those members who uh, did not know the Honourable Andrea Mitchell to have a look at those speeches. They absolutely reflect the character of our friend. <clears throat> what I want to say this evening, um, Madam President, is just to reflect on a few experiences that I had uh, with Andrea and perhaps some of the lighter experiences that I had with her. Um, I, I did not know uh, the Honourable Member until uh, I was sworn into this place and I was asked to serve on the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime, uh, no, the Joint Standing Committee on the Commissioner for Children and Young People. And Andrea was the chair of that committee and I was the other Liberal Member on this four-person committee. Um, and we did have uh, very good experiences across the, the four years together on the committee, but one particular occasion um, still sits with me um, very clearly, and that was uh, on a trip that uh, the committee took 
uh, to the Kimberley and in particular to the uh, remote communities of Lombardina and Jarajan. And uh, we had to travel uh, an interesting road to get there. Um, and it was Andrea's responsibility as the chair of the committee to, uh, to take us in this four wheel drive. And I remember it distinctly because most of the time we were travelling at a very slow speed and there was uh, a great amount of vibration. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, members like the Honourable Robin Chappell who have spoken about some of these roads over the years uh, will have a clear recollection of the type of road that I'm speaking of. And um, uh, Madam President, it was indeed a great honour for me uh, in our following term of parliament when the, uh, the then Premier asked me to serve as Andrea's parliamentary secretary. She was, of course, at the time the Minister for Child Protection and the Minister for uh, Mental Health. And um, if I was to choose, you, you don't really get a say in these things, Madam President, but if I was to choose a, a minister to uh, be the parliamentary secretary, it would have been Andrea, not only because of uh, the portfolios that she was handling, uh, but also because of our friendship that we had uh, developed uh, over the years. And indeed, I recall uh, over the years many an occasion um, watching numerous tennis matches together, and I certainly um, thank her for that opportunity um, and her fond love for tennis. And so, Madam uh, President, uh, I do cherish the memory of our um, fallen friend, and uh, I express my condolences uh, to all of Andrea's family. Are there any further member statements? Uh, the Honourable Michael Mission. No, thank you. Madam President, look, uh, nothing, uh, there's nothing that I can usefully add to what has been said by uh, uh, the Honourable Peter Collier, uh, the Honourable Nick Garan and uh, those in the other place who have spoken about the passing of our friend and our colleague, uh, Andrea Mitchell. Um, other than I just wish to express my sorrow at uh, her passing and my gratitude for having had the opportunity to know her and to have worked with her. She was someone of humour, compassion and enormous humanity. She was a, a warm-hearted, gentle but courageous and determined soul. She was a committed member of the party, a fiercely loyal friend to those who had the opportunity to know her, and a dedicated and immensely competent minister who unfortunately did not have the time to achieve the goals that she had set and to which she was working. And uh, I'm the rich of having known her, and I believe that the Liberal Party and her community and the Parliament are better for having had uh, her, her presence. Uh, rest in peace. Are there any further members' statements? The Honourable Alison Simon. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I want to rise on behalf of the Greens, but also um, on behalf of myself, um, to pay um, my condolences to the friends and the family of um, the Honourable Andrea Mitchell. And I wanted to make um, a few comments about her and my experiences of her. Um, uh, Andrea Mitchell was elected to Parliament the same time that I was elected, um, in 2008, to the 38th Parliament. And I didn't really know her that well during the 38th Parliament. We'd bump into each other occasionally um, in the members' bar and, and exchange um, pleasantries, but I didn't know her um, terribly well. But I did get to know Andrea quite well um, much later on, when Andrea became the, pres became the Minister for Mental Health. At that time, I was the president of the WA Association for Mental Health. Um, I was also the co-lead for the Mental Health Network for the Department of Health. And I was also serving um, on the Ministerial Council for Suicide Prevention, uh, which of course gave uh, advice directly to um, the Minister for Mental Health. And in those roles, uh, I, had, uh, I, got, I met with um, Andrea often and we would have many discussions around what was happening within mental health, both within the community management and health sector as well as the department more broadly. Um, and of course, I would be um, giving advice uh, in relation to issues around um, su suicide prevention. 
And can I say that as a minister, I found Andrea to be very generous with her time, very keen to listen and very kind. And that is um, probably the abiding memory I, I remember, is how keen she was to do a good job. I, would deal, I, I did deal with her also a fair bit when she was the parliamentary um, secretary, so by the time she became the minister, we'd already got to know each other um, reasonably well. But she was very committed to wanting to do the best possible job that she could. And it was to her credit that she made a point of actually seeking out um, advice from as many um, people as she could in order to be able to ensure that she was able to um, best be, a, be across her brief. Um, I, I, I recognise that it is an enormous loss. Um, she was uh, relatively young, um, certainly, uh, certainly um, too young, too young to, to pass at the age that she did. Um, I am. I'm, I'm very sad for her friends and that I know loved her dearly and have felt um, acutely the pain of her loss and also how difficult that was, particularly um, the circumstances whereby people weren't able um, to attend her funeral. But it is uh, to, her, to her family I say um, she was a wonderful woman. I respected her a lot. I liked her a lot. She was a good person and um, we pass on our condolences. Are there any further member statements? The Honourable Colin Holt. So I'd like just to add, on behalf of myself and my parliamentary National Party colleagues, um, in recognising the passing of Honourable Andrea Mitchell, um, and to give our uh, heartfelt sympathy and condolences to her family and friends, not least of all her great mate, uh, the Honourable Peter Collier. Um, Andrea was a sincere, warm, and lovely person who, in my opinion, brought that, those same values to uh, the cabinet table and the same values to, to the parliament. And in my view, has left uh, this place richer for involvement and she has left part of herself as part of the culture of this place. And um, I think there should be more Andrew Mitchell sermon in a parliament to reflect those exact same values, and obviously the same values that she grew up with um, and, and was a true representative of uh, the electorate that she uh, was elected to represent. Um, I always found her um, uh, committed and concerned and um, diligent in the work that she did, uh, especially as a minister and parliamentary secretary. You knew she was in it to do the right thing for her, her community um, and for all the people she represented as a minister. Um, yep, she'll be um, greatly missed, uh, especially by those who knew her so well and um, spent so much time with her. Uh, she was a great companion in life, I'm sure, for um, all those who spent great, uh, a great length of time with her. Are there any further member statements? I'll leave with the House. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam President. To join in the remarks about the Honourable Andrea Mitchell, uh, and to express my condolence and those on behalf of the Liberal Party, in the, uh, the Labor Party in the, um, in the Legislative Council uh, to those who are experiencing um, her loss. Now, um, the Honourable Member came into Parliament after I did, so I never had the opportunity to serve with her on any uh, joint committees and I didn't uh, have the opportunity to know her um, particularly well. But I do think the mark of a person uh, in, in this place is whether or not, um, whether they know you or not, they, um, I guess some people deign um, to exchange pleasantries and other people are genuinely pleasant um, when you see them in the bar or you walk in the corridors um, and Andrea was always that. Um, so there are others, particularly when they become ministers, who are just so busy and I, I do understand what it's like that they're completely focused on what they've got to do and they don't have time to um, just acknowledge other people around them. Uh, and uh, my observation um, of Andrea Mitchell was that um, she was always uh, took the time to be pleasant 
uh, and uh, to be a human and acknowledge that um, we were all um, humans um, together. So um, I, I, I do know that um, about her from my um, limited dealings with her. Um, loss is, is difficult whenever it happens. And um, I know for the young people uh, around the place today, saying that someone was 64 would seem pretty old. But for someone who's 58, um, it's actually very young. Um, and uh, th th she was taken far too soon, far too soon, because I'm sure, based on what we've heard tonight as well, um, that although a chapter had ended for her in her um, immediate parliamentary career, I'm sure there were plenty of um, other opportunities for her to pursue and that she was uh, pursuing. And I know um, from what we've heard, she would have continued to make um, a contrib contribution to the wider uh, WA community. So I add on behalf of the Labor Party, um, our condolences as well. Are there any further member statements? Right. Members, I also add my condolences to the family and friends and colleagues of Andrea Mitchell. I know that she'll be very sorely missed and was always an, indeed a very pleasant person to engage with. So members, I have two matters to deal with. The first is I have received today some correspondence from the Honourable Francis Logan, MLA, Minister for Emergency Services and Corrective Services, in relation to the matter of privilege that had been raised by the Honourable Dr Steve Thomas, and I table that correspondence. And I also have a message, message number 235, Madam President, the Legislative Assembly having this day passed the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2020, presents the same to the Legislative Council for its concurrence, signed Acting Speaker, Ms Libby Metham, MLA, 11th of November 2020. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. Madam President, I move that the bill contained in Legislative Assembly message number 235 be now read a first time. Members, the question is the bill will be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Public Health Amendment, Safe Access Zones Bill 2020, first reading. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health. I move that the bill be now read a second time. The bill in front of us aims to deal with ongoing instances of women being confronted by protesters when accessing abortion services in Western Australia. These confrontations cause anxiety and distress for both patients and staff. Last year, during April and May, a significant public co consultation process was undertaken where the Department of Health sought community feedback on the value of introducing safe access zones legislation in Western Australia and on key considerations in the design uh, of a new legislative framework. We received an extraordinary level of community and in industry engagement with 4,000 responses from individuals and organisations including support from the Australian Medical Association, the, the Public Health Association of Australia and the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. 70 per cent of the respondents supported the introduction of new legislation to provide safe access zones. Approximately 50 submissions provided reports from patients and staff regarding interactions with demonstrators outside abortion clinics. Of these submissions, the majority described the experience as traumatic, stressful, overwhelming, awful, horrible, painful, hard, scary and hurtful. Since the legislation of abortion, uh, since the legalisation of abortion in WA, protesters have congregated outside termination clinics. Over the past five years, the following behaviours have been observed by patients and staff outside Murray Stopes Midland Clinic. Being asked whether they were having an abortion, being approached and followed, being confronted with banners displaying emotive language and disturbing imagery, having their cars obstructed and cars, car windows ta tapped on, being forcefully provided pamphlets and brochures, being provided with bags containing baby items and rosary beads, all of these were done in an attempt to deter women from accessing the clinic and discourage staff from working there. The consultation process illustrates that our existing laws are unsatisfactory and women and staff are not adequately protected from harassment. Protests and gatherings outside abortion clinics are currently being managed by the police through the permit system under the Public Order in Streets Act 1984 
and through existing criminal and civil courses of action. WA Police issues around uh, up to 40 permits per year for the express purpose of procession to prayer vigil and peaceful prayer vigil for locations in front of the two main private abortion clinics in WA. These permits are issued to one person on behalf of a group. Whilst conditions may, ap may apply to these permits, there's currently no offence for breaching the conditions and breaches are dealt with by police officers as they see fit as when they attend. It is evident from the reports of the private abortion providers in WA and the number of personal accounts and submissions that there have been a number of harrowing incidents. WA's existing laws do not adequately address the full range of behaviours engaged in by people who demonstrate at or near premises at which abortions are provided. This may be explained by the nature of the demonstrations outside these premises and the unique effect on the target audience. The vulnerable nature of the audience means that they are likely to be particularly affected by the presence and behaviour of demonstrators. Earlier this year, the Department of Health, in its final report following the consultation process, recommended tailoring a specific regulatory approach to address the problem, creating safe access zones around abortion services, which is a measure consistent with the approach taken around the country. All Australian jurisdictions have already introduced safe access zones legislation, except for WA. It is time to bring WA in line with the rest of the country. Research from around the nation supports safe access zones as a way to protect the privacy and dignity of both staff and patients from harassment, obstruction and intimidation. The Caston Centre for Human Rights Law at Monash University, the University of Queensland Pro Bono Centre, the South Australian Law Reform Institute and many others have all recommended that governments progress similar legislation. The bill before us today, which adds new provisions to the Public Health Act 2016, has been modelled on the equivalent legislation in Victoria, which withstood a challenge in the High Court uh, in Club v Edwards. The High Court decided that safe access zones do not uh, impermissibly infringe the implied freedom of political communication and that such legislation is constitutionally valid. In addition, reports from clinics indicate that Victor the Victorian model works in achieving the objectives of the legislation in facilitating a safe environment for women to access abortion services. Madam President, I now turn to the provisions of the bill. The bill stipulates safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided, which may include abortion clinics, public and private hospitals, and outpatient services such as general practitioners. However, it will not cover pharmacies that merely supply drugs that may induce a, a, an abortion. These zones will ensure that anyone who wants to access abortion services, including employees working in those premises, can do so in a safe and private manner. The bill will also create a new offence to engage in prohibited behaviour within a safe access zone which would mean the area within 150 metres outside the boundary of the premises at which abortions are provided, including the area within the boundary of that premises. The offence would specify the circumstances in which a person is considered to have engaged in prohibited behaviour, including intimidating or obstructing another person accessing premises at which abortions are provided, communicating by any means in relation to abortion, in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by another person accessing premises at which abortions are provided and is reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Impeding a footpath, a road or a vehicle without reasonable excuse in relation to abortion. Recording by any means without reasonable excuse another person accessing premises at which abortions are provided without the other person's consent and any other behaviour prescribed by the regulations. There is an exception in relation to communication which applies to all employees and contractors who provide service, services to the premises. This will ensure employees and contractors who may need to communicate with a patient 
or other staff in relation to abortion inside the safe access zone will not be committing an offence. Some elements of the offence will also not capture law enforcement officers acting reasonably in the performance of their duties, journalists reporting on a matter of public interest outside abortion clinics, security or construction services working at or near the premises, staff engaged in lawful industrial action and, another, and other similar situations where a reasonable excuse is evident. The bill also pro prohibits someone from publishing or distributing a recording of another person accessing or leaving premises at which abortions are provided if the recording contains particulars that are likely to lead to the identification of that other person as someone who accessed those premises. The pro prohibition against publishing or distributing recordings extends to recordings taken from outside the safe access zone. The prohibition all only applies to recordings made or published without the person's consent and also provides for an ex exception of um, reasonable excuse. The intention of the prohibition is to protect the privacy of those accessing premises uh, at which abortions are provided and to protect them from the intim intimidatory conduct of taking photos, videos or other recordings with the explicit or implicit threat of publicly exposing individuals who access lawful abortion clinics or provide those health services. The Western Australian Police Force will be the agency responsible for enforcing the new offences and for prosecuting any breaches using their ordinary powers. A review clause has also been included in the bill that will require the Minister for Health to assess the operation and effectiveness of the amendments five years after they come into force. I'd like to clarify what should be obvious to everyone. This bill is not about decriminalising abortions. The issue was already discussed and resolved by the parliament more than 20 years ago in 1998, with legislative amendments that are now part of the Criminal Code and the Health Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1911. The scope of the bill that's now before us only involves one aspect, ensuring safe and private access to legal abortion clinics. I'll finish by stressing that the proposed safe access zones do not prohibit protests in relation to abortions altogether. The bill only creates a safe buffer to move protesters away from the immediate vicinity of premises providing abortion services. Anyone who wishes will still be able to protest 150 metres outside the boundary of the premises, subject to the usual protest permit requirements. By creating such a buffer, we'll prevent most harm to patients or staff, as well as largely avoid the current need for police to respond only after inappropriate conduct has occurred. The McGowan government believes that the right to safety, privacy, dignity and respect for women accessing health care, especially during what is a very difficult time, is a right that should be protected by this House. As indicated by the Minister in his third reading speech, while it is acknowledged that there are limited remaining sitting days to pass the bill, the government remains committed to safe access zones. If uh, the Labor Party is lucky enough to be on, those ben on these benches in this place after the next election, following the verdict of the Western Australian people. We will seek to reintroduce this legislation forthwith and ensure that it is made law as early as possible when Parliament resumes next year. Pursuant to Standing Order 1261, I advise that this bill is not a uniform legislation bill. It does not ratify or give effect to an intergovernmental or multilateral agreement to which the government of the state is a party nor does this bill, by reason of its subject matter, introduce a uniform scheme or uniform laws throughout the Commonwealth. I commend the bill to the House and I table the explanatory memorandum. The explanatory memorandum is tabled and debate on that bill stands adjourned and the House is now adjourned.